order. Before I begin the daily routine, I will read late debate uh, for March 27th, uh, submitted by Ian Rankin, MLA for Timberley Prospect. Whereas the Prime Minister wrote to seven premiers, including the Premier of Nova Scotia, to come up with a credible alternative to the federal carbon levy yesterday. And whereas Quebec, British Columbia, and the Northwest Territories all have their own systems and are not subject to the federal carbon levy. And whereas Nova Scotia had a credible alternative that was more cost effective for Nova Scotians under the previous government, while raising millions to fight climate climate change, but this government has not negotiated new caps with the federal government, causing Nova Scotians to have to pay for the highest increase to gas in the country. Therefore, be it resolved that the government of Nova Scotia submit a credible alternative under the pan-Canadian framework to the federal government that recognizes the work for Nova Scotians have done over the successive governments, so Nova Scotians do not face another spike at the gas pump on April 1st. We will now begin the daily routine with reading and uh, pre presenting and reading of petitions. I recognize the Honourable Member for Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg leave to table a petition entitled Property Tax Capped Assessment Program Victimizing Disaster Victims. The operative clause reading we, the undersigned residents of Nova Scotia and supporters of the victims of the 2023 Tantalan Hammonds Plains wildfire, call upon the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing to make changes and introduce legislation retroactive to May 27, 2023, necessary to ensure that Nova Scotians who lost their homes are not further victimized due to shortfalls in the Assessment Act and the property tax capped assessment program, which might include providing that for the purposes of section 45A4 of the Assessment Act, quote, construction not included in the base year assessment, end quote, and quote, new construction, end quote, do not include the reconstruction of one or more dwelling or accessory buildings on a property where the dwelling or accessory buildings existed and where and were assessed, excuse me, previously and were destroyed by a disaster including a wildfire flood or hurricane and there are 696 names on these uh, on these pages and I've fixed my name as uh, as per the rules of the house thank you Petition is tabled. I recognize the honourable member for Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg leave to uh, table a petition entitled "Establishment of a Provincial Infrastructure Fund for Emergency Access and Connector Roads." Uh, the operative clause reading. We, the Understein taxpayers, residents of Nova Scotia, call upon the Nova Scotia government to establish an infrastructure program dedicated to funding the construction of emergency access and connector roads to improve, to improve connectivity, enhan enhance responses to emergencies, and make communities across the province safer. Madam Speaker, there are 631 signatures in, on this petition, and I have affixed my signature as per the rules of the House. The petition is tabled. Are there any further presenting and reading petitions? We will move on to presenting reports of committees. Tabling reports, regulations and other papers. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, in my capacity as the Attorney General and Minister of Justice for the Province of Nova Scotia, I do hereby beg leave to table the Human Rights Commission 2022-23 Annual Report. The report is tabled. 
I recognize the Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, in the, my capacity as the Attorney General and Minister of Justice, Nova Scotia, I hereby beg leave to table the annual report on accessibility 2022-23. The report has been tabled. Statements by ministers. I recognize the Honourable Premier. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This week marks one year since the Mass Casualty Commission released its final report, turning the tide together. We will always remember the lives lost on April 18th and 19th, 2020, and reflect on how our province was deeply impacted by this violence and the resulting sorrow. We also reflect on the strength and courage shown by the families, survivors, and communities that have come together to support each other in moving forward. I want to reaffirm Nova Scotia's commitment to the, to the report's recommendations and to reassure the families, survivors, and communities that we are acting and we are doing things differently. This past year has been one of action, of listening, and of determination to work across departments with all levels of government and with community to make progress on the recommendations outlined in the final report. As I said on the day the inquiry final report was released, our main goal is safer communities. Government has launched a province-wide policing review that will include public engagement. This is important work and will be of great interest, great interest to Nova Scotians as it takes shape. We are investing in community groups working on the front lines to prevent gender-based violence so they can continue to support those who are impacted. As we strive to make communities safer, 16 community-based organizations have received $7.1 million in funding for projects to help address gender-based violence. We have also made progress on a number of recommendations in the report, including committing $9 million over two years as part of an $18 million initiative with the federal government to design and deliver mental health, grief and bereavement services in Cumberland, Colchester and Hans counties adding new positions in mental health and addictions in frontline and system support roles, including outreach, wellness navigation, health promotion, public engagement, and grief and bereavement, <clears throat> adding a new mental health role to mobile primary, hair, primary care clinic teams, which visit communities in Colchester, Cumberland, and Hans counties three days a week, providing close to 2,000 more new trunk rate mobile radios to volunteer emergency first responders by the fall of 2024, improving their ability to communicate as they help Nova Scotians in times of need. As a province, we are working with our federal colleagues to advance work on recommendations that require collaboration. We were pleased with the efforts of the Progress Monitoring Committee, who together with the founding chair, Linda Olin, are playing an important role monitoring and reporting on the implementation of the recommendations from the final report. Our province was deeply impacted by this tragedy. Our resolve to change, to be stronger, and to make a difference so that no family or community has to experience what occurred in April 2020 stands firm. We are Nova Scotia strong. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I want to thank the Premier for his comments and providing us a copy in advance. Uh, Madam Speaker, each year on April 18th and 19th, Nova Scotians remember the lives that were lost and honour survivors who experienced the most unthinkable tragedy here in our province four years ago. In response to this loss, our province faced the final report of the Mass Casualty Commission was released a year ago this week. This report, turning the tide together, lays the foundation for the work our province needs to do to support survivors and ensure the shock Nova Scotians faced in April 2020 never happens again. I want to thank the Mass Casualty Commission for their dedication to conducting this report. They have provided the framework for our province uh, that we need to make advances toward their own recommendations. As elected officials in this chamber, we have a duty to ensure the work is carried out from this report, particularly those recommendations that help us fight against gender-based violence and provide additional mental health supports for individuals. We owe it to the victims, the families, and the survivors of this unthinkable tragedy and future generations of Nova Scotians to do so. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I recognize the leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I, uh, I'm honoured and, and heartbroken to rise and uh, remember the tragic event that took place in our province. I was in the room 
uh, for the release of this report. And I rise today um, proud to have joined the families and advocacy organizations who pushed uh, for this commission and the report uh, that emanated from it. Glad to see the progress that the Premier spoke of today, um, knowing that there is so much more work to be done. Um, I thank the work of the Commission, the organizations, and everyone who has been involved in bringing us to this point. Uh, we know that this is an event that our province will never fully heal from, but that we can and must always continue to learn from. I, I believe, Madam Speaker, that we can turn the tide together uh, towards justice and safety and equity um, and peace for all of us. And um, I look forward to working with all colleagues in this chamber towards those goals. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Community Services. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Today, I'm pleased, I'm pleased to rise today to announce a historic, important step the province is taking to support vulnerable Nova Scotians. Effective July 1, 2024, income assistance rates will be indexed on the annual basis to the Consumer Price Index. This will apply to all income assistance streams, including the essential rate and the enhanced rate for people on income assistance. Madam Speaker, these continue to be challenging times for Nova Scotians living on low incomes. Indexing income assistance rates will result in more predictability for our clients and is another action being taken by this government to help vulnerable Nova Scotians find success. A few recent examples include investments in the remedy, the new income assistance disability supplement, the school lunch program, and more investments in childcare to lower fees for families, creating more spaces and enhancing after-school care. Indexing rates implemented on July, 20, uh, July 1, 2024 will be retroactive to April 1, 2024. We know it is very difficult to break the cycle of poverty. We know that there is more to do, but Madam Speaker, today is another positive step forward in helping our most vulnerable Nova Scotians. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Leader of Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I, I certainly I uh, want to congratulate the Minister on this statement and this announcement. Uh, this has been something that s stakeholders have been fighting for, that advocates have been fighting for, that the most financially vulnerable people in this province have been pushing for for the last uh, two and a half years. Uh, we certainly know it's been a priority for the opposition benches in, in both parties. And this is an important move. Uh, we have been dealing with the biggest inflationary pressures that our provinces, our province have had, our country's had, uh, you know, since the 1980s. And we know that in the last two and a half years, Nova Scotia has gone from being one of the most affordable places to live in the country to, to one of the most expensive. And the most financially vulnerable, those folks who depend on income assistance, um, have been hurt the hardest as prices for food have gone up, prices on their power bills have gone up. Um, prices on everything have gone up. Their rent, having the highest rental increases in the country. So I am uh, pleased to hear that this is, uh, this is coming in. Uh, again, this is overdue. I, I wish it hadn't taken uh, this long to get to this point. But I do want to commend uh, all the advocates who have been pushing for this because I believe it is critical to prevent families and individuals in Nova Scotia from being stuck in intergenerational uh, poverty as a result of the current uh, situation when it comes to the cost of living. Um, I, I do wish that it did not take such political pressure uh, to get here. We, we want the government to do things because they're the right things to do, not just because there's political pressure. But at the end of the day, um, we are happy we're here. Uh, this is a good announcement, and we think this is going to provide uh, some, some moderate relief 
to the most financially vulnerable people in our province and those people that are being challenged the most right now as poverty rates go up, as food insecurity go up. And we certainly hope that, uh, that we see more of this in the future. Thank you. I recognize the leader of the New Democratic Party. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I am pleased to rise and um, celebrate the um, movement towards an idea uh, whose time has clearly come, uh, something that we've been fighting for for a long time, something that you know the minister committed to, and, and we're glad to see it happen. Um, I do want uh, to point out, uh, as my colleague did, the number of people who have worked so tirelessly for so long, including uh, assistance recipients themselves, who I know have spoken to all of us in our offices about the gross inadequacy of the income that they receive and the advocates who work to represent those folks in, in different areas. And so to all of those people, I say uh, thank you. And this is a, an important day. Um, I, I also need to say that this still leaves income assistance recipients thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars below the poverty line in a time of record inflation. Uh, and so the fact that this $7 million, which almost qualifies as a rounding error in the provincial budget, um, is now being announced uh, after we've finished debating the budget, um, it, it's a good thing. It's a good thing, uh, but it's, it's not enough. And so we are happy to see this first step towards ensuring that all Nova Scotians have the ability to live in dignity. Um, and we will keep fighting until that becomes a reality. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Justice on an introduction. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I beg leave to make an introduction. In the East Gallery, uh, we have with us today Mr. Brian Cooper. I'd like to say hi to Brian and recognize him. Uh, Brian, of course, is uh, a member with the Halifax Kinsman Club, and anybody who's uh, downtown regularly sees him walking the streets of downtown, picking up the garbage, not only being an ambassador for uh, Halifax, but also for uh, all of Nova Scotia. So I'd ask the members of the House to please welcome Brian to the House today. Welcome. Glad you're able to join us. We'll now move on to government notices of motion. I recognize the Honourable Premier. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following, resol of the following um, congratulatory resolution. Whereas the Chignecto Isthmus, located in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, is an interprovincial surface and rail trade corridor of national importance. And whereas the intercolonial uh, railway constructed along the Chignecto Isthmus in accordance with Section 145 of the Constitution Act 1867 physically united the Canadian Federation by linking the province of Nova Scotia with the provinces of Ontario and Quebec, and whereas Parliament passed in 1948 the Maritime Marshland Rehabilitation Act, which provided for the Government of Canada to construct um, and reconstruct dikes, abatos, and breakwaters, and whereas the Chignecto Isthmus is currently vulnerable to the effects of rising sea levels and increasingly intense severe weather events that threaten this interprovincial surface and, tra and, and rail trade corridor of national importance, and whereas the governments of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick have undertaken the Chignecto Isthmus Climate Change Adaptation Comprehensive Engineering and Feasibility Study to expediously mitigate impacts of climate change on the communities and farmlands located within the Chignecto Isthmus, be it therefore resolved that the Legislative Assembly of Nova Scotia urge the Parliament of Canada to pass Bill S-273, an act to declare the Chignecto Isthmus Dykeland system and related works to be for the general advantage of Canada, and be it further resolved that this motion be forwarded to the Prime Minister of Canada, the Minister of Housing, Infrastructure and Communities, and all Nova Scotia members of the, of the, uh, and all Nova Scotia members of the House of Commons and Senators, Madam Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for a waiver. Is it agreed? Agreed. 
It is agreed. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye? Aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. <laughs> Any further government notices of motion? Well, I recognize the Honourable Minister of Seniors and Long-Term Care. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg leave to make an introduction. Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Madam Speaker, in the Speaker's Gallery today, we have two very special guests who are here representing 12 Wing Shearwater in Eastern Passage. April 1st will be the Royal Canadian Air Force's 100th anniversary, and I am very honoured to stand and recognize the Commander and Chief Warrant Officer of 12 Wing Shearwater as part of these celebrations. Shearwater is the second oldest military airfield in Canada, second only to CFB Borden in Ontario. I would ask that they please rise as I introduce them. Colonel David Holmes, the Commander of 12 Wing Shearwater, and CWO Kevin Wiesenbeek, the Chief Warrant Officer of 12 Wing Shearwater. Madam Speaker, I ask all members of the House to join me in welcoming them to the House. Thank you for being here and for all that you do. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Seniors and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas 100 years ago on April 1st, the Royal Canadian Air Force was officially established. And whereas since its establishment, the Royal Canadian Air Force has served Canadians in peace and wartime and has been a significant contributor to national safety and security, international peace and global stability, and whereas Nova Scotians know well the traditions and incredible impact of the Royal Canadian Air Force as our province is home to CFB Shearwater and CFB Greenwood. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this legislature recognize the Royal Canadian Air Force centennial anniversary and extend to all members within Nova Scotia and across Canada our utmost gratitude for their courage, loyalty and commitment to protecting Canadians at home and abroad. Madam Speaker, I ask for a waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? Agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye? Aye. Contrary minded nay. The motion is carried. Government notices of motion. I recognize the Honourable Minister for African Nova Scotian Affairs and Public Service Commission. Madam Speaker, before I read my government notice of motion, I beg leave to make an introduction. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm honoured to introduce guests from the African Nova Scotian Justice Institute sitting in the East Gallery today. I ask them to rise one by one to accept the warm welcome of the House. Recently appointed Executive Director Shauna Paris Hoyt, a fifth generation African Nova Scotian, Scotian with a career marked by tireless advocacy for equity and human rights, particularly for women, children, youth and families. Accompany her are key members of her Team, Sarah Upshaw, Director of Operations. Dorico Simons, Director of Justice Strategy. Natalie Hodgson, Training Lead. Tracy McCollum, Project Coordinator of the National Impact of Race and Cultural Assessment. Tiffany Gordon, Manager, Data Collection and Justice System Accountability Unit. Veronica Doso, legal support and researcher, Susan Edwards, administrative assistant, representing the board of directors of the African Nova Scotian Justice Institute, Falami Jones, Carolyn Wright, and Vanessa Fells. Finally, joining us from the African Nova Scotian Decade for People of African Descent Coalition are Bernadette Hamilton-Reed, Executive Director and Carla Williams, Administrative Support. Welcome to the Legislature. It's a 
pleasure to have you join us today. I recognize the Honourable Minister of African Nova Scotian Affairs. Speaker. Madam Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day, I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Shauna Paris Hoyt, a fifth generation African Nova Scotian, was appointed as the executive director of the African Nova Scotian Justice Institute in Halifax on March 20th, 2024, bringing unparalleled expertise and dedication to justice, equity, and human rights to the Institute. And whereas Shauna Paris Hoyt, ex extensive work in law, social work, uh, mediation, education, and business demonstrates her lifelong commitment to the rights of vulnerable groups and has influenced significant legal decisions at the Supreme Court of Canada, benefiting communities across Nova Scotia and the country. And whereas under Shauna Hoyt, Paris Hoyt's leadership, the African Nova Scotian Justice Institute, committed to dismantling sy systemic barriers and advancing justice and fairness, is set to achieve significant progress in human rights and social justice, particularly in empowering the African Nova Scotian community through legal reforms, education, and advocacy. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of the Legislative Assembly recognize and celebrate Shauna Paris Hoyt for her outstanding career and efforts towards fairness and justice and commit to supporting her and the African Nova Scotian Justice Institute's mission to make Nova Scotia a more equitable place for every African Nova Scotian. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. Thank you. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? Agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye. Aye. The motion is carried. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Advanced Education, All New Affairs. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, before I read my notice of motion, I beg leave to make an introduction. Yes, please go I ahead. I'd like to introduce uh, a dear friend, Barry Cox, who is sitting in the East Gallery. Uh, Barry was very influential through my journey uh, as a politician, and I thank him for that. But even more importantly, Barry is an amazing community advocate. Uh, he works hard for the betterment of the whole constituency. Uh, he's the present chair of the Lockview High School Student Advisory Committee, our school advisory committee. Uh, also very influential at getting our turf field. It was the turf field that was really outside of HRN policy that Barry worked uh, hard on with the committee in order to get that passed. Barry continues to be that advocate and I really wanted to recognize Barry today, so thank you. Thank you for joining us today. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Advanced Education and All New Affairs. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Chief Terry Paul of Member 2 First Nation received a Canada's most admired CEO award from executive recruitment firm Waterstone Human Capital in November 2023. And whereas Chief Paul's award recognizes his 39 years of leadership and hard work in community economic development and Member 2 Development Corporation's commitment to creating opportunities for community members. And whereas we, as a province, are pleased to work with partnership with Mi'kmaq leadership and organizations to help create the conditions for people and communities to thrive, both today and in the future. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this House of Assembly join me in congratulating Chief Terry Paul and Member 2 on this much-deserved recognition and be committed to doing our part to help build an inclusive economy. Madam Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. I recognize the honourable member for Argyle on an introduction. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. 
here in the East Gallery today. Uh, we're joined by a, a constituent of mine, uh, Andrea LeBlanc. Andrea is a, a very uh, familiar face at the community breakfast in Amiros Hill. Uh, and I want to say uh, that it's her first time uh, visiting the legislature today. But I want to ex also extend uh, my appreciation for for her support and her friendship. It's always nice to see a familiar face at these types of events and really appreciate her, her sense of humor, which is uh, second to none. So uh, I ask all colleagues, uh, all members to uh, join me in welcoming Andrea to the house today. Welcome, enjoy your visit. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, before I read my resolution, I beg leave to uh, make an introduction. Yes, please go ahead. Madam Speaker, in, uh, in your gallery, the Speaker's Gallery, we have members of the Ver Vermeulen family. Uh, Andy Vermeulen and Karen Corey, please stand up as I say your names. Yes. Ben Vermeulen, Andrea Pothier, Gerald and Debbie Vermeulen, Laura Siddiqui, Adrian and Melanie Vermeulen, Alphonse and Jolene Vermeulen, Guy and Jacqueline Vermeulen, and Elise Vermeulen. And some of you may know Andy as the chair of the Nova Scotia Farm Loan Board. Uh, and uh, just a, a quick story on Andy, Madam Speaker. Uh, when I was doing some farm tours with the uh, member for Kings North, he and Andy graciously invited me to their regular exercise class. <laughs> and I have to tell you, Madam Speaker, they put the young guy to shame. <laughs> so please welcome, welcome to the house. Welcome, enjoy your visit with us. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Agriculture. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Mr. Ben Vermeulen of Milford, who together with his late wife Anna, were pillars of the farming community, building a large-scale dairy farm that provided Nova Scotians with a farm-fresh quality product for decades, has passed away recently at the age of 92. And whereas Ben and Anna, Dutch immigrants to Nova Scotia in 1955, managed to grow their business together in a lifelong agricultural success story, while also raising a family of seven children, including Wilma, Verna, Joanna, Adrian, Leona, Gerald, and Andy Vermeulen, who is currently the chair of the Nova Scotia Farm Loan Board. And whereas the late Mr. Vermeulen will be remembered as an excellent example of the quintessential, hardworking, innovative farmer with a passion for agriculture who relied on his farming partner, Anna, and expressed his concern for community through his involvement with the Milford Lions Club. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this House express condolences and best wishes to the Mulan family members and recognize a lifetime of commitment to the Nova Scotia agriculture industry represented by the late Ben and Anna Vermeulen. Madam Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. Aye. The motion is carried. I recognize the Honourable Premier. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg leave to make an introduction. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. The, uh, the, the member, the Minister of Service, Nova Scotia, I think neglected to make an introduction when you're standing. I want to recognize Colton's mom for being here today. <laughs> she, did, she did a pretty good job. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Order, order. Is there any further government notices of motion? If not, we will move on to introduction of bills. I recognize the honourable member for Bedford Basin. Madam Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act Respecting At-Home Testing for Human Papillomavirus. The Honourable Member for Bedford Basin begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act Respecting At-Home Testing for Human Papillomavirus. Bill 454, an act respecting at-home testing for human papillomavirus. Order that the bill be read a second time on a future day.
Notices of uh, motion. I recognize the honourable member for Halifax Citadel Sable Island. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I give notice that on a future date, I will move the following motion. Whereas the Health Services and Insurance Act was passed in November 2023 as a means to provide public sector provider coverage for patients who are mild to moderately mentally ill. And whereas at a recent all staff Nova Scotia Health meeting, staff were informed that this is being rolled out in fact to tier three patients who present more complex, severe mental health issues and staff were given 48 hours to provide feedback, which felt insufficient and inappropriate to many staff. Whereas every Nova Scotia Health child and adolescent psychiatrist has raised their concerns to MLAs, ministers and the Premier regarding patient safety and systemic challenges related to the relative lack of integration, peer supervision, oversight and access to psychiatry by engaging private practitioners as opposed to clinicians and public mental health teams, especially for more complex situations. Therefore, be it resolved that the House of Assembly show its urgent concern for improving child and adolescent mental health by referring the matter to the Standing Committee, Committee on Health to make recommendations regarding how to best provide mental health services to children and youth in Nova Scotia. I ask for a waiver of no's and passes without debate. There has been a request for a waiver. Is it agreed? There are several nays. The notice of motion is tabled. Are there any further notices of motion? If not, we will now move on to statements by members. I recognize the honourable member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Permission to make an introduction? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. In the East Gallery, Madam Speaker, we have Carrie Riddell and Kelly Duggan, two highly respected members of the Clean Foundation. The Clean Foundation is a trusted partner to the Government of Nova Scotia in the delivery of many of our sustainable development and climate action programs. Carrie and Kelly, please stand and receive the warm welcome of the House of Assembly. Welcome. I recognize order, order. I recognize the Honourable member for Dartmouth East. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I am so thrilled to recognize Carrie Riddell, a dedicated environmental educator whose passion for preserving our planet knows no bounds. With nearly two decades of service with the Clean Foundation, Carrie has tirelessly championed environmental stewardship and education. Her innovative approach to teaching, utilizing a charismatic puppet to convey the message of the harmful effects of littering, has captivated and inspired children to become stewards of their environment. As well, Madam Speaker, I'd like to welcome Kelly Duggan from the Clean Foundation and a warm welcome to the House of Assembly to Eddie the Puppet. Hey! Eddie delights. Eddie delights young audiences with his sense of humour, sense of rhythm, his curious mind and his big heart. Together, Carrie and Eddie's invaluable contributions to environmental education and conservation have inspired us all. Their voices have been resonating across Nova Scotia and I want to thank them for joining us today and for all that they do to engage, educate and inspire our youth to be strong stewards of the planet. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I beg leave to make an introduction. Yes, please go ahead. The House's attention to the West Gallery, where we are joined by two friends, Linda Margaret Thompson Reed and Terry Joseph Reed, both of River John and Pictou County, who have come here uh, to hear the recognition that we're going to give to their daughter. Please uh, rise and receive the warm welcome of the House. Welcome, great constituents of Picto West. <laughs> I rec you said Picto County. Yeah. I recognize the Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Linda and Terry are the proud parents of Julia Reed Howell, who works as a teacher and along with her husband, lives in Fredericton, New Brunswick. Unfortunately, Julia is not able to be present with us as we celebrate her accomplishments today. But I do want to recognize Julia's achievements as an outstanding athlete and dedicated runner who throughout 2023 has had an extraordinary 
successful year. From April through to October 2023, Julia participated in numerous track races in addition to 11 road races. Uh, throughout this extensive competitive season, Julia claimed the provincial championship title in three distinct running events, the 5K, the 10K, and the half marathon races. Currently, Julia holds records for the fastest female time in these three events in the province of New Brunswick. Julie's achievements have been recognized by Run New Brunswick when, on November 19, 2023, she was named Female Runner of the Year. Julie began her running career in Pictou County at River John Consolidated School. Since then, Julie has demonstrated a high commitment to the sport of running and continues to build on her successes that began at the age of nine when Julia set her first record. We, along with her family and friends, wish Julia continued success and many more victories as she pursues her passion for track and road racing. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Madam Speaker, on this International Theatre Day, I rise today to honour Dartmouth North resident and all-round amazing person, Sebastian LaBelle, as he prepares to leave his position of Executive Director of the Bus Stop Theatre Co-op. Sebastian started as Executive Director of this vital and vibrant art space in 2016. Under his stewardship, the Co-op has purchased the building it is housed within and seen the theatre and lobby space through a major renovation and improvement. The space is now much more physically accessible and has an extra space in the basement which is used for smaller performances workshops and community events and he did all of this through a pandemic in which the world saw theaters close for extended periods of time and income from and for the arts dry up as Executive Director Sebastian has helped lead the member-run bus stop to be a truly open and available space, a place where diverse and Indigenous North End artists feel ownership and pride for the space, and a place where everyone, artists and audience alike, can feel safe. Sebastian's legacy is an organization that's viable and strong and a, build, and a building that is sound and beautiful. The word on the street, Madam Speaker, is that he's doing this to spend more time with his family, <laughs> but we will see about that. I ask all members to join me in thanking Sebastian LaBelle for his contribution to the Bus Stop Theatre and in wishing him well in whatever comes next. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Inverness. Madam Speaker, Dr. Gopalakrishnan Pillay began his career at St. Mary's Hospital in Inverness in 1972 after coming to North America from his home in southern India. He planned to stay a year or two, but thankfully for us, he stayed until his retirement in 2022. Dr. Pillay liked the challenge of rural medicine and the need to find ways to be resourceful in responding to the needs faced by a population without local access to other specialist physicians. He developed a family practice, he conducted general surgery, he delivered over 1,500 babies, and took calls in the emergency department and the surgical services over his 51-year career. Urology was his specialty. No one stood up for our hospital in Inverness like Dr. Pillay. He was always adamant that it continues with the services and programs required for our community to receive appropriate health care given its distance from regional hospitals. That included the successful campaign for a CT scanner. Madam Speaker, may we in this legislature extend our appreciation for the care Dr. Pillay gave to thousands of people who needed his, his assistance. His mark has been left on our province. I recognize the Honourable Member for Fairview Clayton Park. Madam Speaker, I rise today to recognize Kylie Field, an international board-certified lactation consultant and infant massage instructor. With a background as a registered nurse trained in South Africa in a comprehensive program that included general nursing, midwifery, psychiatry, and public health, Kylie brings a wealth of experience to her practice. Kylie's approach is rooted in compassion and personalized care, focusing on nurturing the entire family as they nav navigate the transition of welcoming a newborn into their lives. As a lactation consultant, she collaborates with parents to develop tailored breastfeeding plans, ensuring a positive and successful breastfeeding experience by both mother and baby. With her comprehensive knowledge of postpartum maternal needs and newborn care, has has had the privilege of guiding hundreds of new moms towards confidence in their mothering journey. Madam Speaker, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to Kylie Field for ensuring the well-being of families in our community, and I look forward to seeing her continued impact in the years to come. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pierre. Thank you, Madam Speaker. On World Theatre Day, I rise to pay tribute to the Boardmore Playhouse, which resides in the riding of Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pierre. The Playhouse opened in 1979, and in 1990, it was renamed the Boardmore Playhouse in honour of founders Liz and Henry Boardmore. 
The Broadmoor presents an annual season of plays, including plays for youth, four to five full-length plays, a biannual Shakespeare production, and a biannual Broadway musical, and one-week act play festival, emphasizing a new play development. The play supports community theater groups through workshops for young people and advises and provides leadership in summer theater programs. Madam Speaker, we must support local artists and local theater to ensure its, their, its longevity in our communities. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Richmond. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, today I would like to recognize the dedication of Jean Keogh, who is a perfect example of what a community dreams of having as a volunteer. Jean has actively been involved in the Rocky Bay Irish Club for many years. Her extensive efforts in creating, directing and supporting the Shamrock Players Theatre has been instrumental to the success of the club. Jean has overseen uh, organizing numerous trivia nights, John Prine tribute shows and mul multiple sittings of the Mrs. Brown's Boys Dinner Theatres that have sold out every time. She has been key to the sustainability of the club and is known for her kindness and the support she shows to all. Madam Speaker, I ask all members of this legislature to please join me in recognizing Jean Keogh for her incredible commitment to our community. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Dartmouth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. On this National Theatre Day, I'm pleased to actually acknowledge Nick Smith, who was raised in Coal Harbour and found his niche as an actor while attending Auburn Drive High School. During those years, Nick described himself as a shy child, but of course his high school experience changed everything for him. During those years, Nick could borrow a video camera from the school and film his work, then edit and broadcast the results before the entire student body right before lunch to the classroom's TVs. As a teenager, he was cast in the long-running CBC television series Street Sense, which was known for launching the careers of fellow Halifax natives such as Jonathan Torrens and Mike Clattenburg. After performing stand-up comedy in and around Halifax, Nick moved to Toronto, where he studied improv and worked briefly for much music. He was the face of the popular 7-Eleven ad campaigns from 2014 to 2020, which he started starred in over 40 national TV commercials. With several films to his credit, as well as appearances on many TV shows, Nick continues to find creative fulfillment and says he'll never stop learning his craft and will always strive to be a better person. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Madam Speaker, I rise to recognize a new creative space in central Halifax. Halifax's queer independent theatre, Da Popo, has rented a space on Kumpul Road and renamed it The Nest. Organizer Gary Williams explains, We are aiming to keep the rent low and the space accessible. We are planning some drop-in events, writer's circle, music theory, house concerts, baby group, and such to offset the cost. Current nesters include Da Popo Theatre, Patchwork Music Therapy, Unnatural Disaster Theatre, Even the Muse, Nolan Natasha, Lindsay Kite, Blue Acres, Villains Theatre, and Coral Maloney. It's a fabulous, more from Williams. It's a fabulously clear, queer space where we are hatching all kinds of queer centered projects, says Williams. It's not quite birdcage level, but we're working on it. <laughs> Madam Speaker, if you want to check out the space, the Popo Theatre will be hosting an open house and fundraiser at the Nest on Saturday, March 30th. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton East. Madam Speaker, I rise today to congratulate Mr. John Malore of McAdams Lake for being named to Great Britain's national sledge hockey team. John will now go on to play in the upcoming World Pair Ice Hockey Championships in Norway next month. Since 2015, John has been playing with the Cape Breton Sledgehammers team and quickly found a passion for the sport. His passion was recognized by sledge hockey officials in his home country, who after watching him play at a tournament in Bridgewater, invited John to train with the UK team. At 60 years of age, Malor was the oldest player at the training camp, but he knows that age is just a number. Originally from Cape Breton, John fell in love with a Cape Bretoner in 2008, and her island became his adopted home. Along with playing sledge hockey, Malor also coaches the Glace Bay Miners sledge hockey team, which has about 18 kids that are currently involved. Depending on the team's success, John could find himself competing at the 2026 Winter Paralympics in Milan, Italy. I wish John great success in his future endeavors. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax-Armdale. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Today, 
March 27th is the Canadian Orthopedic Care, Care Day, a significant event in the Canadian health calendar. I would like to thank this opportunity. I would like to take this opportunity to recognize the dedication professionals who provide essential care to patients in our community. Orthopedic care is an essential service that plays a vital role in uh, restoring mobility, alleviating pain, and improving the quality of life for countless individuals. Madam Speaker, I express my heartfelt gratitude to the orthopedic care community for their commitment to, to excellence, compassion, and expertise that makes a difference in the lives of so many. Happy Canada Orthopedic Day. Thank you, Thank you Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to recognize World Theatre Day. World Theatre Day is internationally recognized annually on March 27th as an opportunity for everyone to celebrate the value, importance, and contributions of theatre to our society. As a young person, acting fascinated me. It was something that I always wanted to do. Being on stage was such a rush. To be someone anywhere, at any time, changing characters, learning skills, and direction. Theatre gives folks an outlet to be creative. Theatre is about a connection, the spark between audience and performers. As the curtain rises, the shared experience as a community and the conversations that linger after the final bow. I would like to encourage all members to support the theatre world, buy a ticket to a show, and share your theatre experience with others. Yeah. I recognize the Honourable Member for Glace Bay Dominion. Madam Speaker, young people in need of safe, supportive places to live, call home now have that in Glace Bay. The Supportive Living Program at Abbey Ridge, a provincial government-funded project by Undercurrent Youth Centre and New Dawn Enterprises, will provide eight spaces for youth between 16 and 21. Six are permanent spaces and two are for emergency. Through the initiative and community is opening doors to space that for youth to proudly call home a sanctuary where they can find safety, support, and the opportunities they deserve. The program at Abbey Ridge will benefit residing youth who are at risk of negative outcomes due to lack of support, resources, and experience with homelessness. Residents will be encouraged to support pursuing their personal goals with resources tailored made to their personal interests. I am proud that we are part able to partner with these wonderful community organizations that share a, a goal of eliminating the cycle of poverty and addiction. Madam Speaker, I ask all members of the legislature to join me in saying thank you to Undercurrent and New Dawn Enterprises for this wonderful initiative. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Clay Park West. Madam Speaker, I rise today to recognize the upcoming event at Halifax West High School. The West students are holding their annual Head for a Cure event on April 17th in support of the Terry Fox Foundation. This is the 20th year that the Halifax West is holding the event. Some students and teachers will shave their heads and some students will cut their hair to donate, uh, to donate to making wigs for cancer victims. All proceeds go to the Terry Fox Foundation for Cancer Research. The teachers and students gather in the gym as they watch their named cancer warriors get their hair cut by local hairdressers who volunteer their time. Each warrior is given the chance to share what inspired them to participate in the fight against cancer. Madam Speaker, I ask the House to join me in recognizing the students and staff at Halifax West High School for hosting this great fundraising event. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Shebecto. Madam Speaker, a, a meaningful and significant presentation was made at the community iftar held at the Uma Masjid and Community Center in Halifax last Monday. Each year at that event, the Uma Society presents its Distinguished Community Service Award to someone who has demonstrated exceptional commitment to community and public service, exemplary leadership in fostering youth development and broader community well-being, and empathy in promoting intercultural understanding. The 2024 award was made, to her shock and surprise, to Jennifer Watts in marking her imminent retirement after six years as CEO of the Immigrant Settlement Association of Nova Scotia. 
a position Jennifer took up after serving as Director of Settlement and Integration at ISANS following her two terms as Municipal Councillor for District 8 in the HRM. Commenting on her years at the helm of ISANS, Jennifer speaks of her gratitude, among other things, for the opportunity to work with local refugee communities as they rebuild their lives and work to bring family members to Canada, and for the chance to work with the rapid response to significant humanitarian crisis that ISANS has been a part of. The Yuma Society Award is a mark of the scope of the gratitude that the community has for her, and I'm sure all members of the House join me in extending Jennifer Watts every best wish for her impending retirement in Cape Breton. I recognize the honourable member for Pictou Centre. And Madam Speaker, it is my pleasure to rise today to recognize an amazing individual in our community. At the sprightly age of 90, Raymond McDougall epitomizes the spirit of active living. Despite his age, his zest for life remains undiminished, evident in his bustling schedule filled with community engagements and social activities. Raymond is a devoted church participant, but his dedication to his community extends far beyond the church doors. Throughout the week, he joins a circle of friends for lively card games, <laughs> his sharp wit keeping pace with his opponents. His selflessness truly shines in his tireless efforts to assist fellow seniors. Armed with his trusty car and a heart brimming with kindness, he chauffeurs him to various appointments. Even as he approaches his 10th decade, McDougall remains the linchpin of social connectivity in, within our community. His knack for organizing ensures that there's never a dull moment, arranging get-togethers where laughter and camaraderie flow freely. His warm hospitality and genuine interest in others create an inclusive atmosphere where friendship flourish and memories are made. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honorable member for Cole Harbor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, may I make an introduction? Yes, go ahead, please. In the gallery opposite to me, I have, if, as I call the names, would they please stand and accept the warm welcome to the house, uh, Carlotta Weymouth and Carolyn Fowler. Both women are very strong members in the African Nova Scotian community. Welcome, nice to have you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cole Harbour. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise today to highlight a new book entitled Black Women Who Made a Difference in Nova Scotia, Special Edition, Sharing Wisdom Stories Inspired by Life Lessons. The oral history narratives in this collection were inspired by the original Black Women Who Made a Difference in Nova Scotia, published in 2007 for the Congress of Black Women Canada, Preston and Area Chapter. The original book included stories from 56 women who celebrated their community leadership initiatives. In 2020, the president of the Congress of Black Women Preston and Area Chapter, Carlotta Weymouth, and the area representative, Dolly Williams, asked Carolyn Fowler to work with them to coordinate an initiative to augment the stories of women from the original book. In this special edition, we remember we remember the who are deceased. We say their names to celebrate them as women who have made historic contributions throughout the province in historic black communities. They continue to pave the way for us as their descendants. Featured in this new special edition are among others, Connie Glasgow White, Dr. Clotilda Coward Douglas Yakmichuk, Judge Corinne Sparks, Betty Thomas, and Carlotta Weymouth. The oral history of stories are in their authentic voices and offer another opportunity to expand and deepen our understanding of their lived experiences. I encourage all Nova Scotians and my colleagues in this house to read this book and support the voices of black women in the province. Order. It is now 2.02. We will now begin quest questions put by members to ministers, and we will finish at 2.52. I recognize the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Madam Speaker, all three parties in this House stood with the governing party to say we did not want a hike to the carbon tax in our province. The Prime Minister has now written to premiers who are opposed to the carbon levy and said that the doors are open to negotiate a better deal. 
The Prime Minister indicated that there are other jurisdictions in the country, like Quebec, British Columbia, Northwest Territories, that have their own systems. Nova Scotia used to have its own system under the previous government until it was scrapped by this government. Will the Premier please, on behalf of Nova Scotians who cannot handle the increase of the carbon tax, the fact that he missed the opportunity last time, will he make up for that and take the Prime Minister up on this opportunity to negotiate a better deal for Nova Scotians that'll cost them less at the pumps? I recognize the Honourable Premier. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I completely reject the, the member's characterization of the situation. The member would know full well that what was negotiated back then was a temporary solution. There's only one group that can get rid of this federal tax, and that's the federal government. So I would, I would urge the, I would urge the member, I would urge with the, the member to stop with the, the foolishness. They're, they're, the federal government is committed to a carbon tax. It's bad for Nova Scotians, and he should stand up and say that federal government, it's bad for Nova Scotians, and they should stop it. That's the only way it will stop. Madam Speaker. The leader of the official opposition. The fact is, Madam Speaker, we did. And it didn't do anything because the Premier didn't do his job and negotiate a better deal for this province. The Premier has a real opportunity now, just like he had last time. If he cares so much about the impact that this has on the cost of Nova Scotians, he has an opportunity to take the Prime Minister up on his offer to negotiate a better deal, as BC has done, as Quebec ha has done, as the Northwest Territories has done, and as Stephen McNeil did previously. Is the Premier just going to keep playing politics with this, or is he actually going to do his job and negotiate a better deal for Nova Scotia? I recognize the Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I would suggest that the, the tone of the member suggests he's actually the one playing politics. Nova Scotians, Nova Scotians, all Canadians, in fact, know full well that the federal government is committed to a carbon tax, and there's no talking about it. We put an absolutely a wonderful plan forward. It was actually called Better Than a Carbon Tax. <laughs> and Minister, Minister Gilbo was in Nova Scotia uh, recently, and he actually stood at a podium and said, well, if somebody else has a better idea, why don't they tell me what it is? It just confirmed to us that they never even looked at our plan because they're not interested in anything but a carbon tax. The carbon tax is bad for Nova Scotians. That's the reality. That member should tell his, so tell his friend, the Prime Minister, exactly that. I recognize... Order. Order, please. Let's really start off today trying to respect everyone that's speaking. No chirping. Um, it, it was really out of hand yesterday. Let's not waste any time today. Okay, I recognize the leader of the official opposition on his final supplementary. Madam Speaker, other governments have taken their role seriously and negotiated alternative deals with the federal government. Our previous government did the same. This Premier talks about his, his deal. We know, based on a FOI pop, that they started slapping something together three weeks before the deadline of the federal backstop. Three weeks! Here's why the Premier wants a carbon tax in Nova Scotia and why he won't negotiate an alternative. So Order. they can do this. Order. The leader of the official opposition has the floor. They want it. So they can do this. They can use it as a cudgel to just attack Liberals. So they can play politics with it instead of doing their job for Nova Scotians and negotiating a better deal. And, and that fact is on display every single day in this House. They'll lose they'll, their single greatest talking point if they negotiate a better deal. My question to the Premier is, will he stop playing politics, do his job, be the bigger person here, and actually negotiate a better deal with Ottawa the for Nova Scotia? The Honourable Premier. That member sat at the cabinet table. He knows full well that this was always only a temporary solution. You know what the best time was to start negotiating? Right away on day one. They sat in government and looked the other way. We won't look the other way. There's only one group of people in this legislature that wants a carbon tax, and that's the Liberals. It's the, called the Liberal Carbon Tax for a reason, Madam Speaker. It's not called the PC Carbon Tax. <laughs> I recognize the leader of the New Democratic Party. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, this morning we heard in the Public Accounts Committee that not only will Nova Scotians be covering the capital costs incurred by Shanex at Hogan Court, including construction and mortgage costs, but we are also not requiring them to pay us for at least another two years. <laughs> to me, it sounds like the Premier delivered a great deal for Shanex instead of for Nova Scotians. And can the Premier explain, in light of this, how he can continue to insist that this was a good deal for Nova Scotians? The Honourable Premier. Madam, Madam Speaker, I, I would tell the member as I did yesterday, I would double down. This is a good deal for Nova Scotians. I would double down, I would triple down, I would quadruple down, quintuple down. If I knew what was after that, I'd do it as well, Madam Speaker, because this is a good deal for Nova Scotians. The system is the same as is in place for long term care facilities in this province. More Nova Scotians will get in more appropriate care facilities a lot quicker under this deal, and well, I'm very proud of this deal. I'll stand beside it every day of the week, Madam Speaker. Leader of the New Democratic Party. Saying it doesn't make it true. The concept of transitional care is good. This deal is bad. The project has been doomed from the start. This government's secret deal making involving confidentiality agreements, roundabout negotiating, and a developer being in a quote, very advantageous position to minimize the cost to acquire the property and maximize the cost paid by the province is clear. And now history is repeating itself. The sale to Shanex was announced as a break even for the province. But we heard this morning that the province won't get paid until 2026 at least. And the government has already allocated up to $20 million in spending for the Shanex project under an early works agreement. We're not getting paid, we're paying more. Question. It's hard not to notice who the actual winner is. For a government that Question. insists on picking winners and losers, why won't he pick Nova Scotia as a winner for once? I recognize the Honourable Premier. Madam Speaker, the reality is, is that more Nova Scotians will get in beds with more appropriate level of care a lot quicker, almost two years quicker, 178 beds. This is a good deal for Nova Scotians. Now, Madam Speaker, the reality is, is the NDP is negative on every single thing that happens in this chamber. They were mad when we bought it, and they were mad when we sold it, Madam Speaker, and they'll be mad about the next thing that happens in this province, too. the Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party on our final supplementary. Let's talk about timelines. When it was first announced, it was reported that this government wanted to open Hogan Court this year with 75 to 80 beds, and I'll table that. That was in 2023. The Bears Lake facility was supposed to be completed by 2025 with 200 beds, and I'll table that. And despite the growing need and the urgency, Nova Scotians are now being offered at least 100 fewer beds and a timeline that is months, if not years, behind behind schedule, including a months-long pause where nothing happened while the government negotiated their way out of the mess they had created. And so can the Premier tell us, when will the people waiting for these 285 promised beds see them completed, and why are we getting less health care slower from this government? The Honourable Premier. Madam Speaker, that the first patients could be moving in there by by uh, by, the, by later this year, and that's a lot quicker than would have been. Now, I I know I know that the NDP is against any arrangement where the private companies in this province are involved. I know they're, they they don't, I know they just disagree with working with private companies. We don't disagree with that. We see opportunities for Nova Scotians to get the things done faster, more efficiently. And better, better for Nova Scotians, Madam Speaker. The, the NDP can be negative as much as they want on this, and the Liberals can pile in on private companies as well. But we work with whoever will get things done for Nova Scotia, and we're proud to do it, Madam Speaker. I recognize the leader of the official opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. The Premier says he'll work with any, anybody to get things done for Nova Scotians, but he won't work with the federal government to negotiate a better carbon pricing model for the people of this province. The Premier knew what he was doing when he scrapped the cap-and-trade system that was negotiated and legislated under the former Premier, the member for Timberley Prospect. And the federal government told the Premier this. They warned him. You are proposing to end Nova Scotia's cap-and-trade program with no replacement. 
The Premier continued to do that without having a, a plan, triggered the backstop, and we see evidence in this chamber every single day. We saw it in Preston. They did it so they could put signs up saying, down with the Liberal carbon tax, because the Premier puts politics ahead of what he needs to do for people in this province. The Premier now has an opportunity Question. to negotiate a better deal for Nova Scotia like the previous government did, like other jurisdictions Question. did. Will he take it? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, this province, the province of Nova Scotia, has been clear with Ottawa. We do not need a carbon tax. We don't need a carbon tax because, Madam Speaker, we have 28 climate change goals legislated. Madam Speaker, we have the first climate change plan since 2009. Those two parties, when they were in power, did not have a climate change plan. We have 68 goals to guide us over the next five years. And Madam Speaker, just in the last year, I have approved 10 onshore wind farms, which will deliver clean, affordable, renewable power to Nova Scotians. That's better than a carbon tax, Madam Speaker. I recognize the leader of the official opposition. Uh, and Madam Speaker, uh, I'm glad the, the minister mentioned that, because those are 10 years Order. away. Order. Okay, from now on, I'm going to recognize you and I'm going to ask you to step out. It's, it's not fair. So we will now begin, so keep that in mind. I will ask you to step out from now on if I see you chirping or hear you chirping. I recognize the leader of the official opposition. Madam Speaker, this government is burning as much coal as they were two, year, two and a half years ago. <laughs> the wind plan that the minister mentioned is at least a decade away. It is not going to do anything to bring relief to taxpayers right now in this province. The prime minister has extended a hand. The premier, who says he'll work with anybody, is proving today that he won't because he thinks it benefits him politically. My question to the premier, will he do his duty to the people of this province negotiate a better deal for Nova Scotians, just like the previous government did, just like other jurisdictions are doing currently across this country. Will he do that? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I say this respectfully. The opposition, the, there's a credibility gap when it comes to this issue. And I'll tell you why, Madam Speaker. This was the first file that landed on my desk. We did not kick this issue down the road. We confronted it. And we told Ottawa we don't need a carbon tax because we are in the process of transforming how we produce and use energy. By 2027, according to the Clean Energy Plan, based on the direction we're going in with the onshore wind, solar will be at 70% renewables. Three years away to our target of 80% by 2030. Madam Speaker, we are leading on climate action and we want Ottawa to partner with us on those initiatives. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the leader of the official opposition on a new question. Madam Speaker, this government hasn't produced one megawatt of new renewable energy in the close to three years that they've been in government. So yeah, somebody does have a credibility issue here, and it's the Premier and his government. You want to talk about credibility? The previous Liberal government negotiated, fought hard to not bring a carbon tax to Nova Scotia. We had a cap-and-trade system for four years. The Premier thinks it's funny. We actually did our duty. We didn't just play politics and run ads with taxpayers' money, pretend we're doing something while we sat back and did nothing. Madam Speaker, the Ecology Action Center even said this government is playing high stakes, uh, playing a high stakes game of chicken with the federal government and betting that the impacts of the federal carbon tax will benefit them politically. And again, we see it evidenced every single day here. Will this government do what Ottawa is asking and do what they have an opportunity to do? Negotiate a better deal for Nova Scotians that reduces the price of carbon what? on the pumps. 
I recognize the Honourable Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Madam, Madam Speaker, there is no game of chicken taking place here. What's happening is a strategic implementation of climate change policies that are embedded in legislation. The only province in Canada with legislated climate change goals. Our first climate change plan since 2009 that is having a real positive impact on adaptation and mitigation in communities throughout Nova Scotia. Madam Speaker, we have an output-based pricing system that holds large emitters accountable while keeping rates stable. Madam Speaker, not only Nova Scotia, but the entire Atlantic region is united against the Liberal carbon tax, and I encourage the opposition to join us in that unity against the Liberal carbon tax. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the leader of the official opposition and to please speak through the speaker. Madam, Madam Speaker, we've had, we've had goals legislated since 2007 in this province, and the government takes credit for it like it's never happened before. This is, this is the issue right now. We're seeing it on display here. The Premier actually has an opportunity to do what previous government did, negotiate a better deal that has less of an impact on everyday consumers, uh, charges big polluters and redistributes that money to everyday Nova Scotians. The minister has said that they've stabilized rates. He said that they have a climate action plan. They haven't produced one megawatt of renewable energy in this province in three years. And they refuse to negotiate a better deal for Nova Scotians. My question to the premier is, do you like having a carbon tax so much just so you can beat Liberals over the head with it? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Uh, Madam Speaker, governments always have many tools and options before them. Uh, as a government, we have decided that a, a carbon tax on the consumer side uh, is completely not, not needed in a jurisdiction that has demonstrated consistent climate action over many, many years over many governments in different iterations. So therefore, Madam Speaker, that cap and trade system, it never functioned the way it was supposed to. We know that now. Uh, we know, Madam Speaker, that that was a temporary stopgap put in place by the previous government, and they know that. They know that fully well. Madam Speaker, we dealt with the issue head on. We are moving Nova Scotia forward with strong climate action and transforming how we produce and use energy in Nova Scotia. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Recognize the honourable member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I say a program that raised over $100 million to fight climate change. This government is spending and limited costs to one cent a litre worked pretty well. In fact, this government has triggered the carbon levy by removing cap and trade legislation. And this stuff about naturally expiring is bogus, Madam Speaker. Why would they have to remove the legislation for that to happen? And I want to table what the member is talking about. He's talking about a compliance period from 2019 to 2022 that went past the last mandate. There's three other provinces there that have their compliance mandates. That's how it works with cap and trade, Madam Speaker. The ascending carbon benchmarks required new caps that went down. My question to the minister, will he finally admit that when given the opportunity that their PowerPoint presentation extolling the virtues of the tariffs previously already in place without a price on pollution while removing cap and trade open the door to the carbon levy in Nova Scotia? And will he get back I to the drawing board? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Environment and Climate Change. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We don't agree that a price on pollution on the consumer side is necessary. And that's because, Madam Speaker, we have a very strong plan to guide us in the transformation on how we produce and use energy. We were crystal clear with uh, Ottawa as soon as we formed government that, that the, the carbon tax is not necessary in a jurisdiction uh, like ours. We are in the process of transforming uh, to clean renewables. That transformation is going to be expedited with the approval of 10 onshore wind farms. And Madam Speaker, you just wait. Once we get going with the offshore wind, as the Premier has indicated, we will emerge in the years ahead as a clean renewable powerhouse in Confederation. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The problem is the price of pollution is the law of the land. Madam Speaker, the day that they brought out this presentation that could only be described as a PR stunt, they basically told Nova Scotia, and I called it, that a carbon levy is coming to Nova Scotia. I want to table the agreement that hopefully the minister can read that says that it's a requirement and cap and trade is still eligible. Cap and trade is challenging in small provinces, which is why we put in legislation the option to link to other jurisdictions if we had liquidity issues or new entrants came into Nova Scotia. 
Does the minister not agree that lowering the cap to align with the $65 a tonne and now $80 a tonne as of April would be saving Nova Scotians at least 10 cents a litre at the gas pump? I recognize the Honourable Minister of, um, of Environment and Climate Change. Uh, Madam Speaker, we've been clear with Ottawa that the, the price on carbon on the consumer side, as it escalates uh, every year, uh, we disagree with that. Uh, we feel that in a jurisdiction like Nova Scotia, uh, our residents, our municipalities, the province is taking very strong climate action. The, the former Premier and the former Minister of Environment knows fully well how stringent and almost dogmatic the federal rules are on pricing carbon. That's why we said no to this. We don't need that to, to alter the Nova Scotia economy to a clean renewables. What we need is support on our legislated targets, support on our onshore wind, support for the green hydrogen sector, sure. support for our Sustainable Communities Challenge Fund. That's climate action. That's not a PR stunt. That, Madam Speaker, produces real results for Nova Scotians. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Madam Speaker, late last night, under the cover of darkness, government members discussed at length the mounting concerns about this government's approach or pr proposed new approach to the disclosure of personal health information, which physicians have warned will fundamentally change the nature of the patient-doctor relationship and potentially break people's trust in their physicians by allowing unrestricted, unrestricted disclosure of deeply private information. Can the Minister of Health and Wellness explain what is so important that requires this government to play with fire with our personal information? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And as I said uh, yesterday, there are already requirements in place for the Minister of Health uh, that, that that individual has to meet under the Personal Health Information Act already. This is about getting information in the hands of Nova Scotians so that they can have their records in their hands. They can navigate the health care system. We have seen this to be hugely successful in other jurisdictions. We have a responsibility to manage the health care system. We receive aggregate data from our hospitals, from our clinics, from all over, but we don't have aggregate data from our primary care. And that's what this is about, managing a system, managing it well, managing it appropriately, and giving people access to their patient records. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Madam Speaker, the government has indicated that these changes are needed to advance the work of the Your Health NS app. Has anyone heard of that app, by the way? Which, in part, is being run by an Ontario-based company that was awarded this work in an untendered $50 million five-year contract last year. It's recently come to light that this company has been facing financial challenges and was recently acquired by an investment firm. Last week in estimates, I asked the minister about the sale and was told by the minister that the contract would be assumed by the buyer. Can the minister confirm, has anyone from the department been in contact with the new owner of people's private health information? And what does all this mean for Nova Scotia's health data? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I want to assure Nova Scotians that we are absolutely in compliance uh, with all of the, the um, privacy laws that are in place. We want people to have access to their health records. We want people to be able to be their advocates in the healthcare system. People are asking, we hear all the time from the feedback on the app, we want more. We want to know where our records are. We want to know what our blood work says. We want to know about our diagnostic imaging. People are asking for this information. And through this legislation, and through the work that's happening with Nova Scotia Health and a number of, of uh, individuals who are responsible for privacy to support us in, re in granting that request. There is nothing to fear for Nova Scotians. I recognize the Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The answers we're getting today aren't sufficient about onshore wind and hydrogen talking points. Of course, the answer is no surprise given the PC Opposition at the time voted against cap and trade in 2017 that limited the costs for Nova Scotians. And, and that fund raised over $100 million that this government is now owed of since the cap and trade is cancelled. Had they been in government then, the impact would have already been the same as we have seen in other provinces and escalating each year. Why can't the government lay out the case as they're trying to do in this legislature? Why Nova Scotia already has some price signals and regulation? 
and our unique circumstances and set new caps to limit the cost increases to two or three cents a litre. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Environment and Climate Change. Uh, Madam Speaker, as, as we transform how we produce and use energy in this province, uh, the Minister of Natural Resources and I and the Premier are always very mindful, very mindful uh, of, the, of the impact of that transformation on ratepayers, on all of Nova Scotians. We're in a period of profound transition, and that transition comes out of complete necessity, Madam Speaker. Uh, climate change requires that we, change, we, we alter how we uh, produce and, and use energy. Uh, however, in a time such as this, in a time of record inflation, we've been clear with Ottawa for almost three years that a carbon tax on the consumer side is completely unnecessary in a jurisdiction that is doing so much and has done a lot over the years to, to transform how we produce and use energy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And we said the same thing in government, that it was unnecessary and somehow we negotiated a deal. If the government truly knew how to negotiate the best deal for affordability and for climate change, they could have stood the ground and negotiated with the merits and left the legislation as it was. But no, put politics before people. Leave the cap and trade and say to Ottawa, if this isn't good enough, tell us where the caps need to be. Will the minister table one document, anything at all, that shows that the federal government did reject any new descending cap and trade caps that would have protected the sticker shock. Can the minister show any of his work to prove that there is no other option than the highest net increases at the gas pump in the whole country? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Environment and Climate Change. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, Ottawa was clear that, uh, that the cap and trade system established by the previous government wasn't compliant with the new strict federal regulations on, on pricing carbon. So therefore, the Premier and I and our team delivered the Better Than a Carbon Tax Plan, which laid out our vision over the next number of years to deliver climate action for Nova Scotians. Legislated targets, 28 of them, Madam Speaker, a, a climate plan which has 68 strong goals that's being implemented throughout the province. The Sustainable Communities Challenge Funds, which supports local climate action. And Madam Speaker, look, the fact is we have a lot of momentum on climate action. We have a lot of momentum on this, and Madam Speaker, we don't need a carbon tax. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honorable member for King's South. Oh, sorry. I recognize the honorable member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Nova Scotia has been a member since 2018 of the Western Climate Initiative. This is one of the largest trading systems in the world. It is a group that collaborates with independent jurisdictions, working to identify, evaluate, and implement emissions trading policies to tackle climate change. This is a comprehensive effort to reduce greenhouse gas pollution, spur investment in clean energy. The centerpiece of the plan is a regional cap and trade program, and the previous Liberal government joined this group. The Minister of Environment extended the agreement to March 31, 2024, yet the provincial government was actively opposing the principles on working together to tackle climate change. Oddly, Nova Scotia actually has continued to chair this initiative even as late as last year in 2023, and I'll table that in their August board meeting. I want to question, why did the, we actually chair this group at, for WCI after this government fought so hard against the principles behind the Western Climate Initiative? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Environment and Climate Change. Uh, Madam Speaker, as I said, we're all, you know, in any decision a government makes, there's always ongoing analysis. In the end, it was determined by our government that we are a leader on sustainable development. We are a leader on climate action. It's not only Nova Scotia that's united against this carbon tax. The entire Atlantic region is against this, Madam Speaker, not only, uh, not only calling for the pause of the carbon tax, but to repeal the carbon tax. And I encourage the opposition members in this House to join the Nova Scotia government in calling for the repeal of the Liberal carbon tax. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm disappointed the Minister won't show his work on how they attempted to negotiate a deal or work with any jurisdiction, whether it's the Western Climate Initiative. There's cap and trade uh, systems working right now in the northeastern states. Now he's talking about the Atlantic ministers. I wonder, can I ask the minister if he's ever approached any of his Atlantic counterparts to talk about the potential for linking instead of going forward with a PowerPoint presentation that he knows is not <coughs> compliant with the pan-Canadian framework. 
This is an opportunity to get to work with our Atlantic partners, reduce gas prices, and continue to fight climate change and raise revenue. Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Environment and Climate Change. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. In, in the summer of 2022, in, uh, in the beautiful territory of the Yukon, you saw in the Yukon at a federal provincial territorial meeting the formation of the Atlantic Alliance. And the Atlantic Alliance at that time confronted the federal minister. And you know what we said, Madam Speaker? No to the Liberal carbon tax. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for King South. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Now, we know this government continues to try and blame everybody else when it comes to carbon tax. We also know this government loves to tax Nova Scotians more than any other province in the country. They want to squeeze every penny out of Nova Scotians to fund their, their mismanagement of this government. In Nova Scotia, this government puts HST on the carbon tax. My question to the Minister of Finance, can, you, can the Minister tell Nova Scotians what the province collects from the carbon tax? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, the, the carbon tax goes back to the government who's made it the law, and that's the federal government. Uh, I can also tell you the carbon tax is not working. We have uh, numbers at the Department of Finance that show that dis uh, despite the increase in price at the pump, people are actually buying more fuel per capita in this province. The carbon tax doesn't work, and it doesn't provide options for people to move away from fossil fuels. I recognize the Honourable Member for King's South. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So I took the budget, did some quick calculations, and this government is collecting $32 million of HST on the carbon tax. $32 million. No wonder they don't want to get rid of the carbon tax. Yeah. <laughs> now, the, the federal government, through the carbon tax, returns most of it to Nova Scotians through a quarterly payment. What is the province doing with the $32 million? They're keeping it. My question for the minister, will you ax the tax and stop collecting HST on the carbon tax? I recognize the order. Order, please. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, I can't wait until they ax the tax in Ottawa. <laughs> And if the current government in Ottawa doesn't come to their senses and axe it, there'll be another government that will axe it. Uh, Madam Speaker, I know the Federal Minister of Environment, this is how out of touch that government is in Ottawa. I know the Federal Minister of Environment recently made the comment that we shouldn't put any more money into roads. Now, how well do you think a comment like that would play in our province here in Nova Scotia? I can tell you roads are one of the number one concerns of my constituents. And my constituents, they don't want a carbon tax when they're filling up at the pump. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Whitney Pier. Thank you, Madam Speaker. On November 4th, at the Rebuilding Hope Conference, the Premier offered what he called an unreserved apology to persons with disabilities for what he called the province's deeply shameful treatment. And I'll table that. To the Minister of Community Services, does this government still stand by the historic apology offered to persons with disabilities? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Community Services. Yeah, of course we do. And, it, and it's not just about words, it's about actions. And that's why in this budget we're seeing over $100 million to go toward the remedy. We're going to continue to invest with people with disabilities and we're going to continue to give them choice because that's what it's all about. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pier. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'm, I'm glad that the Minister and I are in agreement that it's also about actions rather than just words. This government has a court-mandated legal obligation as year one of the historic human rights remedy ends on March 30th to set firmer commitments from this government. Before March 30th, this government must set dates for achieving and actually implement the no new admission policy to facilities funded by the Disability Support Program. 
Will the government stand by this public commitment and legal obligation and implement this policy within the next four days? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Community Services. Uh, I want to thank you, Madam Chair. We're going to continue to work with our providers on the ground. And you know, it's not just about court mandated. We keep hearing that from that side of the aisle, that it's court mandated. You know what wasn't court mandated, Madam Ch uh, Speaker? The $300 extra a month we gave people with disabilities. You know what else wasn't court mandated? Indexing of income assistance, Madam Speaker. These are things that we know are going to help everyone right across Nova Scotia. We're going to continue to do what's right for people with disabilities, and we're going to continue to carry on. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, I've come to think that no one benefits more from having a carbon tax in Nova Scotia than this Premier and this government, Madam Speaker. It is their chief talking point. They hide behind all their failures by issuing this talking point. They have an opportunity now to actually negotiate a different deal for Nova Scotians. They're not going to do that by the sounds of things. And we have to wonder why. I think it's because they think it's politically valuable to them. And as the member for King South said, they're actually collecting tax on top of that tax. The Minister of Finance has said he cares about affordability and lowering the costs of fuel for Nova Scotians. Will he do the right thing, negotiate a better deal with Ottawa, and stop collecting HST on top of the carbon tax? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, the, the opposition, the Liberal opposition here is talking about what a great deal that they had arranged with the federal government before we came to mm -hmm. office. If it was such a great deal, why did it only last three years? Because it was term limited. It had nothing to do with what they had to do in, in, while they were in government. It had to do with windmills that were brought on by the NDP when they were in office that cost Nova Scotians on their power rates. That became an election issue at the time. Uh, I remember there was talk by the McNeil government saying before they came to office they were going to get rid of the monopoly of Nova Scotia power. It was a big political issue. So, Madam Speaker, what was in place came to an end. What should come to an end is the carbon tax. <laughs> the leader of the official opposition. The minister can point fingers and lay blame. But look at the facts. Eight years of provincial Liberal government in this House, we had stable power rates and we did not have a carbon tax while we did our part to fight climate change and price pollution. This Minister, this Premier has an opportunity to negotiate a better deal with Ottawa. There has been a hand extended. And here we see them again prioritizing a, a political fight that they think plays to their advantage and which has played to their advantage because they've hid behind all their failures by pointing to the carbon tax, which people are rightly upset about. They have an opportunity now to do things to actually change that, negotiate a better deal, and actually stop charging their provincial HST tax on top of the carbon tax. My question to the question. Premier, will he do both of those things? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, we're not doing this to the Liberal Party. They're doing it to themselves. Yeah. It's pretty obvious. It's pretty obvious. Um, if it actually was something they worked and believed in, you could see, well, you know, credit to them, you know. This is something that's actually working, but it's not working. Nova Scotians are buying more gasoline today with a carbon tax per capita than they were before the carbon tax came in. So, Madam Speaker, it's not working. It doesn't help people move away from fossil fuels. It's destroying the Liberal Party. We're not doing that. They're doing it to themselves. I recognize the Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, according to a survey conducted by the CFIB, two in ten small businesses have uh, no confidence that the government is doing things to help support them as they grow. And I'll table that. Um, no. Order, please. I recognize the Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Madam Speaker, will, this is a question for the Minister of Economic Development. Would the Minister of Economic Development help put some confidence back in Nova Scotia small businesses by encouraging her members to negotiate a better deal on carbon with the federal government? 
recognize the Honourable Minister for Economic Development. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank the member opposite for uh, the question. When it comes to Nova Scotia small businesses, with whom I check in regularly, both individually and sector-based organizations, and yes, with the CFIB, um, there are a number of persistent problems and a number of persistent issues. And you're going to say, but the topic's been brought up by the other side today. What are some of those issues? The pressure of the carbon tax. But before that, the pressure of the Canada Emergency Business Account, the, the CBA loans. And we begged the opposition to join us in asking their federal uh, colleagues, I and they the refused. the honourable member for Northside Westmount. Madam Speaker, again, we see finger pointing. But what we don't realize, when you point your finger, there are three other fingers pointed back at you. So, Madam Speaker, it's up to this minister to help Nova Scotians and to help Nova Scotian businesses to weather this storm. So, can we please ask this minister to work with her members to propose a better deal for Nova Scotians, Nova Scotian businesses, and help improve their confidence in this government? Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Economic Development. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I will note, uh, my late granddad used to, to note how often I talked with my hands that that was the French of me, but I did not lift a finger to point. And that is because I am working with this government, with my colleague, the Minister of Environment and Climate Change, on a solid plan for uh, better than a carbon tax. And meanwhile, once again, I will reference the remarks of the senior uh, Deputy Governor of the Bank of Canada, who after three days in Nova Scotia, remarked on the incredible optimism of the business community for the way future. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Wellness. On December the 4th, 2023, the Premier announced that travel nurses working for Nova Scotia Health, IWK, and government-funded long-term care homes can only be hired for a maximum of 180 days a year. The purpose was to manage costs and encourage nurses to take permanent posi positions. It's great in theory, but only but will only work if there's enough, nurse, enough nurses and the working conditions are good, and neither of those conditions are reality. Madam Speaker, this is going to hurt hospitals like Cumberland Regional that, are, that travel nurses are essential in keeping our ICU and our emergency room open. Can the Minister share what is the plan to ensure critical nursing services continue to be available after June the 12th, which by my calculations is 180 Question. days after December the 15th when the new rules come into place? Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So we certainly uh, do appreciate the work that happens in the province uh, by travel nurses, but uh, we know that not only in Nova Scotia, but across this country, travel nurses and travel nurse companies are costing an incredible amount of money to the system. We could reinvest that money into our own provincial system, into other things. We are working very hard with the unions, with the employers, uh, throughout the university system to ensure that we have enough nurses. We are working with the College of Registered Nurses uh, as well to make sure that we have a number of individuals who are coming into that. We know it's a tough target, but we have to uh, hold people accountable and we know that we need to increase the workforce and we have invested millions of dollars in order to do that. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. My concern, uh, Madam Speaker, is what if we don't have enough nurses by that 180-day time period? What will happen? Our doctors that are running our ICUs and our emergency departments have come to me very concerned and worried that they're going to have to close beds, beds that they, we, we cannot afford to have closed. And I know that there was the nursing retention bonus that helped many nurses, but I continue to hear from nurses that are upset that they didn't receive that, and we can't seem to find any rules or a policy on who qualifies uh, for that retention bonus. So can the minister share with us where um, can she table the policy for who qualifies for this nursing retention bonus? Um, we've been told to t direct people to their managers, but managers also don't have that information. I um, recognize the Honourable Minister for Health and Education. 
Thank you, Madam uh, Speaker. Um, so the, uh, any nurse that's employed in the public sector uh, can reach out. They would have received an email, actually, because I have had several people reach out to me as well, and, and they actually have an email that explains who uh, benefits or who is able to um, participate in the, in the retention bonus. There, is a number of, there are a number of initiatives that are underway. We know that this timeline is tight around the use of travel nurses. I have confidence in the employers, both in the continuing care sector and Nova Scotia Health, to address the issue. We continue to work work with them and monitor, as well as the unions and the college. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Madam Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development. There may, there may be no better group of people, better positioned to speak to the state of Nova Scotian schools than our teachers, mm -hmm. who work on the ground with our children and have been warning the public for years of the worsening issue of school violence. As the NSTU recently said, teachers know firsthand the devastating impact of school violence on children, school staff, and their families. Can the minister explain why then her government colleagues are preventing teachers from appearing before an, an upcoming public accounts committee on this particular issue? Order, please. I would ask the member from Halifax Needham to rephrase her question. Uh, you cannot um, include any type of committee business in your question, so I'll give you an opportunity to stand quickly in your place and ask the question rephrase, please. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I will rephrase the question. Does the minister think that um, uh, the NSTU would be an appropriate... Um, um, have a public platform within the committee speaking? No, no in, government. in government. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. So uh, let me be clear. Um, we understand and value the importance of the voices of our teachers, of our educators across the province with respect to all matters on education and particularly with respect to safety, Madam Speaker. That is why we formed a leadership table that includes NSTU and PSANS to deal with the exact question of safety and that's why I continue to meet with those parties on a regular basis to address safety in schools. Madam Speaker, that's also why I've talked to teachers across the province, thousands of teachers, meeting with them in meetings, over 80 staff meetings already, where we talk about issues around safety and that informs the work we're doing on safety. So, for example, we've spoken with Brooklyn Elementary Schools and they've identified the need to review our code of conduct, which we're doing as part of this safety work. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Not only can teachers shed important light on the safety and well-being of students and staff, the issue of school violence gets to the heart of challenges in recruitment and retention of teachers. 42% of teachers who have recently considered quitting indicated this was because of rising levels of school violence. The NSTU is now urging this government to reconsider so my, my question to the minister is, does the minister believe that the, the deputy minister knows the issues better than the NSTU teachers that are on the ground? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I do really appreciate this opportunity to clarify the confusion um, around this issue and around um, the question of including NSTU and teachers in this discussion. Because, Madam Speaker, um, Public Accounts Committee reviews reports of the Auditor General, and the Auditor General recommends witnesses at that committee. I think that's important to understand. Madam Speaker, that being said, we know and value the importance of teachers speaking to us and us working in conjunction with and on the advice of teachers around um, safety in schools. Madam Speaker, that is why we are supporting families to be more engaged, because we've heard from schools like Avonview, Hilden, and Islands Consolidated about the need to include families in this work. Madam Speaker, that's why we are improving incident reporting. I've heard from our students about the need to improve Thank incident reporting. I recognize Thank you, Madam the Speaker. Honourable Member for Bedford South. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like us all to snap back to reality here because we've been inside the upside-down world of the carbon tax for the last 50 minutes. So I just want to finish here and remind everybody where we started, which is that the Prime Minister has asked seven premiers, including this premier, if their governments will negotiate a new and better system than the carbon tax. I'd like to ask the Minister of Environment and Climate Change, are they going to do that or would that be too inconvenient for their political narrative? Thank you.
I recognize the Honourable Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Uh, thank you, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, we have been crystal clear with Ottawa that we do not need a carbon tax on the consumer side, a, a tax that doesn't do anything for the environment. As the Minister of Finance have indicated, we, people still drive. It's been in effect in this province for a year now, and it, all it's had is a punitive impact on the pocketbooks of Nova Scotians. What we will move forward with, though, Madam Speaker, is the Environmental Goals and Climate Change Reduction Act, the Nova Scotia Climate Plan, our output-based pricing system, and transforming how we produce and use energy in Nova Scotia with or without Ottawa. Thank That's you, Madam time. Speaker. The time allotted for questions put by members to ministers has expired. Being uh, opposition day, I will now take an opportunity to recognize uh, the official uh, House Leader, the leader, the <laughs> House Leader of the official opposition. Thanks, Madam. Thanks, Madam Speaker. We're going to start uh, opposition business today with Bill number 450 assessment act an act to amend respecting a property tax cap for disaster victims then you ready private uh, member bill uh bill 450 uh assessment act i recognize the honorable government house leader oh. call the bill yeah <coughs> Again, to, to, for procedural, I recognize the Honourable uh, House Leader for the official opposition. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, the first bill we're going to call today is Bill Number 450, uh, Assessment Act, an Act to amend respecting a property tax cap for disaster victims. I recognize uh, the Honourable Member for Hammonds Plains, Lucasville, on Bill uh, 450, the Assessment Act. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I move uh, second reading of uh, Bill 450, and I do so uh, proudly on behalf of uh, at least 151 families uh, that lost their homes in last year's wildfire in Upper Tantal and Hammonds Plains. And I, will, I, I guess I will preface my remarks with uh, there has been a lot of work and outreach uh, and time and effort that has gone into an effort to advocate, advocate for this change. Uh, there has been correspondence extended to all members of the House, uh, multiple pieces of correspondence that have been extended to the Minister and his office, um, making folks aware of just how impactful the change that uh, I've brought before the House today could be for families that experience a, a disaster, such as uh, a wildfire, a flood, or a hurricane. Um, and the, the intention behind this action is to justly, I think, show empathy and consideration and financial support to folks that through no fault of their own are being faced with the responsibility to reconstruct their homes after a terrible tragedy such as the wildfire that we, 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 see, we saw last summer. And I know that in all that we do, we try to, in, to the best of our ability, make the most of situations even when they're most unfortunate. I know that um, remarks were made around the House today about doing just that as a result of uh, the mass casualty that happened a couple of years ago today. And so in that spirit, I hope that uh, members will, in fact, take that into consideration of how to, how to do better for Nova Scotians, even though uh, we've experienced a, ter a terrible tragedy. And so the problem that we're trying to address, Madam Speaker, is that the Assessment Act does not, in, does not exclude reconstruction after a disaster, such as a wildfire, flood, or hurricane, in its definition of new construction. And the result of this, the impact uh, for those of, those of uh, my community members 
who have lost their home in a wildfire, their property taxes are going to go up. It's obvious and it's, and it's documented, it's, it's actually happening. There was one family that has returned to their home, thank goodness, and has experienced a 29% increase in their taxes. There's another that's expressing an increase of 38%. This is because, Madam Speaker, contrary to what the Minister has expressed, this is because the PVSC has limitations. They have to operate within the framework that is established by the Minister through legislation. They have agreed to move ahead with one protection to protect the percentage differential, differential excuse me, between the fair market assessment and the capped assessment, which is, which, which is fine. However, we're still going to see them experience an increase in their taxes because that differential protection does not go far enough. What we're asking for is to go back to the pre-event, pre-fire uh, capped assessment. We know, as the minister has referenced, that there was also a 15% reduction that was established to show some appreciation for the situation and the state of the properties that are in that area. But that is applied to every single property owner. It does not. Uh, it is not to consider the fact that some of those people that are going to be receiving that 15% have total losses. And I will reiterate, the conclusion is those that have been victimized by a wildfire in our community through no fault of their own are going to be paying more property taxes. The minister in this government has the ability to do something about it. At the time that this, as I understand it, at the time that this program came into place, the purpose of using the term new construction had to do with properties that were adding to their existing home or setting up another detached building on the property. And that's to reflect, you know, an increase to the, the footprint, an increase to the uh, an expansion of the home. And that makes sense. But what it doesn't include is consideration for the fact that if someone, if someone loses their home through no fault of their own in a disaster, that, that should not, in my opinion, and in the opinion of more than uh, close to 700 people who signed a petition this weekend, that 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 definition of new construction should not include homes that have been reconstructed uh, as a result of a wildfire or a disaster situation. And I need to be specific because the purpose of this, this the use of the word reconstruction is to ensure, and that's, that's part of the, the actual motion, the purpose of using the word reconstruction it's used to ensure that folks are rebuilding very, very closely to what they had to almost the exact point. We're not talking about expanding what they had. We're not talking about building something far more glamorous. We are talking about a reconstruction and that should be, that should be noted for the record as the intended purpose of this bill. And I will table these, but I reference that all members of the House got a copy of the letter from my community members. Um, I will also table a infographic laid out there, which which shows the the impact that this has on folks that have to reconstruct their homes who have lost their homes by comparison to some who have made repairs, and just how significant to the tens of thousands of dollars over a period of the next 10 years, how significant uh, the increase is going to be for them. And the, the conclusion that we perhaps are, are leading towards, I mean, we, I, I referenced earlier, we've got one family dealing with 29% increase, 
another family dealing with a 38% increase. These increases are not ones that they planned for, and, it, and they're not ones that they may be capable to withstand. And from a government that is so focused on the issues of housing and homelessness, if these folks are not able to continue to live where they are because their property taxes and their costs have gone up so substantially, they may be forced to find other arrangements. They may be forced back into find whatever is left in the market as we speak. So we want to make sure that they have the ability to stay in these homes. Madam Speaker, the in, in, in question period yesterday, in a follow-up interview, um, the minister used words like, the reality is, I know it's a challenging situation. You know, I, I think I think he I think he appreciates to some extent the weight of what has happened in in the province and in our community. But the reality, Madam Speaker, is that he has the ability. I don't I don't even need to be here debating this piece of legislation if the minister takes it upon himself to make the change through regulation to allow the PVSC to bring back, to restore the pre-fire cap, the pre-fire cap. He continually makes reference to the municipality's responsibility. And this has been a PVSC policy for some time. And while there are roles and responsibility that the municipality plays, and this has been a long-standing policy of the PVSC, it is my ask on behalf of the people that I represent and Nova Scotians down the road who go through a similar set of circumstances, it's my ask that we don't continue to do things the way that they've always been done. That answer is not, Madam Speaker, that's not good enough. That does not show that we have a strong sense of empathy. It does not show that we, I've heard it used before, you know, in true blue noser spirit. We have an opportunity to make a change as legislators. The minister has an ab ability to make the change on his own, but has seemingly decided that he's okay to say, well, it's not my responsibility. This is a long-standing policy, and we're okay watching the victims of a tragedy such as the wildfire continue to be victimized through this unfair taxation limitation. And, Madam Speaker, the, what's going to happen here? So the, the province... The government, at the end of the day, is going to collect more tax dollars on the backs of folks that have lost everything. They've, they've lost, some of them have lost beloved pets, beloved pets. Um, they've lost family heirlooms. They've lost, you know, I, I spoke with a gentleman yesterday who was very passionate about maintaining his yard and and the state that he had it to before the fire. It took him many years to get it to that point. These are things that are that are very, very hard, take time, effort. Many of these things cannot be replaced. And it is my hope that as was stated in his interview yesterday through, through the speaker, the minister said, well, they're going to have a new home. Well, yes, that is, that is true. But it, it will be as similar as you can get from a skeleton look to what they had before. It won't have all those family heirlooms. It won't have all those personalized touches that people work so hard to get. It comes at 
in, in many cases, great personal expense after fighting with insurance companies to try and get coverage for whatever you possibly can. There are many families out there that are going to take a loss. I would also add that there are families that have had to move because they couldn't afford to go back. They've got contaminated, thank you, contaminated properties that they have to restore. The costs are far more considerable than I think we even realize to date because the investigations are still ongoing. But one of the ways that we as legislators can show this community and these people and future disaster victims that we care, that we are willing to we're willing to step up for people when they're going through a tremendously difficult time in you know, true blue noser fashion. We have an opportunity to make a change here that, that will show people that when they speak up, as I said this weekend, nearly 700 people took time out of their day to travel to sign this petition. And that's, that's only a couple of days. And remember that these people have neighbors. They have friends and families in neighboring communities. There, there, is, there is an impact that we can make to learn from this awful situation that happened in Hammonds Plains, Upper Tantallon, and do something that is for the better good. That, demonstrates our ability as, as legislators to take, a, to take an issue from a, from a problem and make a solution that is going to have a, that is certainly going to have a positive impact on people that have been through a devastating situation. So I challenge the minister, use his power, use his authority to make a directive to get this accomplished for Nova Scotians. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Peer. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I want to thank you to the member of um, Hammonds Plains, Lucasville, for bringing this forward. I'm, 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 I'm happy to speak on uh, Bill 450. So. I just want to go back and be, um, I guess, nerd out a little bit on property tax cap for a second. Um, and as many of you will know, the property tax cap um, is on most, if not all, of our homes. Um, it goes on the first year of a sale, after that first year. Um, but it also gets removed. And what most people think happens is that it's only during sales that the property tax cap is removed from your home. Or should you build um, another structure on your home, that part is also not capped. What is not often known to people until it happens to them is that this cap gets removed if your house has been destroyed by fire, by hurricanes, um, by floods, natural disasters. So many people are unaware of this, of this circumstance that their cap is taken off. So when they go to rebuild, and they're rebuilding from a fire, Often what they find is the shocking sticker price. I know in my riding, a number of years ago, um, a constituent had a devastating, devastating fire. The house was gone. And they rebuilt, and they rebuilt in the same uh, structure as the house. Um, they didn't go bigger, nothing. They stayed in that same frame that they, that they had. And a year after they were back in their home, the shock of their property tax, because the cap had been removed. 
They were shocked by it. And they could barely afford to stay in that home. And I had a few other constituents um, back in 20, you know, that I heard from when I became the when I was became the counselor for the area, who also had this problem after a fire. And they rebuilt. Um, they didn't go bigger because they couldn't afford to go bigger. They didn't, you know, they didn't go longer. Nothing. They stayed in that same format because that's what they could afford. And again. The sticker shock that they got when their property taxes came in because the cap was removed because it gets removed with new bills and this is what has occurred in multiple occasions and I, I, I keep seeing the minister tell me that that's not true but my constituents had faced this all of our constituents at one point or another who have had fires in the homes that they've owned and those homes had to be completely rebuilt have faced this. We cannot keep denying the reality that people are facing in this house. We need to stop denying people's reality that they are telling us that they are facing. So during the wildfires last year, our province saw a record of 25,000 uh, hectares of land and 200 homes burn. Given the scale of damage, there are now long-term consequences to Nova Scotians. Having your home destroyed, Madam Speaker, <coughs> by a fire, by a flood, by a hurricane, is a deeply traumatic experience and has long-term consequences, both financially and mentally. Associated costs related to the increased property tax should not be a long-term consequence we add to those who have already faced such a deep impact. Nova Scotians who've had homes destroyed by wildfires and or natural disasters should not have increased costs that just don't go away. And sure, the cap, after they've rebuilt, the cap will go back on within a year, but it's at a higher rate. It really is. That's why this bill seems fair, fairly common sense. It makes absolute sense that people should not be financially punished or have to sell their land or their home and move because of a natural disaster or a wildfire that somebody set. This bill would ensure that Nova Scotians who have had to rebuild after these wildfires would not see this, in, this increase in their property taxes beyond their, what their original cap was. It's, to, to not have something in place is deeply unfair. It really is. It's deeply unfair to any of our, any of our constituents who have faced this, especially after what we've seen this past year or so. So this type of bill would allow, would allow impacted Nova Scotians to keep more of their money in their pockets, to do more of it with. This m money could help facilitate the long healing process that is, is much needed in the aftermath of such trauma. And coming from someone who, you know, my riding has, has now faced hurricanes, who people have lost homes, that have faced a, a 200 centimeter uh, tsunami of snow that actually took out roofs and homes of people. I, I deeply feel I am I deeply feel the impact that the mem that the member for Hammonds Plains Lucasville feels. I, I, compl I completely understand what 
what he is feeling and what the residents are feeling. It is possible for this bill to go further, though. And I think, we, I think we'd both be in agreement on that. And recognizing that housing is a basic human right. We would, have lo we would like to see more broader protections for those Order. who also don't own their home. Order. There's quite a bit of chatter um, in the chamber here. I would ask if you're having a discussion maybe to take it outside. I recognize the honorable member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pierre. We'd also, yeah, so we'd also like to see broader protections for those who don't own their homes, those who have rented um, when incidences like this happen. So with all of that said, this bill provides necessary protections for those who have lost their homes as a result of wildfire or natural, natural disasters. And, I, and the one thing I ask going forward with regards to the debate on this bill is that we do not, in this House, deny the reality of what other people are facing, of what other people have dealt with in the past by saying that what they faced was, this did not happen or was not true. Because it has been. It was. They have their tax, they have all their property assessments and their tax, um, and their tax bills to show that, yes, indeed, that is what did happen to them. And with that, Madam Speaker, I take my seat. Thank you. I recognize the honorable member for Colchester North. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And I'm very happy to stand today and uh, speak about uh, this act, uh, Bill 450, an act, uh, assessment act respecting a property tax cap for disaster victims. And as the member from uh, Hammonds Plains, Lucasville, um, mentioned in the beginning of his uh, comments, and I truly do uh, understand his desire to, uh, uh, to support in any way possible the victims of uh, disasters. I've done that for the last uh, three years uh, with people that lost a lot more than heirlooms in a house, you know. They lost something that can never be replaced. And uh, so I understand very much um, um, the desire to support uh, your, uh, the re re residents that you support. Um, so I'm happy to stand here and speak to this bill uh, today um, respecting a, a property tax cap. Uh, I've spent a lot of time, and I spent a lot of time in municipal government uh, uh, talking about property taxes and capped assessments and assessments and uh, that sort of thing, and some time in, uh, in the real estate industry talking about, uh, <laughs> you know, with uh, people that are wanting to sell and buying and selling houses about the uh, about the, the, the cap coming off, uh, changing the assessment, it's a pretty, uh, it's quite a, uh, it's, a it's, always a, it's, it's always an interesting discussion. I have lots of points of views on that and I'm sure I will uh, get to them before, um, before my time is up here. Um, but I, I want to first talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what, what, our, what our government has done uh, has, we, we've made, we've taken significant steps, measures to address the unprecedented events of last summer, uh, whether it be floods or whether it be fires, um, you know, uh, provided, and I, and I know, I know that we can never do enough. I know that very well. Um, uh, but we did uh, provide $500 for every household uh, uh, that was required to evacuate as a result of the fires, both in HRM and Shelburne County. And as I go down, I, I want to make a point here that these are, this is an act respecting cap for victims of disasters. We provided uh, two and a half million provincial investment to launch the small business wildfire relief a program to provide a one-time grant of $2,500 to every single small business and charity affected by the wildfires 
in HRM in Shelburne County. Seven and a half million uh, provincial investment to buy 25 fully furnished modular homes to lease to those displaced by the wildfires in HRM in Shelburne County. Matching donations, all donations made as part of the Canadian Red Cross, Nova Scotia and Atlantic Canada Fires Appeal. We, we launched the Disaster Financial Assistance Program to cover up to 200,000 in uninsurable losses for every eligible household or small business and not-for-profit who suffered loss as a result of the wildfires in HRM, Shelburne and Yarmouth County. And we're partnering online with online service providers like Happy Pet and Yardy to assist those displaced by wildfires in finding housing. And I can only imagine what it was like for those that were impacted on those days as that unfolded and everybody trying to find a place to take their children. You know, it, it, it was, there, there's no, I'm, I, I don't want it for what, I, it, it must have been tremendously tr traumatic. But it, and, and, and again, I, I don't want to minimize this, but I, you know, I'm not, uh, there's lots of disasters. Are we going to, so if my house burnt tomorrow, it would be a disaster without question. And for everyone who's ever had their house burn, unless they let it themselves before someone and collect the, the insurance, it's a disaster. So uh, what do we say to the people or the person that may have happened? Because these questions will come up. There's no denying it, right? What will we say to the person who, who, um, who had a fire one of those same days in, in Cape Breton or, or in Colchester North or wherever, and they are, feel just as bad as, 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 as those that were in this disaster? And so I point to the fact that uh, we're going to talk about PBSC here in a minute, but uh, uh, apparently P PBSC has, has made a decision. I'm just going to find it here. Um, that uh, if, 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 uh, if the home that burnt was capped at 60% of its value under the cap currently, it will just be, it, it, it's not like they're going to all of a sudden go to the full, to the full, uh, full max, the full value. And I recognize that sometimes that will probably be double price of home. I got all that. But it happens to other people. But, but again, PVSC, I believe, um, has already said that they will only be, that they will be capped at, I believe, 60%. If they were capped at 60% uh, before the fire, they will be capped at 60% after, after the fire. So uh, I, I think that's an important point. Now, now PVSC, um, <laughs> you know, I, I know, I hope they're not listening. They don't know anybody that likes them. They don't suit, they don't satisfy anybody. Truthfully, they don't, you know, and this, this cap is, I've, I've been on all sides of it. You know, they, they can't win. It's like being in the government, isn't it? It's like being in the government has to make hard decisions. They can't win. But, uh, uh, but you know, they are and have been for a long time, uh, arm's length of the government. Uh, they're, they're there to make decisions. Uh, um, uh, and trust me, uh, I've questioned their decisions a lot of times along the way, but that's why they are arms like, so that I can't run to my, uh, to my elected uh, member and say, hey, I think I've been wronged by PVSC, let's do this. Again, I'm not minimizing the tragedy that happened in Shelburne and HRM in particular in the Hams Plains and Timberley area. It was a tremendous tragedy as is every time a house burns. It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy to those that have it. And there, as I understand it, this bill would do nothing for them. This bill is specifically about events that happened, climate events that happened last summer, and they are, again, tragic events. So the PVSC, uh, go back to my notes here, but PVSC will be applying the cap in a manner that protects, that says it, that protects the percentage differential between cap value and the assessed market value, or assessed value, which is what I, I guess I would call, uh, it's supposed to be, I guess. <laughs> That's another debate. 
a lot of times the assessed value is not in, and that's a current assessed value is not is not part of the uh, it's not, it's not what people would consider the real market value of it. That's always been a debate. The market value is what a market value is what a willing buyer and a willing seller will pay for a piece of property. So that's uh, you know that's 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 the different again from the uh, uh, from, from the uh, from the capped or the assessed value. But anyway, uh, but the the PBSC uh has agreed that the ratio of the cap value to the market value before and after the wildfires will be maintained such that no homeowner is negatively impacted from a cap perspective since so since the wildfires broke out in our province last summer the governor of nova scotia has undertaken many initiatives to support homeowners and businesses who suffered a loss because of these emergency emergency events And they listed many of those initiatives earlier on. These programs and supports are intended to assist and minimize, assist. These programs and supports are intended to assist and minimize the financial impacts of the wildfires. In working with our partners, such as Ms. Spellies, which I don't know if they have any say in this or not, I'll, you know, uh, but uh, working with our partners, such as Ms. Spellies and the Red Cross, we are proud of all that we have done to support communities across the province who were impacted by the, by the wildfires. So I, I, if, 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 uh, if HRM wasn't consulted or Shelburne County wasn't uh, consulted, uh, they, they should have been, certainly, because uh, they act, uh, you know, they're the ones that are going to be impacted by, by this. Uh, there's no impact whatsoever to the provincial government. Uh, there, you know, uh, uh, property taxes uh, are all returned to the municipality. So, uh, so property taxes are always returned to the municipality. So they 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 have uh, actually they have they have more uh, I guess you'd say skin in the game here, more uh, incentive to uh, to agree or disagree to this because it will I mean it will make an impact to their to their bottom line. Uh, and uh, they will be the ones uh, that will answer those questions when somebody, uh, I guess, uh, you know, from downtown Halifax or, or, you know, in Dartmouth whose home burns and was worth, you know, 600000 and was a million two or something by the time they got it rebuilt and the assessment went up, they'll have to ask to answer those questions uh, to those residents why... Uh, why do not they not benefit the same as the people that were in these other tragedies? So it, it, does, it doesn't really, it's not, you know, there's, there's not a, I understand the desire to help these folks, but there's always unintended consequences to everything you do. I'm sorry. Madam Speaker, I'm sorry. I've just been kind of thinking and talking and, and I wasn't, I'll, I'll speak to you more, uh, more directly. Um, there we go. Halifax, Reasonable Municipality, HRM Charter empowers HRM to spend money and collect taxes with respect to, with respect to an emergency under the Emergency Management Act. Therefore, if HRM wishes to do so, they may have the authority to provide a grant in lieu. That happens often in, in municipal government, grant in lieu of taxes to, uh, to these property owners. That's really when, uh, when it gets right down to it. Uh, housing and home taxes are a municipal government responsibility. There's no getting away from it. There's no, you know, no change in that. That will be, that's, that's, uh, that's all part of the Municipal Government Act and so, uh, I guess the, you know, to, I, I may be kind of repeating myself here, but, but as a former municipal councillor, uh, I would want to have a lot of time to discuss and uh, really understand, again, the unintended consequences of this, how this would impact the budget of my municipality, and as a result, impact not only um, 
the folks uh, um, that lost their home that wasn't within a natural disaster, but also the increased uh, of the taxation rate of the municipality, because that is their sole source, or not sole source, but major source of income is, 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 is housing. So, uh, you know, I, I just, uh, you know, it's, it's like I say, it's great stuff. Uh, I, you know, I commend the member for wanting to uh, support his residents in any way he can, and again, I understand uh, fully, probably is better than most in here, how a tragedy affects a community. But I also understand that uh, we have to make sure, again, that we understand uh, all the consequences, all the realities, I guess would be a good way of putting it, of uh, all the realities of, uh, of, of changing the law like this and, and all the different people that it impacts, including my good friends at PVSC. So uh, as a government, you know, uh, we've, been, uh, we've been working hard to make sure that people affected by the wildfires are treated fairly. Uh, the Property Valuation Services uh, Corporation, PVSC, has been working on the CAPT assessment program, <laughs> as have municipal governments and previous governments for years to try and deal with this capped assessment. So I guess uh, in a sense, I guess when I think about it, there's other ways to look at this. Uh, maybe I, I think probably a direct uh, a, a, a grant in lieu uh, or, or some kind of, uh, of uh, HRM. HRM is really, and, and Shelburne County are really the people that- Thank you very much, order. I recognize the honorable member for Fairview Clayton Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'm just going to speak for a few moments on this. Um, it's interesting because I feel like I might be one of the only people in the chamber who has experienced um, damage or a total home loss in two different sort of circumstances. So um, the first was due to a natural disaster and the second was due to just a common, a common fire. Not that anything was common about it. Um, and so just kind of wanting to bring the perspective of, of the difference between the two. So um, during Hurricane One, uh, my family home had a flat roof and the winds were quite high. So throughout the night, um, a gust of wind had gotten underneath the shingles and actually blew the entire roof off of the house and into the garden, the backyard of the house. And so it, we realized that it happened in the middle of the night, um, but it was the middle of the night, so there's not much that you can do. So we went to sleep and, and said, well, we'll deal with it the next day. So if anybody remembers the hurricane, um, after the winds had died down, there was significant amount of rainfall. And so again, the relevance of my house being a flat roof is that it rained the entire night and that roof, that water collected into the roof. And I woke up the next morning being rained on. So the water, the the, um, the insulation, the, the drywall had all kind of came down in my bedroom. So it was, uh, it was a traumatic experience. We had pretty much the entire home um, destroyed uh, because of water damage in the end. Um, but the, the trauma wasn't just that. The trauma was uh, everybody else was dealing with the same thing. So this was something that happened to a number of people. There were a lot of things that took place. And so trying to nail down contractors, trying to um, nail down insurance, uh, your insurance brokers, and, and getting the policies done up. And it was... Um, it was not easy, and as time went on, the cost of building went up, right? So as you wait, if you're, as you're trying to replace and you're trying to, so there was a number of months where I actually was living in the house, in the bottom level of the house, even though like the top two floors were, were disaster. And we had um, a weekend away with my girlfriends, and uh, one of them spilt the Brita, like the water, and I went to grab a, a tea towel, to sh and I started to have a panic attack, and I couldn't understand why, and it took me a second. It was because for two weeks, I had been sopping up water from around my house and using tea towels, and, and, and I tell that story because I, it, it it's funny, but also it, it's, it's a true, it's a reality. And, and that process just took forever and forever and forever. And um, it took us significantly longer to, to fix and to rebuild, not because it was 
complicated to do, but because, again, we were a part of a much larger natural disaster that impacted people across this province. So when I look at this particular bill, I understand. I understand what the member from Col Colchester North is saying. I get, I get that completely. Um, this is a, a one-time fix. This is, you know, why doesn't it apply to others? I, I understand that the government has no ability to um, rush insurance companies to, to get adjusters in and to, and to figure out and do I know that they have no ability to get more contractors in to re do rebuilds. Um, but we do have the ability to alleviate just a little bit of the stress. It's a bit of a gesture to say, okay, we know that you have gone through this collective trauma together um, and you have had to face a lot of difficult um, situations. Uh, the loss of pets, I mean, I can't even talk about, I was, I was on the Facebook page during the wildfires this summer and the people matching their families up with the pets who were able to get out and then the lost pets. And I know that I'm very thankful that there was no human life lost, but I, I mean, my pet is my family, so I, I can't imagine something happening to her. But again, there's, it's the collective. It was, it's a lot of people having to go through the whole thing together and not having, um, not having access to the resources that an individual who has a fire or who has damage done to their home for whatever reason outside of a natural disaster has the capacity to do. So I'll, we'll go to the second. So we have a family property in, in Queensland and in the summer of 2002 we had a total loss fire. So this like it, it burned right to the ground and there was nothing and that was like our, where our family had gathered. I've actually talked about that house in the legislature before this is it was my grandfather bought the property back in the 50s and so this actually this house had um, items that belonged to my grandparents items that belonged to my great-grandparents items that belonged to my parents who have since passed things that were irreplaceable that if I just had like five minutes to grab a handful of things I I'd do that and and the sadness of that loss is always going to be with me I, I know that I've resolved myself to that but the process that happened after this significantly more damaging event. So remember, during the hurricane, it was two floors in my house that were, were damaged, water damage. And it was months and months and months of arguing and fighting and trying to get contractors and trying to get the work done, as opposed to a total hot loss where we were done with insurance and everything was wrapped up in a neat bow in a short amount of time. And that's because there wasn't anybody um, competing. It was a, it was a one-time thing. It was, our, it was our host that was impacted by it and nobody else. So when you're talking about trauma, again, I don't think that there's anything in this particular bill that is you know, major policy changing, that it has major financial repercussions. Uh, th this, is, this is an ask to help alleviate some of the trauma and the stress that this group of people are, are feeling. And uh, honestly, I think that there are a number of solutions that, it, that if this bill isn't something that the government or the minister wants to move forward on, which is completely fair, we understand that's, you know, we, we, we do our best effort in opposition to put something forward and hope that maybe it stems some dialogue that if it's not this particular bill, maybe there's something else that can come forward from the government side. Maybe there is some adjustments that can be done. I mean, I, I think that um, even having even having the minister um, agree to speak to PVSC to, to see, you know, what can be done or if, there, if there's anything that can be done, I think that that's a fair, I think that would be a fair compromise. Um, I mean, I think my, my colleague documented or he tabled all of the, he tabled the petitions today, he tabled a number of, of documents today. Um, this is a community that's still grieving. This is a community that is still um, very much uh, almost now a year later uh, in, the, in the throes of this trauma and this loss. And as the MLA for Hammonds Plains Lucasville, my colleague is trying to alleviate some of that loss. And as somebody who has experienced a similar loss, I have to say that 
there's a lot of meaning in that. And it's one of those things where, sure, you can say, oh, we're going to do this, but then we're going to have to do it for everybody else, and we're going to... I actually would argue we should do it for everybody else. I think there should be a one-time exemption for anybody who faces a situation like this because of a natural disaster. I would, if I was the government, I would take this member's private bill and I would expand it and put it across the province so that so many people who have been like we we've we've talked about this in this chamber last fall and and this in this session 2023 was unprecedented in what happened to us in terms of natural um, climate uh, disasters um, and and we still see it we're still not on the other end of it uh, we um, the windstorms I have to say that actually over the Christmas break, there was more powerful winds in my neighborhood <laughs> that weren't even classified as anything than in any of the, the hurricanes that happened in the fall of 2023. Um, we were getting by far 100 plus gusts of wind. So clearly this is something that we're gonna have to address. There's gonna be something that ha has to happen just from a taxation perspective. And I know that that seems silly, like we're like, I do, I do understand, again, like I'm going to say, I understand where the member from Col Colchester North was coming from, but when you are in the depths of something like this, when you are, you know, displaced, you've lost everything, if there's anything that we can do, if there's any little thing that we can do in order to make a difference, I feel that we have an obligation to do so. And, and I'm very proud of my colleague for bringing this forward because he, yeah, I, I have seen from, from the, the time, from when these fires started, I have seen, let's, let's go back. I have seen since 2013, this member give his heart and soul to his community. I have never, there's a, there are maybe a handful of MLAs that I have worked with that I can say, um, we'll f throw it all out for their people. Like he puts it all on the floor. He's, he gives it all like whatever sports metaphor. He like, he leaves it all on the court. He's constantly, constantly, constantly advocating for Hammonds Plains Lucasville, constantly. And this is a regular thing. This is long before any wildfires happened. But in May of last year, when they started, and he saw how his community was struggling. This is a guy who rose to the occasion. And so I have to say that even if this particular piece of legislation isn't something that the government can commit to or want to, I feel that there has to be some sort of more productive dialogue that happens between the minister and the MLA um, even if it's a meeting with PVSC, just to explain, you know, why they, that he thinks that they have the authority to do this. Well, like, let's, let's get to the crux of it. Um, let's take baby steps, all right? This, we don't, we don't, we don't want this, okay, we don't want this, but this should not be the end of the conversation. This, this bill or this situation shouldn't end on the floor of the, like die on the floor of the legislature because we've called it a second reading and now it's not going to go anywhere else. I, I think that one of our responsibilities as MLAs and one and a responsibility that I've always tried to follow is that even when we have differences of opinions or we, or we are divided in policy, it's only just a stepping stone and like a starting off point. And there's more that we can learn and there's more that we can do. And I also quite frankly feel that most of it happens outside of the floor of the legislature in terms of negotiation and talking and, and, and having alliances and having um, collaboration between different parties. And that's okay, that's, that's cool. Um, but I'm just really hopeful that this particular issue doesn't die here on the floor at the end of second reading. I'm really hopeful that the MLA and the minister can find some sort of a solution for these residents, um, some sort of a, a 
more appropriate explanation for these residents, a more, uh, maybe not appropriate, appropriate is not the right word, a more um, considerate rationale for these residents, and maybe even a compromise. Um, yeah, and honestly, I'm gonna say it on the record, if anybody can do it, it's the member for Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Yeah. So, thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Municipal Affairs and Housing. So, uh, Madam Speaker, I do want to speak briefly to the bill. Uh, first of all, uh, as uh, some people have experienced dialing 911 and calling the fire department, I'm one of those people that have experienced that. It was a barn fire. I, I know a barn is not a home. It's vastly different. But I can tell you, I know if I, if I take that and translate to how traumatic that moment was for me. I know how traumatic to, to lose everything in a fire. We recognize that. I know that the people who I've talked to uh, who have lost homes, uh, what, they, what they say they typically miss the most is the loss of all the photographs. Um, that is, uh, you know, uh, so there's a lifetime of memories and photographs gone. I wonder if that will still be true in the future because all our photographs are on our phones now. They're never really lost, but, uh, but, but for many, many people, that, that is what is the, the single biggest loss, and we respect that. In terms of the heart-stopping year we had last summer, we certainly recognize the trauma that that caused people not only in, in HRM but in Shelburne as well. And um, the. Uh, the, the member is putting forward a bill. I will ask the member to remember that uh, last session, and uh, I think it was Bill 329, we did put in an amendment for the member uh, that related to taxation in HRM. You may recall that it related to, to specifically allow HRM to uh, tax uh, businesses differently to change that. So we have been very responsive to the member for uh, for that, I, I will point out the member didn't ask at that moment for any anything in particular around homes, and and to be fair to the member, the reason that he didn't was because actually the, that it already exists uh, that already existed it wasn't required for HRM. So so the first solution for a local solution would be simply to ask the member to speak to the councillor in the area and communicate with the councillor in HRM. This resides. The, the reality is, is PVSC is a provincial, uh, a provincial wide organization uh, really mandated to assess the values of properties across the province. Board of directors uh, made up of municipal councillors, enabled by provincial legislation for sure, but uh, municipally managed, municipally run organization. The manner in which they've how, uh, dealt with these losses uh, is consistent over time. I have, uh, uh, I, I know there are people in this house, actually, in our, among, uh, I know there are individuals who have lost homes in the past who have told me that the way PVC, uh, PVSC dealt with it was exactly how it's being dealt with here. So there's a long-standing history. I don't know how far back it goes, honestly. Uh, of PV, but at least uh, at least five, ten years or more, a PVSC. When a home is destroyed by a fire, the cap is not lost for the home. So, if the home was capped at 75 percent of value, the new value of the home is still the cap is still at 75 percent. So, the, the cap is protected for the home. So, I think the member for uh, Hammonds Plains, Lucasville, understands that. I'm not. I'm not sure the member for Whitney, uh, Cape Breton Center, Whitney Pier, understood that. But if if the member had a constituent who didn't have that experience, then that would be certainly something to appeal to PVSC about, because there's a long-standing history of PVSC handling the losses of these uh, fires in this way, and we respect that. And it is the, what's different is this is a pretty big group now and it's very unfortunate but uh, that that is that is the history of that so the the reality is is that uh, there's only one taxpayer uh, and uh, we are doing things as a government to address taxes we're uh, we're, uh, we're we're dealing with bracket creep as uh, all members know uh, 
that doesn't have an immediate effect because there's a need to give Revenue Canada uh, almost a year's notice. That's the reality. So Bracket Creek will see will see that for all all Nova Scotians who work and earn money, including all members of the legislature, you get your T4 too. Uh, you'll see the effects of Bracket Creek. Every member of the legislature here, everybody working in the province, will see that January 1, 2025 or uh, more specifically, probably January 14th, 2025, when you see your first pay stub for the new fiscal, the new year. That's the reality. So it, it's coming, but it will continue to, I mean, we're concerned about taxes. We're concerned about taxation. There's only one taxpayer. Um, we, we know that uh, there are other, and I mean, this house has been, had, had lots of talk about uh, uh, the taxes that we face on all of the goods and services that we buy. Uh, they're, they're real. One of the things that we've done as a government, following suit with Ottawa, I, I, I can criticize Ottawa on the carbon tax and give Ottawa credit on the, taking the tax off of the uh, uh, multi-unit apartment buildings, which we followed suit on, which was, is a massive tax reduction uh, to help uh, lower the cost of new builds. But, but clearly the carbon tax is another tax, which uh, a consumption tax really that has immense impact on and it, in fact, bears, uh, you might think, well, it's gratuitous me bringing this up, but I'm not, it's not because it, it, it does add to the cost of the builds tremendously uh, in, uh, in, in, in these, for these people who have lost homes. And, and the reality is, Madam Speaker, only a few of them have completed their homes. And in fact, I, I read a member's statement to one of my, for one of my staff who was one of the very first to have rebuilt a home. So we, we know that when a, when a home is burnt down and replaced, and many people have replacement insurance, it, it depends on the insurance product that the homeowner has. There's, so there can be quite vastly different experiences for homeowners. We recognize that. Uh, but uh, many homeowners will have replacement insurance. So if you have a $500,000 house assessed at $500,000 and you have replacement insurance, it burns down because of the cost of construction which is not just carbon tax, it's other things too. It's cost of labour, all of those costs order, right now. Order, please. The time has expired for debate on Bill 450, the Assessment Act. I recognize the Honourable House Leader for the official opposition. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, the next bill uh, that is on the... The agenda for today, I'm going to call uh, Bill 423, the Find It Early Act. Bill number 423, Find It Early Act. I recognize the honourable member for Clayton Park West. Thanks, Mad Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'm, I'm happy to rise and speak uh, in, its, in second reading for a bill that is so um, important to me and to many women here and all over Nova Scotia. Um, I, I just want to summarize. Oh, sorry. I, sorry, I will start again. Uh, I recognize the honorable member for Clayton Park West. Madam Speaker, I move the second reading for Bill 423, Find It Early Act. Sorry. And I'm happy to speak to this and, and just wanted to start by uh, describing what this bill is all about. This bill is about women who are 50% of the population of women in Nova Scotia and across the world have dense breast. And dense breast, I honestly didn't understand what that is until I was diagnosed with cancer. Um, dense breast is, uh, is very difficult for mammogram to identify the tumor from the dense breast tissue. They both show up as white and many mammograms miss the the tumor or miss the cancer and that's exactly what happened to me i had a lump which when you have a lump it's actually lucky because you have something and then you're in the next stage of di being diagnosed with something so i did have my um, the, the, the i went and checked it with a mammogram and ultrasound in february 2022 and everything came out negative and clear as can be, and I went on my way and everything was wonderful. But with it, there was a letter that I, uh, with the letter that came at home, told me about my dense breast. But I honestly didn't understand the risk 
that I was under, uh, uh, and, and that a lot of mammograms would miss uh, the, the, the tumor. And I wish I could go back and, and do something, but what I'm doing here is to bring awareness to other women. Please listen to me, listen to what the risk. Every one of us know a woman who's had breast cancer because of the high number. Okay, 50% of women have this risk. And, and, it was, and I first want to thank, truly, is Jeannie De uh, Dale and uh, Paula, um, and, and Paula uh, Gordon from BC, who really educated me about the high risk of de uh, dense breast and what they've done across Canada to make sure that women receive better screening at an earlier stage so they don't have to go through the hell that I went through. That is mastectomy, uh, lumpectomy, uh, chemotherapy, radiation, all these treatments are very harsh and very difficult and, we, and very expensive, very expensive, and we can avoid it. I wish I had been able to go and get a, a mammogram in February 2022 and find the cancer. It would have been probably in stage one. What a difference that would have been to my life instead of stage two, six months or a year later. That's when I had a second lump. And I am lucky to have had a second lump. And, and that one, it came out with 95% malignancy. That's what my, when my doctor called me and told me in, in March 6, 2023. So it wasn't long, but I actually took my time before I went to see the doctor because it was the same breast. So I'm sure it was negative. It took me three months before I really looked after it and went to check it. And, and that is where a lot of women who don't understand the risk of dense breast and that fact that our mammograms are not accurate enough, 43% of those mammograms miss if, if you have dense C, density C, or density D. So please look at your density, look at your daughter's density, and your, all your loved ones. This is an important thing that I learned the hard way, and I will speak up until my voice is gone to make sure other women understand this. Um, I also want to thank um, Dr. Paula Marcato, and, and who, um, uh, uh, who joined me, and Cheryl Coffin, who joined me at the press conference on March 6, and we explained as much as we can. Um, and there were 75 women that showed up here. Honestly, there was not enough room in the gallery for them to all sit here. I, I was stunned, but that shows how many women are affected by this. That is where how important it is to women, and we have enough women here in the legislature who need to take it seriously and speak up, please. Um, those 75 women have gone through hell and back, a lot of them, and it really um, touches my heart. But also, I wanted to thank the media. Since March 6, I've had the Toronto Star, the Chronicle Herald, the Canadian Press, Global News, Radio Francophonie, News 95.7, Radio Canada, and The Examiner all do articles or talk about this. And they're all saying the same thing. It does not make sense. Why are we waiting until we are at a later stage to find the cancer? They're all stunned. All the media is stunned. And a lot of us didn't know that, just like it was for me. So talk to your daughters and do not accept the mammogram. Mammogram alone is not finding it. And we, I ended up with mastectomy, chemotherapy, and a lot of hardship. And, I'm at six, and that happened to me at 61. I've met so many women in the last year. They're, they're finding me and coming to talk to me and wanting their voice to be heard. I've, I actually spoke to and, and one of the articles that, um, one of the ladies that was here, and I actually didn't even um, realize that she was here, but she wrote an op-ed in, in the Chronicle Herald. And so I picked up the phone and I spoke to her. She's 40 years old.
And she is um, actually, I have it here. I just want to make sure I have her title. Um, she's an associate professor at uh, the school of, uh, uh, school of Law at Dalhousie University. And, and she wrote this thing. And she said, I'm a breast cancer survivor. She's a 40 years old. So it should come at no surprise that I was thrilled to learn of the introduction and the first reading of the proposed Find It Early Act in Province House last week. The act would provide access to additional diagnostic screening for women with dense breasts in Nova Scotia. This kind of supplement Supplemental screening is currently denied to Nova Scotians, despite clear evidence that for many, mammograms alone are not enough to detect cancer before it has grown and spread. I, just think about it, denied. Instead of the province or the doctors are helping us and telling us, go find it early, so you don't have to go through the hell and we, it doesn't have to cost the province so much money. We deny them to look for it. We deny them the opportunity to find it early. It just does not make sense. Nova Scotia, despite, uh, um, it was one of the first provinces where women could self-refer for screening for mammograms at age 40. We're, we're leaders in many aspects. Okay? And we tell women to go and, and, and get a mammogram. But we don't tell them, if you have density C and D, that mammogram is worth zero to you. 40% of the time, that mammogram will give you a false negative, like it did to me. The, the province also provides patients with their breast density after the first mammogram, which is wonderful for this province. In 2019, my colleague, um, the, the Minister of Health, brought it in at that time, and we've been telling women, here, you have higher risk, but you're not allowed to have anything else after this. No MRI, no ultrasound, and no contrast enhanced mammography. These are technologies available at everywhere, at other provinces. And my own sister has the right to have uh, an abbreviated MRI in Ontario. But I, who have the cancer, I can go get an MRI for my healthy breast. Imagine that, guys. Imagine that. Um, oh, five minutes? Not again. <laughs> um, so I just want to emphasize on the high risk of dense breast and how we can be proactive and try and catch it before it becomes um, spread and before we need chemotherapy. The, the, the cost of stage one, sorry, stage four compared to stage one is 11 times it will cost approximately 400,000 to 500,000 to treat a patient with stage four cancer. That's a lot. The machine is, for, mam, for the MRI, is half of that cost. So that machine can detect so many cancers, four times more cancers than a mammogram by itself, four times. That could be hundreds and thousands of women who can be caught early and don't have to go through chemotherapy, mastectomy, uh, lymph, lymphodemia, and the hell. I, I spoke about this bill as well uh, last week uh, in the budget and explained uh, one of the women who sent me about the dignity of going through these harsh treatments, how we lose our dignity with it, how hard these are. And I also want to end it with um, an amazing uh, thing that this young lady who's 40, the, uh, uh, the lawyer from, uh, uh, the lawyer who teaches at Dalhousie, and she said, put it simply, cancer has changed my life, and every day I worry I will have to do it again, because a mammogram alone might fail to detect a, a, a reoccurrence in my dense breast. This is not a political issue. Cancer does not care if you are a liberal, conservative, NDP, rich or poor, 
or even what your gender is, although it's clear who breast cancer affects the most. It's women. This is a question of access to health care and equity for the 43% of people whose cancer's risk going undetected until they have grown, and this has grown and spread. I also would like to highlight why Nova Scotia, or I still don't understand it, but we think that Nova Scotia is basing, or the, the experts in Nova Scotia are basing their denial for extra screening on mortality rate. Just because you're having dense breast, even though we know if you have dense breast, it is harder to detect and you have a higher chance of cancer. That's a known fact and it's been known for a decade. But what they, what she, this, uh, what is Nova Scotia is basing their information on, on mortality rate. So until I die, do you know how many years that could be? And that's what they're trying to wait. So there's no studies have been done with all that information. But who wants to base the hell that we're putting all these women under and as not important, but hey, they didn't die right from the cancer right away. That is wrong. That is unfair. And other provinces have learned that it is wrong to do that to women and they've moved on and they're offering extra screening to uh, in, in, in Ontario, in BC, in Alberta. They're ahead of us. We've been leaders in breast cancer. Let's not stop now. I, uh, I, I beg, I don't know how else I can say it. I want to educate, to spread the word, please. I don't want this to happen to your loved ones. I don't want this to happen to your daughters. And it breaks my heart when I speak to a woman in her 40s who are having to ha go through mastectomy and, and, and lose her, her identity with, with the hair loss or all the horrible things that the so-called treatment. I don't call those treatments. I call them barbaric treatments. So let's catch it early. Please help me. Please educate everyone on this so that we don't have more women going through this. Um, 20 seconds. I plead forever and ever until my voice is gone, and I thank you for this. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member Dartmouth North. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I want to begin by thanking the member for uh, Clayton Park West. I mean, her bravery and her leadership on this uh, issue and the subject is totally inspiring. Uh, and as she is doing, she is doing what we're supposed to do in here. She's bringing something to the floor of this legislature and she is fighting for it. She is, and not just fighting for it emotionally, but with facts <laughs> and with expert opinion and with personal stories. She's a true advocate uh, and I, I'm inspired by her. I am, I am uh, shocked that we're having this conversation, that we need to have this conversation. I, uh, and I'll just add a few more words uh, to this and hope that, you know, maybe we'll see some change in this session. I mean, listen, no one thought we were going to see the income assistance rates index this session, did we? And it happened. Wouldn't it be amazing if we got out of this session with this change because of the work that this member has been doing? It could happen today. So I feel, uh, I feel a little weird about uh, starting with a, a story, but I will say that I... Um, you know, I have been the receiver of that terrible phone call when you go for your test and uh, the doctor calls and says they found something on your mammogram. That has happened to me. I'm sure it's happened to many, many people. 
and the moment that happens your stomach drops out of you like you're like you you pick up the phone you think whatever you know like who is it and, and then all of a sudden your life could be changing in front of you in the moment forever and you and like all of the possibilities are in front of you could be nothing could be could be a, a death sentence and and then there's everything in between so when that happened to me my doctor said yeah they need you to get go in right away <laughs> which is like also super scary right like oh, this must be bad and I went in you know a couple days later and had the ultrasound and they told me then it's good it's fine so I only had that terrible waiting for three or four days but I'll tell you the relief and the and the feeling of being taken care of by the medical system in those few days was like amazing I, I was like, okay, this could be happening to me, but I'm in excellent hands here because A, my doctor called me like literally the day after my mammogram, and then I was getting back in for another one in a couple of days, and we'll just see what happens. But that, just that little mini experience of being like, you know, maybe having bad news uh, felt, yeah, like I was being really well taken care of. And I was so grateful for that. <laughs> and <sighs> compare that to this idea or this truth that women with breast density, C or D, like just don't have that ability to feel that. I'm not like, I, I, I actually don't even know what density I am because I know it's like on a piece of paper downstairs somewhere, but I, I like, I have no idea, frankly, and it's, it's, uh, it's, I really should figure that out. But even if I did know, it doesn't really matter, because in right now, we don't have the ability to do extra screening. So anyway, I'm happy to stand and support this act. But I want to start, I want to, I want to continue by providing a definition of health equity, and the member finished her speech uh, with this, with this, uh, we're talking about health equity. The Canadian government defines it as the absence of unfair systems and policies that cause health inequities. And I'll table that definition. So I want to start there by, because it makes it clear that we actually have an obligation to rectify the unfair breast cancer screening system in our province that's causing extreme health inequalities, Mr. Speaker. Extreme. The, the member from uh, Clayton Park West has given us the statistics. Uh, in 2019, Nova Scotia began to directly inform women of their breast density. Great. That's the first step. Uh, up to 50% of cancers present in the densest breast. That's category C and D. And they may be missed by regular breast screening. And despite the Nova Scotia screening program recognizing the associated risks with category C or D, the program doesn't allow women to access the additional screening they need to protect their health. So that is, if we, if we are supposed to be uh, providing or, or making sure that every person has equitable access to health and health care, then we are denying people with breast density C and D that access. So to achieve health equity in general terms, we have to work to reduce the inequalities and to increase access to, to opportunities and conditions conducive to health for all. In more specific terms, when it comes to breast cancer, it's clear that we need to ensure that women with category C and D breasts, or dense breasts have access to the additional screening they need. It is common sense. It doesn't make sense not to do it, as, as my colleague has said. Nova Scotia is the only province in Canada that does not offer this supplemental screening. The only province in Canada. Yeah. Like, we are leaders as we hear every day, Mr. Speaker, in so many things. How is it possible that in 2024 we, are, we don't have this supplemental screening? Notifying women of their density category and then leaving them without a pathway to additional screening when it's needed is nonsensical. In fact, it's kind of cruel, actually. And the logical thing to do is painfully clear. 
So notification of C or D level density should immediately trigger a pathway to additional screening. This matter is particularly frustrating because of the scale of this problem. It's not a small problem. Breast cancer accounts for 26% of all cancer diagnoses for Nova Scotia women. In 2023, almost 800 Nova Scotian women were diagnosed with breast cancer and approximately 180 women died of it. And it's incredibly disheartening to think how many of those women were denied comprehensive screening at an earlier point in their fight against cancer. We don't know what we don't know. We don't know how many of those people who died uh, might still be alive. And we also, and, and my colleague made such a good point earlier, it's not just about mortality rates. It's about um, the, what's the quality of life. I was going to say the cost of living. <laughs> quality of life. Okay, if, we, if we're going to, if people, uh, you know, uh, well, anyway, I'm not going to repeat something that the expert here has given us the examples, but, you know, increased... Uh, treatments, m m uh, mastectomies instead of lumpectomies, uh, <coughs> hair loss instead of not hair loss, mm -hmm. all of the other health issues that come come with you know the, the chemotherapy with 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 reduced uh, um, um, immune systems and, and all of that. Clearly, I'm uh, I'm suffering from, <laughs> from lack of oxygen to my brain right now. <laughs> so. The earlier breast cancer is detected, the easier it is to treat. 100% of the women diagnosed with stage one breast cancer survive, 100%. And when it isn't diagnosed until stage four, the survival rate drops dramatically to 22%. The bill in front of us today has the ability to save lives by ensuring that women gain access to the supplementary screening without delay. It also will improve lives. This bill would rectify the health inequities that currently exist in our health care system and ensure that we are providing women in this province the same level of care that is being delivered across the country. The current refusal <coughs> to ensure additional screening is available is a blatant refusal to advance health equity in this province and in particular health equity for women or people with breasts. And that is why I am happy to stand and support the bill and again thank my honourable colleague for the work that she is doing and hope that no one else has to go through what she did because they have dense breasts. Thank you. I recognize the honourable member for Hans West. Thank you, Mix, um, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, I'm rising today to speak to Bill 423, uh, Find It Early Act, that was introduced by my honourable colleague across the floor. Um, it's clear, as you say, uh, you know how breast cancer and screenings impact all, all of us. Uh, not just uh, women, uh, but m men as well uh, that have high density breast as well. Um, and we truly appreciate you bringing, uh, the member bringing this to the floor of the legislature to talk about this really important um, and serious um, issue. I, I, I can't imagine personally uh, what you've gone through. And I know at my age of just turning 50, I, I did myself uh, without, uh, I'm not in a high risk category. Uh, my mom and my grandmother, and there's no family history. So, you know, my doctor was of the mindset that age 50 was enough, but you're right. Uh, people around us, you know, are, are finding out that they do. Uh, so I did go a little bit before I was 50, had my, my first exam, and it, and it is terrifying because you don't, you don't know what that call may or may not be, or, or if you'll have to go back in. Um, but I do, I do want to speak to some some other um, other parts of it. Is that um, Nova Scotia does have uh, and have high risk screening programs since March of 
2021. Um, as I mentioned, it's recommended that individuals age 40 and above that um, are available uh, to have uh, screening. And, and on top of that, there is um, high risk screening for those individuals that, that fall in that category uh, offered to ages uh, 30 to 74 that would have extremely high risks of breast cancers due to genetic traits or or previous cancers or, or a high history of chest radiation. Um, and these individuals are, are able to receive that, that screening, that advanced screening. Um, our partners at the IWK have been very committed to, to looking at um, and addressing this newer uh, advanced screening um, high-risk clinic, clinical practice guidelines that they've implemented which include and should be referred to uh, as the more advanced screening. Um, and what, what these guidelines are doing are trying to uh, implement private, private, province-wide implementations of these guidelines. Um, there's also our new clinical practice guidelines on who gets access to MRI for breast screening. There are many mechanisms uh, within the booking system that ensures anyone that does need to be moved up uh, uh for diagnostic imaging to work with an abnormal screen, symptomatic uh, diagnosis, appointment, or the cancer survivor, as I, I mentioned before, Mr. Speaker, um, and also are according to, to triaging, so, so trying to get individuals in for these secondary screenings when it's deemed that it, it is uh, really important to do. Um, upgraded software across the province, uh, improving uh, newer technology so that um, all the images are standard and the accuracy across the province is, is um, more provincially uh, implemented. <clears throat> The minister, um, the minister is committed and has said that uh, she is uh, willing to, when the house rises, um, have a try to uh, have a better understanding between the gap uh, between the advocacy and the advocates and uh, the clinical, uh, the clinic clinical uh, studies that are being done, um, programs that are in place uh, proactively, books, workups, biopsies, ensuring that with unknown or known concerns are not uh, on the general waiting list. They are uh, triaged in a manner that would see that appointments uh, for screening could happen on a more, more urgent basis. Um, we are one of only two provinces in this uh, country, Mr. Speaker, that even offer a high-risk screening program. Um, I think that is something to be proud of and take notice of. Um, our provincial breast imaging program is supported by a central booking system, and it's a provincial standardization that has equitable access to make sure that individuals are, are able to access it through one uh, point of entry uh, across the province so that uh, individuals that are in the uh, central zone aren't getting more appointments because that's where a lot of them happen. And I'm lucky to be able to book either in Halifax or at the Valley Regional, which is where I chose to go. But it's also important to know that there are mobile units that, that come into community where uh, to make sure that um, individuals that require this have access to it. Um, with, again, uh, supplemental screening uh, is something that the minister would have to work in hand with with our clinicians to make sure that, uh, you know, obviously these additional screenings would require more resources, uh, more equipment and staff uh, to make sure they're there, the more training that it would uh, entail, um, quality of oversight, and would need to be offered at various sites throughout the province to maintain uh, Nova Scotia's approach, as I just mentioned, to equitable access to make sure that um, that these uh, these trained professionals are, are spaced diversely across the province. 
Um, there's a U.S. task force that recently updated their guidelines for breast cancer screening and indicated that there is insufficient evidence, Mr. Speaker, to assess the benefits and harms of supplemental screening for breast cancer in women identified to have dense breasts on an otherwise negative screening mammogram. They have also stated that there is need uh, for more research and more uh, advanced evidence and some uh, trials. The Canadian Task Force is doing the same. Uh, they're doing a review for breast cancer screening. Uh, targeted is actually this spring of 2024 when the Canadian Task Force plans to release their guidelines. Um, often the Canadian Task Force reviews similar areas that they see that the U.S. Task Force, uh, being our neighbour, um, engages in, and uh, uh, dense breast screening is actually one of the uh, issues that they're reviewing at the moment, um, as is the Ameri our American counterparts. Uh, given the current situation, the evidence is not there for a population-based secondary <coughs> screening at this time, Mr. Speaker, but we will uh, continue to monitor that evidence as it develops, uh, in particularly in other provinces across uh, Canada, and, and also the information that we receive from uh, both of the task force. Um, our government is committed and willing to continue to work with our clinicians, both at the IWK and the Nova Scotia Health Authority. Uh, and also what's really important and really uh, not to be overlooked is the Nova Scotia Breast Screening Program itself uh, and data driven um, to the advice and recommendations for their new and emerging emerging technologies that are being brought forward. Uh, there are many new options we can look at, and this could include increasing the number of MRIs and or expanding access, introducing ultrasounds or, um, or the like. <clears throat> So when the Canadian uh, Task Force finalizes, uh, it is quite timely in spring of 2024, uh, the minister would be able to take that, uh, those guidelines uh, created by the task force um, and, and have a chance to uh, look them over, see what kind of recommendations, if there are recommendations made from that, that study. Uh, it, it's, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm, it's very difficult to make a clinical change uh, to this magnitude on the floor of the legislature without uh, the basis of, of fact and without clinical consultation with our partners, like I mentioned at the IWK, Nova Scotia Health Authority and uh, the breast screening um, practices in Canada. Uh, I don't want to go too far, but um, de Dense Breast Canada uh, currently ranks, uh, and I think it's important that D Dense Breast Canada currently ranks Nova Scotia as a five out of five, Mr. Speaker, for its screening program that we have. Um, we are the only province in Canada with a five out of five rating. Yeah. Um, Nova Scotia does not, um, I just lost my train of thought. Um, Nova Scotia does not accept requisitions in our central booking for supplemental screening for dense uh, breasts, and we have no private clinics in Nova Scotia that uh, offer this. So I thought it was interesting um, to just look at, uh, at some of the areas that in the province when we talk about doing jur jurisdictional stands and I mean PEI uh, announced that they would do supplemental screening uh, for category D dense density four years ago but it's not actually currently available so um, they do offer the annual screenings uh, New Brunswick uh, you can get the MRI and ultrasound but it's offered only through uh, private clinics uh, and they don't actually even offer annual uh, screenings screening mammograms for category D density. Um, I don't want to, I'm trying to be mindful of my time and I think it's really important. I want to make sure I get this in and I might be able to go back to that. Um, 
our good friends at the CBC did an article on this uh, back in October, uh, October 4th, actually, 2023. Uh, advocates want more cancer screening for those in Nova Scotia with dense breasts. Um, and it talks about, uh, as the member opposite said, um, advocacy for having this, uh, this uh, dense breast screening. Um, but what I did find um, interesting is although the advocates um, suggest that Nova Scotia is lagging behind, uh, Dr. Cyan Eels, uh, a medical advisor to the Nova Scotia breast screening program, said there simply uh, isn't enough evidence yet to support our additional screening. Screening. Uh, Ills went on to say that breast density is a relatively new consideration in person person's overall health. Uh, and I, I can I can table this article for the member opposite. Um, she went on to say uh, she said there is expert opinions, but as of yet. <laughs> There is no organized population-based breast screening program anywhere in the world that rec recommends supplemental screening for people with dense breasts. It could be beneficial, but we need evidence when we're going to talk about population-based publicly funded screening tests, said Ills. We need good peer review evidence and the reviews of the evidence so far have not come out saying you need to provide supplemental ultrasound screening. She also noted that Nova Scotia, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is one of only two provinces that has a high risk screening program. Patients who are over the age of 30 and have a greater than 25% risk of breast cancer can access mammogrammy and MRI screenings. Breast, uh, the article goes on to say breast density is one of the risk factors that incorporate it into the risk estimate. So having breast, br dense breasts, it's very important to know your other risk factors. And if you do meet the 25% risk, then you are eligible for a screening program, said Ills. Dale said that Nova Scotia has been a leader in breast cancer screening, noting people over the age of 40 have been able to self-refer them for mammograms for decades. She says it's, um, I, I, I gotta get back to my other thing. I, I can table this for, um, for, the, for, the, for the hosts and for the member, but um, I just want you to know that uh, the minister is committed um, uh, sorry, Mr. S M Madam Speaker, through you to the member, uh, that the minister is committed to uh, reviewing uh, and collecting the data, um, balancing, looking at uh, what the recommendations might come from the Canadian Task Force, um, and monitor uh, best practices and jurisdictional scans from across the country, and, and, and in fact, in other parts of the world. Uh, she's traveled many times to the UK and abroad uh, and other places to see what best practices practices uh, come into place and some of the, the, the newer changes to health care came from exactly that. Um, so, so by continuing to listen to the advocacy um, and, and having the information uh, come through the task force, I, I believe that um, there is still lots of conversations uh, that can be had. Um, okay. With that, I will take my seat. Well, Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Dartmouth. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'm uh, pleased to get up and fight the fight for the Bill 423, Find It Early Act. I know the member opposite for West Hans began speaking by saying it's clear. Well, that's the problem with dense breasts. They're not clear. Because the fact that they cannot see anything in a regular mammogram because of their density is why tumors cannot be seen through the typical mammogram. And I get up to speak on this because every day of our lives we should be learning something to make things better for others, especially for women's health. Ovarian cancer, well educated on that as after I became an MLA. Endometriosis, 
well educated on that. It's not just a matter of saying this day is going to be for endometriosis. This day is going to be for something else to do with women's health and not actually do something that's fair for all women in Nova Scotia. If there's one thing that really gets my ire, it's unfairness, in case you never notice that. <laughs> it just, just sticks in my craw, like my mom would say. And I know the minister will try her best to sort of address this, but the urgency is what we need to hear. The minister believes in preventive health. We all believe in preventive health. We spoke about health equity. And what that is, it's the absence of unfair systems like the member for Dartmouth North mentioned, where everyone has a fair opportunity to attain their optimal health. <laughs> Women deserve optimal health. You do that by creating funds for research, medical education, clinical care, we all spoke, we heard about it, and education. We feel, as Nova Scotians, we inform ourselves, we get educated, and as women, knowing we have different parts, we have to do that much more work. <laughs> because for some reason, the medical system seems to think, oh, we don't really, and you know what? Talking to people about endometriosis, that was a real shock. To hear that doctors are trained, not necessarily on women's parts. So they don't know how to diagnose different things because they're not trained to do it. Now, that is very unfair. But the one thing that each of us knows is the anxiety around breast cancer, ovarian cancer, every female part that can get a tumor, the silent killer in ovarian cancer, the dense breasts, the fact that they cannot find the tumor to see it in the regular way that we think in Nova Scotia, that we're doing the right thing to keep ourselves alive by going to these facilities, going to the doctors, going to the equipment and say, awesome. But then like my dear colleague who was being, there's no one more educated and more preventative than this person right here. <laughs> <laughs> to the fact that she gives me anxiety. <laughs> so, but I'm not playing lightly on the anxiety piece because at the end of the day, we all went through a pandemic, and every day we hear from people, our family members, our, the residents we, we serve, their health anxiety is off the charts. And if you add something like this to that anxiety that becomes real, what are we doing to resolve that anxiety? They are trying very hard to get out there and do everything they can so that they don't go through the trauma that my colleague went through. But you know, all of us have this kind of female instinct when we hear things and we say, well, that seems like a no-brainer. And that came to me that day of the press conference when Dr. Paolo Marcado of the Canadian Breast Cancer Foundation spoke and she said, Every other province does this. So if the evidence that the member opposite spoke so, you know, eloquently about and, you know, profound, why do all the other provinces recognize dense breasts and actually don't deny the women in those provinces? <laughs> BC, Alberta, Northwest Territories, Ontario, Quebec, PEI, New Brunswick, Saskatchewan, and Newfoundland, Manitoba, Yukon Territories. Nova Scotia is the only jurisdiction that says no supplemental screening allowed by screening program, only province where women, and they use the word denied. Mm -hmm. no. So 
Myself, when I hear the word denied as a woman, I say, how unfair is that? So now I'm right back to being unfair. My colleague used the word nightmare to describe what she's been through. How many of us women in Nova Scotia have woken up in a sweat in the middle of the night because we had a nightmare that we were told that we have breast cancer? How many of us know, because it's identified, that you have dense breasts, so every day you have to live and put that in the back of your mind as something that, well, I don't think it's too, I don't think the, the tumor that's there in my dense breast is cancerous, so I'm not sure if I can get a clear picture of what, every, what that means for me. Every woman around the world worries. We worry about everything. We're mothers, many of us. We worry about our kids. We worry about ourselves. But as I aged, I realized the worries for my children were not because of what I feared would be, life would be for them is what I was more fearful for because I realized the grief that they would have to endure if I wasn't here. And that's what I think every woman in this house needs to understand. We're here once to defend and dismiss why Nova Scotia is the only province in Canada that does not provide this is very concerning to me. Now to emphasize what my colleague, who was just biting it to pieces to speak the second time, <laughs> I will itemize the things that she said and wrote on this piece of paper. Mammogram is not accurate. It gives a false... False negative. <laughs> a false negative as was her case. High risk program does not include density breast category C. They do not have MRIs in mobile units. Insufficient evidence is based on mortality. Well, <laughs> a lot of data should never be formulated <clears throat> on mortality. If you really are about preventative health, it's about living, not dying. And all I want, she said, needs a family doctor. So how can patients without a doctor survive what she has survived? I can't emphasize enough that the great opportunity that each and every one of us have by being in this legislature, we say it's a privilege. It is a privilege, and it's a privilege to speak on women's health because it's long been denied. Again, I use the word denied. So I look forward to maybe before this term is finished that the minister will actually stop denying the women of Nova Scotia and actually address the dense breast and find it early act. It needs to be done. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cumberland North. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, would it be possible to find out how much time is left? Just want to, I want to make sure I share it with. Okay, that's yeah. great. I'll only speak for a few minutes. So, um, I just want to stand, Madam Speaker, in support of this bill, uh, tabled by my friend and my colleague, the member from Clayton Park West. And uh, it's truly an honor to be here in this legislative assembly and to see such a brave, uh, courageous woman. And I wanted to say thank you to her. The legislation that uh, my colleague has put forth in this legislature will literally save women's lives here in this province of Nova Scotia. We know that, uh, Madam Speaker, we know, uh, based on the research and based on the professionals uh, and the information that she has brought forward, that the legislation she has brought forward will save women's lives in the future. I don't know how anyone in this chamber could not vote to support this bill if we're truly doing what's best for Nova Scotians, and in particular, the women and lives in this province. The fact that Nova Scotia is the only province that this is not available is uh, quite embarrassing and shameful, to be quite honest. If this province wants to be transformative and transform health care, prevention and early diagnosis of, of any uh, disease entity, when it's possible, we must take that. Uh, we must take that action. And uh, so in my opinion, the only responsible thing to do is to pass this bill that the member from Clayton Park West has brought forward. I want to acknowledge the great leadership of uh, one of my former colleagues uh, from Eastern Passage, now Minister of Seniors and Long-Term Care, and I know that she led change back in 2019 that, that contributed to positive change around the work around dense breasts uh, back in 2019. And I, I implore uh, her today to take leadership within her own caucus to help get this bill passed here in this legislature today. As women, we have to stand up for one another. We have to stand up for one another. And uh, honestly, in the last half an hour, listening to uh, some of the things that were shared, I have to say, the member sitting in front of me that tabled this bill is probably one of the most courageous and bravest women that I have met. The fact that she stayed in this chamber while her experience was disregarded and dismissed. <laughs> it was unbelievable. It was hard listening for her. And I'm just so proud of her that she stayed and sat in here and did that. This is absolutely a gender equity issue. Absolutely. And gender, equ gender equity in healthcare refers to unfair, unnecessary, and, and preventable inequalities that exist between men and women in the state of health and the state of healthcare. This is an absolute perfect example of the lack of, or of gender inequity here in the province of Nova Scotia. We have before us a bill that will save lives of women in this province, and to not pass it is being irresponsible. Last week on Friday, I attended an incredible women's event here, and it was led by one of our, ex uh, an executive business coach named Harriet Schumacher. She's a real business leader here in the province of Nova Scotia, and she does work uh, globally uh, with many uh, high, profi high profile businesses. And she gave a speech, and she talked about the need for more work to be done here in the province of Nova Scotia, empowering the women of this province. She shared with me her disappointment with the lack of work that's being done um, here to support and promote women's issues here in the province of Nova Scotia. And she encouraged many women that were there at the event to come and speak with me about what they can do to be more proactive and to get more politically active here in this province to try and promote positive change, in particular for the women of this province. And I look forward to many of those women um, doing more work with many of us here in this legislature, hopefully um, maybe even in the next election. But Madam Speaker, I do want to uh, just emphasize uh, my support for this bill. And I, again, want to say how proud I am of the member from Clayton Park, Park West. This is uh, a very truly personal bill because she has uh, just recently gone through this very, uh, very personal experience, and she's brave enough to share, share with us here in this house what she's gone through in hopes 
that she can change the lives of, of other women and prevent them from having to go through the pain and the suffering that she has gone through. And one of the phrases that I've seen, and I'll often use it in, in challenges in life, is turning pain into power. And that is exactly what this woman is doing right here in this legislature. We have the ability to support her. And uh, Madam Speaker, I ask that all members of this legislation do the right thing and pass this bill. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel Sable Island. Thank you very much. Um, and I just wanted to pop up for a few minutes um, and express my strong support uh, for this bill and for the work of the member from Clayton Park West. Um, you know, uh, across the way, the member from Hans West referred to having no public population health argument towards no. better screening, which uh, I found fascinating um, and wrong, actually. Um, so public, a population health approach invests research and actions that address factors that are known to have the greatest impact on health status, such as social, economic, and environmental factors. And on one hand, we're quite aware that the impact on gender, on uh, health and social and economic outcomes is, is, has been uh, negative and has been difficult to overcome. So we really have, so we know this, right? So we know that gender uh, is a huge factor in public, po population health. Um, we also know that in Nova Scotia, we have some of the highest rates of cancer in the country, yeah. and we have some of the lowest rates of survival. Yes. That's another fact about the, pop the health of our population. The other thing that's interesting is that, in fact, <laughs> dense breasts as an issue is really new. I certainly didn't know about it until the last few years. And so the question isn't, have we done enough so far and we'll see how it goes. Um, the question is, like, how are we going to use the information that we now have yes. um, that, we, that we can actually screen for? Like the, it's not even that we have a problem for which there is no uh, way that government can act. We have a problem which affects approximately on average 43% of women and I can tell you that if there was an issue, if there was a health issue that affected 43% of men, well we would have found out about it a long time ago and we would have dealt with it a long time ago. It would actually be a public health emergency. So 43% 43, 43 of women and I'll also read some of the other stats is that actually um, and I uh, I need to delve a little deeper at least to fully understand them, but you know, 50% of women in their 40s have um, dense breasts, and 40% of women in their 50s have dense breasts, and 25% of women in their 50s, older than 60, have dense breasts. Why did that number decrease? Why did that number decrease? Because people die from breast cancer. That's why that number decreased. So, um, so we really have to think about the investment that's a minimal investment of. Uh, my, my apologies to the to member from Clayton Park West, but this is, we, we, we know what we could do. It's not even a huge investment. And, you know, every time, you know, this government is like, we're going to go faster, we're going to go harder, we're going to do better on health care. But anytime it's actually like a little bit about equity or uh, like gender affirming care or about this issue, which is clearly a gender issue, um, this government actually was like, well, we better stand back slowly and evaluate how, how it's going before we make any decisions. You know, I think the other thing that uh, the member from Hans West uh, perhaps skipped over, so because this is a new issue, so in 2016, in fact, no province was screening for dense breasts. No province was notifying folks about women about their dense breasts. And we've actually made remarkable progress. So you can go on the Dense, uh, Dense Breast Canada website and see an, um, a map of Canada that shows, in fact, that we are advancing on uh, the issue of screening for, for dense breasts. And no, Nova Scotia is not doing the best. We're not actually in the top. So um, the top provinces are not us. Just give me a second. Just one more second. <laughs> um, uh, anyways, I mean, I think we're, you know, we still have a lot to learn. There are other jurisdictions doing a better job. This is an issue that affects, like, potentially half of women in, in the 40s to 50s. Order, order, please. The time has expired with regards to Bill 423, Find It Early Act. I recognize the House Leader for the official opposition. Um, thank you. I think, Madam Speaker, I just, I just want to thank everybody who was part of that debate. Um, it was wonderful. Uh, 
uh, I'm really blessed. I've been here for nine years to have some really strong women in my caucus uh, that have taught me a lot, uh, as well as as well as my colleagues from all sides of the floor. So, uh, the next bill we're going to call uh, now is Bill uh, 405, the HST Reduction Act. Bill number 405, HT Reduction Act. I will begin to recognize the honourable member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and I'm pleased to, to get up today to speak about uh, Bill 405, the HST Reduction Act. Our caucus believes, um, Madam Speaker, that we need to do a better job of helping all Nova Scotians across all walks of life, across all ages, across all income levels. And a reduction of the HST by 2% would do that. It would provide uh, a stimulus to the economy. It would allow people to have a little bit of breathing room when it comes to paying for groceries, paying for heat, paying for the expenses of day-to-day -day life. It would mean more money in their pocket. And, Madam Speaker, it would be a great, a great compliment to the income tax bracket creep um, act that this government has put forward. We need to do we need to do a better job, um, Madam Speaker. And you know we've heard the uh, the government side talk about the fact that. Where would we find the, the, uh, the money to do this? Where would we find um, you know, the, the half a billion dollars to, uh, to, to make something like this happen? Well, Madam Speaker, what I've witnessed over the last, or Mr. Speaker, sorry, we had a switch up. <laughs> um, what I've witnessed over the last uh, two and a half to three years from this government is that there's money for everything. If there's a fire, let's throw money on it. If there's, uh, you know, if there's another situation, let's throw money at it. Let's throw money at it. Let's throw money at it. Let's hope that something sticks. So something as important as putting money in the hands of Nova Scotians during an unprecedented time of. Uh, affordability crisis in our province would be a very welcome addition to, to, uh, to, the, to the people of Nova Scotia. When our, our party uh, introduced um, this idea back in February, my email lit up, my text lit up, the office phone lit up. When is this happening? When is this happening? This is a great idea for Nova Scotians. And uh, Mr. Speaker, I had to tell them, look, you know what, it's a great idea. It's in the next election, it's gonna be in our platform, but we could do it so much sooner than then if this government would actually take, you know, they've taken all kinds of ideas from, from other areas and we're, we're pleased about that. We're pleased and we've got lots of more, lots more ideas to, to put forward. But a reduction, I know personally, a reduction in HST for my household would mean a significant improvement in the way that we're able to function. So Mr. Speaker, can you imagine um, families with, 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 with children? that are still living at home, activities. If you look at the, the amount spent by the average household family and figure out how much tax they're spending per year, a two, two percentage point reduction in that tax would be a significant amount of money. We talk about the biggest tax cut in the history of the province with the income tax bracket creep. That's not a tax cut. This would be a tax cut. And this would, 
you know what? We, we, we'd be happy to pose in the picture with the Premier saying, hey, look at this. This is a great, uh, another, idea. Uh, another idea for, uh, for, for, the top, for the front of a budget. But we would be happy to do that because it's good from Nova Scotians. And we've talked about things in this budget that, uh, that are good for Nova Scotians. Indexing tax brackets, great for Nova Scotians. It's great that we finally joined the rest of Canada and stopped charging. Um, so the, the difference on that one, I just want to reiterate, it's we're not actually cutting taxes, we're just helping people avoid paying more. So it's not technically a tax cut, it's a tax avoidance, I guess. I'm sure CRA doesn't like those terms, um, but that's what it is. It, it, avoids, it avoids paying tax at a higher level um, than we're doing. So it, it's a great thing, don't get me wrong. Another great thing, continuous glucose monitoring. I have no idea where that idea came from, but that was a great idea to, um, to, to put forward because that's helping a lot of Nova Scotians. So there, there, some of these things that, that are in this budget are great. And, and hopefully we're saving that HST cut for, for the next budget because I think, um, you know, Nova Scotians could really benefit from that, but they could benefit from it now. It's not too late, we're still in the session. We would happily uh, welcome another bill put forward by, um, you know, the government that would uh, be a reduction in HST. And I know Nova Scotians would appreciate that, uh, Mr. Speaker. The announcement we saw today indexing uh, income assistance to inflation, another thing that we've been advocating for uh, since the, since uh, we were elected in 2021, it's great for Nova Scotians. So we're we're doing things for most vulnerable, which is great. We got senior care grant, which I want to talk two seconds about. Even though I'm on HST, I want to talk about that senior care grant because we didn't index we didn't index the um, income levels for the senior care grant, which means many, many seniors no longer qualify for it, Madam Speaker. So a way we can help alleviate that and put more money in their pocket is give them a reduction of HST by 2%. <laughs> so we're gonna help the most vulnerable by doing that, seniors who are trying to make ends meet in their homes. We're gonna help young families who are just getting started in life, trying to put roots down and build homes, buy homes, go to work, put their kids in activities, more money to help spurn on the economy to grow even further. But we're also gonna help the working families, families that are working their tails off to make ends meet. You got two uh, people in a family, working, they don't qualify for all of these uh, incentives that are put out, they may not qualify for the HARP rebate, they may not qualify for uh, the home repair rebate, they may not qualify for any of these rebates. But what would be good for them, Madam Speaker, would be a reduction in the HST by 2%. It helps everyone. It helps everyone, Madam Speaker. And look, we know that there are people that are trying to stretch things, stretch, and this would give them that little wiggle room. The money is gonna go back in the economy. And I would almost argue that the government may not even see a reduction in the HST revenue that they would get from HST because this money is gonna be respent. It's gonna be respent and there's gonna be a lower tax granted on a bigger number, which at the end of the day, might even be more money in the uh, revenues of the government. But at the same time, it's, it's, it's there. It would show the people of Nova Scotia that the government understands the plight that they're under trying to make ends meet. It would help Nova Scotians to uh, move forward with maybe they've been putting off that purchase. 
Maybe their car is in desperate need of being replaced, and that little incentive, uh, a 2%, would help them get over the threshold. It's going to help businesses in our community. There are many businesses, and we heard it today, 2%, uh, 2 out of 10, 20%, <laughs> my math's not good tonight, um, 2 out of 10 small businesses don't feel confident that this government knows what they need or knows that they support them. What a way to, to show um, businesses that you support them by a cut to the HST. It'll improve um, their bottom line. It'll improve their ability for greater sales. So um, I hope... Uh, I hope uh, the government is, is, is actually listening to some of the uh, folks that I'm sure they're getting the same calls I'm getting from their offices. You think about um, you know, what we've seen in, in the rise in building costs over the last number of years. Uh, reduction in HST on building costs will help people to, to do those necessary repairs to their homes, to, uh, to build some of those uh, multi-generational suites that we've been uh, looking for. They can combine an HST cut with some of those other grants that are available. It'll help uh, landlords reduce their costs and maybe not increase the rent as much and provide more affordable housing for people. It will help, it will help renters, it will help homeowners, it literally will help all Nova Scotians, and that's what a good policy will do. A good policy can be spread out over the entire population. There's no, uh, there's no segregating populations by um, uh, monetary ways. It's going to help the most vulnerable, and it, it, yes, it will help those that are doing well in our economy, but they're going to be there to spend more money. So, Madam Speaker, at the end of the day, um, I don't see any downside to a reduction uh, in HST by two percentage points. We'll hear this government say they don't have the funds to do it. We know differently. They had a $1.4 billion increase in revenue this year. They're going to have a, a significant increase next year. They, we've seen them project deficits over the last three years that, that mysteriously turn into surpluses. So we suspect that uh, the same thing will probably happen with this year's budget. So I guess with those words, I, I, I'm going to sit in a second, but I, I would like to really ask um, the finance minister to, to take a good hard look at the ability to give Nova Scotians the break that they truly deserve and give it to them soon. Because, Madam Speaker, Nova Scotians deserve it, Nova Scotians need it, Nova Scotians want it, and let's, uh, let's, let's help them out. Let's get them through this affordability crisis. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We welcome the opportunity to talk about the cost of living challenges that Nova Scotians across the province are facing and the ways that this government could but isn't helping. Costs of all essentials have been rapidly rising, everywhere from power and food to fuel and housing. Everyone is feeling the pinch. The cost of groceries increased over 6% last year and 13% the year before. Last year's Food Bank Canada report card noted that 53% of people in Nova Scotia feel that they are worse off than they were a year ago. This is a higher proportion than any other province. Power rates have increased 13.6% in two years, and families are struggling to make ends meet. We agree that people need a break. That's why we've been putting forward ideas for, for years now to help average Nova Scotian families facing rising housing costs, food costs, energy costs, and with wages that aren't just keeping up. Ideas like removing unnecessary vehicle fees, the renewal sticker for instance, or rent control and other rental protections, stop seniors evictions, stop fixed term lease abuse. We also suggested pay Nova Scotians a living wage, free birth control, menstrual products, lower, low the income power rates, 
low income priorities, excuse me, ban power disconnections, expanded home warming program, heat pumps, as we all discussed before, farmer care co-payments, universal school food program, which means free for all, not for some, seniors income benefit, paid sick days, stop tip theft and wage theft, increase and index HARP, we want to make life more affordable for people. We want to keep people in their homes. We want to support them being healthy. We want to support them in their work, work safety at work and as well so that they can be healthy at work. We know that the Liberals let all these things stand while they were in power. We do think that discussions about affordability need to talk about taxes. We need to have these discussions. We need to make sure that this system is fair and works for Nova Scotians. That's why we've been talking for a while now about cutting the HST entirely off all grocery products. That's why the Nova Scotia NDP government removed all provincial tax off of family essentials, including children's clothing, footwear, and diapers. And all provincial tax off power bills and home heating. This is all because we believe that Nova Scotians trying to afford the essentials need a break from increasing costs. It wasn't that long ago that Stephen McNeil voted against taking the HST off power bills and home heating. In fact, the Liberals voted eight times to tax home heating and energy. I think many Nova Scotians like us are skeptical of these big promises Liberals make in opposition. And the Liberals have been promising a gas tax since 2009 and even asked about it again today. Despite eight years in government, the member from Yarmouth was in cabinet, this never happened. So why would Nova Scotians believe him on this. We are also skeptical about the math the Liberals are using here, estimating people will save 650 per year. A base, it is based upon a false presumption that we all spend equally, which is untrue. Those with more disposable income will spend more and will therefore benefit more than others from an HST cut. A cut to the HST will give more money to people buying luxury goods than the families who deserve the break. We heard some of this pushback after this was announced last month. Lori Turnbull, the director of the School of Public Administration and associate professor of political science at Dalhousie said, this plan is unlikely to have a major impact on the affordability crisis in the province and that it could be seen as missing the mark. To give something to people who largely don't really need it and put the province at risk of not being able to provide the same level of service. And I will table that in a minute. We heard last month from the Liberal leader that people need to eat. People need clothes. People need phones. People need internet. We agree. Absolutely. We propose no groceries should be taxed. Children's clothes already don't have the provincial tax on them at all. We could be looking into removing the provincial tax from other essential services and products the way the Nova Scotia NDP did on power bills, which would keep, which would help more people more directly. I also want to highlight the reality that sales tax is a massive revenue generator for our province, last year bringing in $2.3 billion in revenue. Revenue losses at this scale are undeniably going to mean cuts somewhere else. I'm curious where the Liberals are proposing these cuts to take place. Do they want to cut spending on health care, housing? We need a little bit more information. Because how would this revenue loss impact our ability to create a universal school food program? And I know we both agree that a universal school food program needs to be free. Our ability to hire more family doctors, maybe, or build enough affordable housing. We're looking to the Liberals to explain this, and that's what I just stated. What we're hoping to accomplish here needs to be discussed. Our caucus is in favor of increasing affordability for Nova Scotians, but we recognize that not all Nova Scotians are in similar positions. The measures the Liberals are proposing would disproportionately benefit those with higher incomes and disproportionately disadvantage those in the middle class and those with lower incomes. And I also want to state, even though I was having, I was having this, um, this message put forward, because there are a ton of ideas on, on, on this side of the, of, of the aisle. I will say this, you know, we have a government that has an opportunity to do a lot of things, and yet they choose to do minimal. So this is why the bill, the, the, the bill that's being put forward is being put forward as a measure. But we all have ideas and recommendations in order for measures to be kept so that all Nova Scotians are treated fairly, all Nova Scotians deserve a break, and all Nova Scotians can actually feel good in their homes, 
also have universal school food and have all the things that they need so they don't have to struggle and worry about what's going to happen tomorrow. Thank you. I recognize the honourable member for Hans East. Thank you, Madam Chair. Or Madam Speaker, I should say. So on the face of it, this sounds like a good plan. Although I do want to comment a couple things that my member opposite said in his opening remarks. <clears throat> I, I just have a huge exception to the point of the massive fires we had, the people that lost their homes. His view is we had a massive fire and we threw money at it. I take offense to that. Those are people that didn't have it. So um, I just can't believe that that's what was said. Um, for me, let's order, look at it. it order. Oh. I recognize the honourable member for Northside Westmount. I don't know if this is a po point of order, Madam Speaker. No, I, did, no. I didn't say anything about what I said was we're... Order. Okay, order. point of privilege or something. He's order, taken... order. Uh, <laughs> Order. If you want to stand on a point of order or privilege, I will recognize you at the end of this debate. I recognize the honorable member for Hans East. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So let's look at it. 2% decrease in HST. This would mean half a billion dollars of revenue the government would not have. The opposition speaks about the budget shows a deficit. This would add another half a billion to it. This is based on the 2023-2024 forecast. Or would the opposition prefer we cut services? So I should explain how change in HST would work. The HST is a coordinated tax agency with the federal government whereby the CRA determines the tax base. It's called the Comprehensive Integrated Tax Coordination Agreement. Let's talk about how the process changes. it. There are specific dates and time frames that have to be done with the federal government to make changes. 120 days prior notice without an amendment with the first date being January, April or July, and if mutually agreed, October. After the province has actually given notice to the federal government, an amendment notice the province is required to make public announcement in respect of the province's proposed amendment at least 60 days prior to the effective date of the proposed amendment, following by tabling of legislation. Now, the last time the HSC was changed was in July 1st of 2010, where it went from 8 to 10 percent. <laughs> Due to this, the Affordably Living Tax Credit was also announced at the same time in 2010 to counter the HST increase. This cost the province $61 million in it, approximately in 23-24 is the opposition suggesting we remove it. The province also administers HST rebates for the province portion of the HST. <coughs> Your energy rebate, the first time home buyers rebate, and rebates for personal items, children's clothing and printed books. Are the opposition considering that we should stop doing that? The province recently announced it will provide a rebate for the provincial portion of the HST for the purpose-built rental housing effective September 14, 2024, with the same eligibility criteria as the federal measure. Are the opposition suggesting we, we don't do that? Um, I'll also table a document here that shows that in 2013, the Liberal Party platform actually said, we will not harm education and safety of our children to meet misguided political promises. For years, there have been cuts to services, so I'm guessing that's the next stage. So, should we stop with the Seniors Care Grant, which is about $30 million a year? Should we stop building new schools? A school costs between 20 and $40 million. Maybe the member doesn't have gravel roads, but in rural Nova Scotia, we've got a lot of them. The province owns 23,000 kilometers of roads, 4,100 bridges. So maybe the member feels we should stop or underfund these programs like have been done in the past. I know in my area, gravel roads 
or gravelous roads are common. I've been on some of them, so I'm wondering if I should tell the residents on Atwood, Walker Road, Salma Road, Maloney Road, Moose Brook, Malcolm Lucas, McGrath Lake, North Salem, Lake Crest, McIntosh, Old Renfrew Road, Owen Davis, Rhines Road, just to name a few that we're not going to be able to uh, put any gravel onto it. Lost my page. Huh. Some of these roads need to have some major work to get the gravel back due to years of lack of government support to the hard-working members of the public works. More have just been kicked down the road until this government was elected in August of 2021. The gravel program was $11 million. We then doubled to 21, or sorry, 22. The last two years, it was $36 million. The bridge program was $30 million. It's now 60. I've reviewed some of the recent tenders to see what is it that's costing to maintain our roads. Repaving of some roads, it's about $330,000 per kilometer. Should we stop repaving roads? Um, gravel roads, it's about 216,000 kilometer per kilometer. We've already had years of them not being done. We're not going to stop that. Or maybe the member thinks we should, not, we should not replace some of the valuable equipment that we need for public works. This government will be investing in public works, health care, education, mental health, and we will continue to. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize, are there any further speakers? recognize the Honourable Member for Shelburne. Oh, you see what? Yeah. Yeah. Order. I recognize the Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We're very organized this evening on who's speaking to bills. Um, pleased to speak to the uh, HSD Reduction Act and really um, supportive of the initiative to try to reduce the tax burden uh, in Nova Scotia, especially since we're seeing uh, record spending over the last uh, number of years, three budgets in a row now with every, virtually every department of government now overspending their uh, predefined budget with really a careless view of the budgeting process altogether. Uh, we know after this budget passes that at some point in time in the year, especially in March Madness, that this government will be spending not in the order of magnitude of tens of millions, but hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, and I would actually uh, expect probably some kind of uh, spending in the order of magnitude of a billion dollars, which is thrown around here like never before. Um, the amount of spending should be considered and tax relief should be considered before that kind of spending is uh, proposed. And so uh, the reduction in HST is just one part of the tax uh, envelope that we can look at. Um, the previous government reduced income taxes for those that made less than $79,000 a year after we found a way to uh, claw our way back to a balanced fiscal responsibility after years of uh, overspending uh, that we're seeing now and eventually a Liberal government will have to come back in and make tough decisions again uh, so that we can come to a, a fiscal framework to be able to responsibly reduce taxes. So not only did we reduce income taxes, we reduced small business taxes and we reduced uh, corporate taxes to try to make us a little bit more competitive. 
we actually introduced the cap and trade system that would have reduced the impact to gas uh, tax across the province. So the, there's a number of areas where we look at taxation and trying to find the best way uh, to relieve uh, Nova Scotians and, their, and what they pay in taxes. And so the next logical step after looking at all the other ones that the last government uh, cut is the consumption tax. Uh, we, we have an opportunity if this government really believes that we are the leaders in Atlantic Canada and we can be the leaders in, in economic growth, why don't we have the lowest consumption tax in Atlantic Canada? We only need to cut the tax by 1% to be able to, to have that claim. We're proposing cutting it by 2%. We know that that will stimulate more consumer spending, which goes into the economy. We know that helps the economy. We know it helps average, everyday working families and the middle class if we reduce consumer spending on liter almost literally everything you spend money on, including gas. I know my colleague talked about how HST is removed from power. At one point in time, maybe the Liberal Party didn't support that, but we were in government for eight years and left that relief in place so that people had, had that opportunity to continue to spend on their fuel and on their oil and on power bills and not pay HST. So obviously our position has been consistent since I've been in this house that HST wouldn't be charged on power bills. If the party opposite was in power, they opposed the cap and trade system in 2017, which would have put taxes up on power bills, on oil for home heat, on consumption tax. And that's why it's really important when we look at trying to be a competitive place in the Federation that we look at our overall tax. And the only tax relief we're seeing in the budget so far is not a tax cut, in fact, it's just preventing a future tax increase by indexing. And my colleague from King South has given the numbers on just how cheap that is. We're, we're talking about a tax relief in this bill of hundreds, I think $600 million of, t of tax revenue that the government will no longer collect but will go directly into Nova Scotians' pockets over a number of years. So that's why this HST relief program, um, I think, is the next logical step. Probably would have been, if we were still in government, an area that we would look at given that we already cut income tax for middle and low-income families. We already cut small business tax. We cut corporate tax. We found a solution to keep consumption tax on carbon minimal and this last part of consumption tax, the HST, would have been an area that we would have looked to given that so many provinces that we're competing with for the top talented people across the country, no matter what they're educated in, whether it's people working in um, areas that attract venture capital, whether it's doctors and lawyers, professional people, people that we want here to grow the economy do look at a competitive tax base. When we have now one in four people in our province working for government more than any other place in Canada, when we have the biggest government in Canada now with 63% of our GDP, we need to find a way to make our government smaller, more effective. So I think what this party, our centre party clearly stands for is not big government like the party opposite, trying to spend our way through every problem, trying to find new issues even after they table the budget to spend money on, <coughs> trying to bring new bills to the floor of the legislature when we're actually having already passed the budget, that we actually look at reducing the impact on people and the taxation that they're facing. But instead, the government decides to run increasing, increasing deficits year over year that has I would say now I hadn't seen since the 1980s, but it's even more than that. They believe in deficit spending when we're not in a recession against what all leading economists have said is not sustainable. They believe in running a deficit no matter what the economic outlook is. Population growing, GDP, unemployment, all positive. So what happens with the next pandemic? What happens with another emergency when we have no reserves? when our debt to GDP is skyrocketing, when we're throwing out the Ivany report and trying to be fiscal responsible. Now they won their last election based on 
people wanting more spending in health care. Fair enough. Does that justify overspending in every single department other than finance? Does that justify ignoring the whole budget process and making a mockery of every spring session when we come into this house? So why don't we look at reducing the burden, taking the checkbook away from the progressive conservative party that wants to continue to sign checks and put out news releases <coughs> virtually every single day without scrutiny. The spendthriftness of this government is out of control. That's according to the Auditor General. They're not even following their own processes. They're not only, not only following the Finance Act, and it needs to stop. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Order. We have now reached the moment of interruption. The notice of the topic for adjournment debate was submitted by the member for Timberley Prospect and reads as follows. Whereas the Prime Minister wrote to seven premiers, including the Premier of Nova Scotia, to come up with a credible alternative to the federal carbon levy yesterday. And whereas Quebec, British Columbia, and the Northwest Territory all have their own systems and are not subject to the federal carbon levy. And whereas Nova Scotia had a credible alternative that was more cost effective for Nova Scotians under the previous government, while raising millions to fight climate change, but this government has not negotiated new caps with the federal government, causing Nova Scotians to have to pay for the highest increase to gas in the country. Therefore, be it resolved that the government of Nova Scotia submit a credible alternative under the pan-Canadian framework to the federal government that recognizes the work Nova Scotians have done over the successive governments. So Nova Scotians do not face another spike at the gas pump on April 1st. I recognize the honorable member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, so I... I submitted this issue tonight because uh, there's a brand new opportunity for the government to get back to work and get back to the negotiating table uh, and negotiate with our leveraging position that they threw out the last time they had an opportunity in 2022. I want to go back to August when the government came up with a plan within weeks, I understand, on the 19th when Nova Scotia pitches something better than a carbon tax to Ottawa. That was reported in CBC. Um, which was a PowerPoint presentation that went through targets, and I'll table that. And I said at the time that I wouldn't dignify it as a plan. I said they've effectively announced the carbon taxes coming to Nova Scotia. And I believe every member on that house that was paying attention knew what they were doing by proposing something that wasn't aligned with the pan-Canadian framework um, that was agreed upon by jurisdictions across Canada in 2016. Put it simply, carbon levy or cap and trade. Instead, they tried to put together a PowerPoint presentation with a whole bunch of targets, some of them updated, but really the only target that was relevant to the discussion was carbon reduction, so the GHG reduction target of 53% by 2030 below 2005 levels. That target was established in 2019 by former Environment Minister Gordon Wilson that all parties supported. That is the best target in the country, and it continues to be. The government came in in 2021 and put it in a new piece of legislation with a whole bunch of other goals that we were going to update in regulations as part of Gordon Wilson's bill that was passed in the House in 2019. There wasn't anything new other than an aspiration to build a whole bunch of offshore wind and eventually export hydrogen all over the world. This government staged a public relations stunt and knew that it was a poison pill for the federal government to accept. Now, I respect many of the members opposite and that they are opposed to a carbon tax. That's besides the point of the importance of working within a federation to try to find the best solution for our constituents that minimizes the cost, the sticker shock, and still continues to fight climate change with a price on pollution. And I'll say it here, I believe in putting a price on pollution. It is the cheapest way and the only credible way to fight climate change, the defining issue of our time. And it requires collaboration. 
Hard things are hard. I heard about this. So it's hard to figure out the solution. Well, when it comes to climate change and figuring out how it aligns with affordability, it does take work and sometimes saying no, which we did in 20, and then it actually forced a negotiation when we said a carbon tax wasn't coming to Nova Scotia. Okay, what's the alternative? What else is in the plan? Well, we can look at a cap and trade system. Quebec and Ontario at the time both had one. We're talking about virtually half, over half of the population in Canada, and they link to California, the largest economy in North America. What do they know that we don't? How come they understand that they can find the lowest cost carbon reduction? What does the whole European Union know that we don't know? The largest trading system in the world, finding the lowest cost reductions to fight climate change that virtually the whole continent. So collaboration, I would put before confrontation. When I asked if the minister would work with his Atlantic colleagues to find a way to put forward a cap and trade system within our own region, or with the 10 North northeastern states that have a cap and trade system. He said, no, in 2022, we got together and we confronted the federal government. We puffed off our chest and said, no carbon tax is coming to Canada, to Nova Scotia or to Atlantic Canada. And where did that get us? That got us the largest increase at the pumps in the country, juxtaposed with the collaboration that had to take place in the hard discussions around where will we set caps. Where were the set caps set to make it one cent a litre? I'll tell you. They were set recognizing our hard caps we already had in regulations here, and that's why we had high power rates. We we're one of the only jurisdictions that had hard caps, the renewable energy standards, that actually in, that made our power rates more expensive at the time. That's why our, ca our caps weren't set as low as in Quebec and Ontario, so it had a less of a carbon price. The carbon price when we left government was $50 a ton, corresponding with one cent a litre. Now the carbon price is moving up to $80 a ton. You can't tell me that it's justified to have a 17 cent price increase at the pump when it went from one cent, $50, to 17 cents at $80. Whose math is that? Progressive conservative math led us to where we are. And this concept of cap and trade has worked to solve many issues uh, some of which the Prime Minister Brian Mulroney was part of. The ozone layer with the Montreal Protocol capped and traded CFCs and Hallands to make sure that we were looking at the lowest cost price for private sector to tackle that issue that was having a deleterious impact to our ozone layer. Acid rate in the 1990s, looking at reducing sulfur dioxide at the power plants, something we have an issue with in this province. That's something the province could do too, by the way. Reduce our sulfur caps. We want to close some of those coal plants down, three of them over time already, which is driving up our costs, driving up our carbon pricing costs over years. Close them down. We solved that issue of acid rain. Taking lead out of gas in the 1980s, cap and trade again. Three major, major environmental issues were solved by trading systems. So we had a system, we had legislation that would not even needed to be amended for us to link with other provinces, other states that are showing the way with innovation and guaranteeing carbon reductions. That's what a cap and trade system does when you compare it to carbon taxes. Cap and trades guarantee that we reduce our carbon emissions. The other thing it did for this province, it raised tens of million dollars each auction to spend on electric vehicle incentives. I guarantee you the members see more and more EVs on the streets. Efficiency programs for low-income Nova Scotians. Two of the things I announced on the first day of my office in Premier that that party uh, criticized, especially in rural areas. Yes, Trying to divide urban and rural communities. Clean programs. Solar community programs leading the way. All this revenue which is now over $100 million, the government has removed themselves from being able to, to get because they couldn't come up with a program that was in the best interest of Nova Scotia. 
Now, they said they will continue in some way, so that'll come from general revenue. So what's that? Again, it's tax. We just talked about HST. They're either going to have to increase taxes, a future government's going to have to in increase taxes, or they're going to continue to add the debt for our future generations to pay. So they are downloading social costs of carbon to my kids and yours, and the health of our population will suffer, and they are downloading fiscal costs with this view that nobody cares about deficit spending anymore. So don't worry about giving up that revenue and that green fund. Don't worry about that. We'll find the money, as we always do. We'll spend money no matter where the squeaky wheel is. If there's a pesky environmental group that wants a program, we'll find it in general revenue. The reality is the pan-Canadian framework was violated when this government removed our cap-and-trade legislation without a price on pollution. They knew with that PowerPoint presentation, by just reiterating existing targets, that there was no price on pollution. That's what triggered the carbon levy. The carbon levy that Nova Scotians are paying at the pumps is a direct result of an abdication of leadership and working together to find the best solution for Nova Scotians that recognize that we had the highest power rates and high gas prices and that recognize that we were leaders and can continue to be leaders by working together to fight the defining issue of our time. So I request the government go back to the go back, work with your colleagues across at least Atlantic Canada, if not throughout the United States where we used to be a board member. We chaired the Western Climate Initiative up until last year and I understand that our agreement runs out in the next few days. Let's get back to the table with the Western Climate Initiative. Let's get back to the table and demand a better deal from Ottawa. Let's start the carbon levy and get back to a cap and trade that works for Nova Scotians. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax, Citadel, Sable Island. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the member for Timberley Prospect for kicking off this, this discussion. You know, I do think, um, I, I, and I think we all share this, we know that everything we're doing here needs to be centered around the question of our environmental sustainability and survival. And we know that when we don't take action on addressing climate change, um, it results in negative health outcomes, it costs our province more money, and it's holding us back. So, you know, I think um, government has another chance to get this right. I know we have legislated goals and targets. That really, while bold, was also the easiest part mm -hmm. of all of this. This was the easiest part. Now we need action that actually gets us to the goals and targets. And I don't, I don't want to be sitting here in five years and missing targets and ten years and missing targets because it's really important to me that we actually uh, take action on, on, as the member from Temperley Prosper said, the issue of our time. I mean, this is what Nova Scotians expect us to do. This is uh, what people want to see us do. You know, um, we have legislative goals and targets. And I, you know, and, and lots of things are just are not happening on the environmental front, you know, in terms of getting us there. So I think we're late on the solid waste plan. Um, you know, the Coastal Protection Act, mm. when we heard the rollback, the scrapping of the Coastal Protection Act, and, you know, I continue to hear from dozens of people every week, but thousands of Nova Scotians um, were appalled because they thought that was actually a concrete action that was that was going forward. And then we had, you know, had this government that was um, all about picking a fight with Ottawa and with the other provinces. Yet at the same time, the Premier today said that he'll work with anybody. So if that's the case, now is the time to put that into practice, to do the work, not pick a fight. And Nova Scotians want us to do the fight, to, to do the work. They, we all, we've, you know, we all say this. We all spent last year um, experiencing climate change on our front doors. Folks in other sectors, like in agriculture, have been talking about this for years, where their homes, their families, their livelihood, their farms are are all affected on a daily basis by re very real climate change, and it's not slowing down. So, if you look at, you know, we just had the warmest February on record for the world. So, you know, this is only. Um, increasing and you know we have a we, we have a real responsibility to step up 
and come up with a plan um, and to start, uh, you know, making some change and also addressing the climate anxiety that people feel. And government has a role in that, in putting forth not only some targets, but um, some clear action that's going to get us there. And I think the other real anxiety that people have in this province these days is around is their economic anxiety. People are worried. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. are worried about how much life is going to cost. Um, everything is, is getting more expensive. Yes, inflation has slowed down, but it's still a factor. Um, wages, salaries have not kept up. And um, costs that people feel in their immediate lives have a huge impact. I mean, the, the stress that people feel about going to fill up their tank these days um, is palatable. It's what people talk about, um, you know, and if you need to drive for your work or get to your work um, and then, you know, have higher prices on, on food um, and without actually um, controlling the message around uh, options for putting a price on carbon or other actions, um, this government has actually left people to sort of wander into the to an area of, of policy debate that's really being, you know, negative, negatively influenced, particularly from the federal level, um, and blaming instead of talking about capitalism and, and what where where our issues are coming from, uh, actually really you know blaming it on on the carbon tax, and that's not helpful for anyone. That's not helpful for us. It's not helpful for addressing climate. And it's not helpful for folks who are worried about the cost of living. And so, you know, uh, honestly, I don't see that this government is a leader on climate change. No. Again, let's, you know, targets, goals, great. Anybody can set a target, anybody can set a goal. It's actually doing the work to get there. They didn't negotiate to find a plan that would better accommodate Nova Scotia's realities. They haven't created, created meaningful transit, energy, or other alternatives. I know people have to drive in rural Nova Scotia. Um, you know, I grew up in rural Nova Scotia. But, uh, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is we're actually quite a small province and could really do an amazing job um, with public mass transit. Um, and, again, that uh, can help achieve climate goals and can help achieve people's economic and financial goals. Um, you know, uh, Despite a pledge to local foods, uh, it's unclear that this government has any strategy really for supporting the agricultural industry that would also, that needs help to and support to, to respond to climate change, but also can help us bring down food costs because we can bring down transportation costs because we can really um, be able to, uh, you know, uh, truly have local, local food and local access in the province. Um, so we need to move past rhetoric. And, you know, it is stunning to me that we're in another legislative session without real ideas coming forth. So I know on Coastal Action, there's, there's, a, there's a map that people, um, that, you know, are actually disputing the, the, the data that's there. Um, and there might be some other things that come forward in the next little while that might help municipalities. But basically, there's nothing. Um, so there's some real there's some real opportunities here. So we could immediately mandate net zero building standards. We could immediately ban fossil heat from all new healthcare infrastructure, public housing, special planning areas, and land acquired through the Build Nova Scotia programs. So we could really meet our goals in terms of housing and healthcare infrastructure, and at the same time be meeting climate goals. We need to really expand our demand side energy pro programs and make sure that people don't have to pay out of pocket when they make the choice um, for heat pumps, when they make the choice for solar or for insulation, that in fact, we are supporting people up front. Um, and I really think you would see um, a really quick commitment of lots of people who know they have a problem and just can't figure out the way to get the money organized to address the problem. I'm one of these people on the Halifax Peninsula who's sitting with an oil tank and in a hot water radiators in my old house, and I can't figure out how to afford getting rid of that and getting heat pumps. Um, you know, and, and you know, and I think another piece is we're talking. You know, there's so much we could be doing through labor skills and immigration in terms of building a green workforce. And again, you know, we talk about the need to build up the trades. Um, 
The Minister of Finance couldn't provide any information on who's accessing the most program, for instance, so we don't know if some of the people accessing it have you know, done the green technology program at NSCC or other things, but this is the type, the type of integrated approaches that we need. It's a complex issue and we need, uh, we need uh, solid, complex solutions um, so that we're, we're hitting it from all angles. We know we need to get Nova Scotia power off of fossil fuels. Um, we've talked about, you know, a lot about, you know, where is the low, come, low income energy program? And, you know, really just saying no to taking things out of the ground at this point. We think there should be a $1 billion housing preservation fund that includes financing and requirements for retrofits to ensure that all buildings purchased and financed are net zero within five years. The joint regional transit network should be this entire province. We are actually quite a small geographic area and, we, and throughout the province we need enhanced access to uh, mass public transit. Young people need it, seniors need it, our, our workers need it and the environment needs it. This is, and again, this is an industry. So it's, it also creates benefit um, for those who can get involved. Um, we need to really up our game in terms of progressive building codes um, and we call for the passage of the Coastal Protection Act despite uh, what we've seen happen here uh, in the past month. Um, so, you know, this is the time, this is the challenge and if, and if, you know, if we don't actually achieve the goals and targets that this government has set out, um, we're, we're letting down our, our communities, we're letting down our youth, uh, we're laying down our industries that could be built from that, and I certainly want to see that this government steps up and is uh, a partner in finding solutions for climate change. I recognize the honourable member for Halifax Atlantic. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, ten minutes uh, is not a long time to speak on an important topic, which one I think most people around here feel is, uh, you know, uh, one of, if not the most impo important topic of our lifetime. Right? <laughs> uh, we, I think, everyone can agree that uh, all MLAs in this chamber want to do and continue to work toward a green, renewable. Uh, environment and province, not just for ourselves, but for our children. But the things that I keep hearing over and over and over, this is frustrating me, is things like public relations and, and these, these are PR stunts and, and these are, uh, there was a plan and there was all these different things that happened. But Madam Speaker, before I, I get into the why, I want to tell, tell you about a little firm called Maple Leaf Strategies. And you may not know what Maple Leaf Strategies is. We know what the Toronto Maple Leafs are, Maple Leaf Baloney. But Maple Leaf Strategies is actually a public relations firm. It's actually a public relations firm and a government relations firm. Gov sorry, government strategy firm. So there was an email sent April 14th from the then Premier's office to Maple Leaf Strategies that said, further to my recent outreach to you, we are still unclear on how to proceed with the statement Premier Rankin made in his letter to Mr. Sorenstein on March 8th, 2000. Order. Order. Yes, still, when there is a quote, I'm, I'm sorry, you cannot. So please just uh, acknowledge by the members' constituency. Thank you. I recognize, I recognize the honourable member for Halifax Atlantic. The Premier of the day made in his letter to Mr. Sorenstein on March 8, 2021, where he wrote, while I am not in a position to specify a particular approach to carbon pricing, past 2022 in Nova Scotia at this time, I want to assure you that we are committed to a carbon price and compliance pathway for your project. Our question is, how do we turn his commitments into action? We would, be, we would welcome a discussion in real time. So what this says and what this shows is that there was no plan. And the truth is, we know, uh, and the, the member, the Minister of Environment won't say it, but one of the first things that was said to him when he walked into that ministerial position was that the, carb, or that the cabin trace system was dead. It was gone. It didn't work for Nova Scotia. It was broken. 
And the fact was, as we talk about, we continue to hear comments about California, Quebec, and being part of um, the cap and trade system there. The department, WCI. Oh, WCI, yes, the WCI. The department was very clear that this was going to cost Nova Scotians money, that Nova Scotians would actually be paying out for credits. So the system that was supposedly supposed to take place would have actually cost Nova Scotians more money out of their pocket, and that money would have went to California. Excuse me, I didn't order. interrupt you. Oh, oh, order, order, order. Order. I, I would ask that uh, the member for Timberley Prospect to uh, stand in his place and just retract that. I recognize the honourable member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And what the member had said about spending more money or is not true. I disagree with what the member had said. I will order. retract my comment. Oh, okay. As we all know in this chamber, it's unparliamentary to accuse another member of lying. So I would kindly ask uh, the member to stand in his place and, and please retract that statement. Thank you. I recognize the honourable member for Timberley Prospect. I have a lot of respect for the chair and, and yourself, Madam Speaker. It's the first time I had to do that in 10 years. I retract the word lying. Thank you. I recognize the honourable member for Halifax Atlantic, and I would also ask the uh, member for Halifax Atlantic to make sure he tables those uh, comments, please. Thank you. So, Madam Speaker, um, the reason why I wanted to stand up on this today is because uh, I, it's, it's not just that, it's, it's that the confusion around also the federal side of this. So we have MPs that stood outside of this house that, that go up to Ottawa and they say that we need to carve out the carbon tax for rural Nova Scotia. That's what they say. And then it, the fact of the matter is, is that I cornered one of those MPs, one of those particular MPs, and I said, parts of my own community are rural. We don't have access to bus route. Why aren't we getting it? And he said, take it up with Ottawa. So if there was so much faith in a carbon tax, Madam uh, Chair, Madam Speaker, why are they carving it out? I would argue that, that this, the federal government putting forward and saying a carbon tax is working and then scaling it back and scaling it back and scaling it back is for political purposes. So is the carbon tax political or is it not political? Does it work or doesn't it work? There are ways to reduce our carbon footprint. We all know that. And what we heard today in question period from the minister, Madam Speaker, is that Nova Scotians are still driving. We're still driving. And they're actually driving more. You know, there was incentives for electric vehicle, and what we heard from when, when speaking to the, the other minister in the department, 1%, the 1% in Nova Scotia. took advantage of that. And I'll tell you, just the other day, I went to look for a vehicle. We we're looking for a vehicle for five, vehicle for five, two adults, three children, electric vehicle, $120,000, $140,000. Two year wait, 20% down. They told me you gotta put about $30,000 down, we're gonna hold it for two years, and then you'll get a vehicle. And, and, and to say that there, I heard one of the members talk about no investment in mass transportation. I just saw a massive investment in a ferry in Bedford. And yesterday, the Department of Transportation sat here and members of the JRTC, a JRTA, sorry, who are actually doing the work on how to move people around this province in mass transit ways. That's an insult to them. It's an insult to them. It's an insult to all the work they're doing across this province. You know, I, I went back and I looked a little bit in, in what was said and what wasn't said. 
In 2016, when this was being negotiated, the then minister said that we were a leader in Canada in, in GHC reductions, in carbon, in, in carbon footprint. We were doing better than anyone else. Well, those numbers haven't changed. So why was it true then and not true now? And I would argue that the, provincial, the federal government gave the then provincial government, which I was part of, I was proud of the cap and trade system. They gave them two years to negotiate it, to get something done. Well, that letter that I'm going to table was sent on April of 2021, and the election was, what, three months later? Where it said there was no plan. And I know that we hear the Premier talk about go fast, get things done, go fast, get things done, but they're expecting him to do a plan and that minister to do a plan Order. that took them two years and three months. Order. We, uh, the time for late debate has expired. Um, I want to thank all members for participating um, on this important topic. I now recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, um, Madam Speaker. I move that you now leave the chair and the House resolve itself into a committee of the whole House on bills. Motion carried.
Order, order. Uh, Committee of the whole House on bills will come to order. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 419, Financial Measures 2024 Act? Uh, we'll continue with Bill 419, the Financial Measures 2024 Act, and I'll recognize the Honourable Member for Bedford Basin with approximately 47 minutes remaining. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't anticipate to, to anticipate taking all 47 minutes because I can't talk real well right, right now. It's <laughs> been a long, been a long day, uh, as as the uh, as the chair knows. Uh, so we were discussing um, the Financial Measures Act and some of the concerns that we have with the act, and 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 we have questions. Do the changes comply with Health Canada rules and legislation on information privacy? <coughs> And, and we feel that the minister has not adequately explained why she needs the individual personal data, she or her designate. We did appreciate hearing from the minister um, where we were informed that health would be lightly touching the data, but that's not how other provinces do it. And so I think people are a little concerned about that right now, giving consent not to a, an arm's length entity, but to a government department, to a government minister or her designate, and they're concerned about that. And, you know, we've, there are a number of people who would be concerned about doing that. Lots of people would be concerned about that. Some people won't care. But anyone who's, who's dealt with a mental health concern, anyone who has, Suffered, suffered trauma may not really feel kosher about the fact that they are being lightly touched by the Department of Health for their data. We had not heard until yesterday that people could opt out. This was news to everybody. That wasn't anywhere that we had heard. What we are still not clear on is all of those Nova Scotia government employees who had that app downloaded without consent, you had a government phone, it got downloaded on it. We don't know if they were asked if they would like it. It just appeared there one day. That's concerning to me. They did not give their consent. Can they delete it? Are they allowed to delete it? We don't know. And the Minister of Health had indicated that Doctors Nova Scotia was fine with it. But they also suggested an amendment to this. And so you will see amendments coming forward that reflect what Doctors Nova Scotia said because even Doctors Nova Scotia was uncomfortable with it. I had a call from a doctor today, just heard about it. He was like, this is nuts. People don't want this. People might like the app. They don't want to have the Department of Health or this government or any government having access to their health records. And we feel that the government's indicated, you know, we're going to have we're going to have this process, and there's going to be people who oversee it and all that stuff. But that is not written into the legislation, and the problem with that is that we don't know what's coming down the road. And my example yesterday was the issue of abortion rights, and I went through the long list of states in the U.S that have abortion bans, and I only talked about abortion bans, I didn't even get into the ones that have gestational limits now. Where the state has intruded into the wombs of women and decided they can't have abortions anymore, doesn't matter whether it's for your, for your health, for your life, whatever, doesn't matter, you don't get it. And so Alabama, Arkansas, Idaho, Indiana, Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, Missouri, North Dakota, Oklahoma, South Dakota, Tennessee, Texas, and West Virginia have uh, abortion bans. 
And then we get into the states that have gestational limits. Georgia, South Carolina, Nebraska, North, Car North Carolina, Arizona, Florida, and Utah. Some of them were trying to figure out if they could actually find out if a woman had left the state for an abortion, if they could prosecute her when she came back. And so it, sound, it might sound far-fetched to this house today, but I'll bet you 10 years ago, the women in a lot of those states didn't think they would be in the situation they are in today. And that's why it's important that the actual process and who gets to have access to this data that has to be spelled out clearly in the legislation. Because we don't want some super right-wing group coming in down the road, and it can happen. We've seen, we've seen it in other jurisdictions. Coming in down the road and deciding they know what's better for a woman's health than her and her health provider. And we probably might not have been quite so suspicious if this clause hadn't been tucked into a 111 clause bill on financial measures, if it hadn't been tucked in at clause 110. But at clause 110, that's right near the end. And you have to ask yourself, it wasn't even talked about. What was in the bill wasn't even mentioned. Why was that? I'm assuming the reason it wasn't needed for the, for the pilot was because people actually gave their consent to be involved in that pilot. Unlike the Nova Scotia government employees, who all had that app loaded on their phone. They had no choice. It was just there. So for us, this is a concerning thing, and it's easily remedied. The government just has to take whatever parameters that they're planning to put in, in regulation and put it into the bill. So there's no funny business five, 10, 15 years down the road when our children in some cases or grandchildren in other cases may actually be sub subject to this particular bill. Now, in recent days, we've also been told that Nova Scotia is now going to index income assistance to CPI, which is wonderful news. It's long overdue. I'm so pleased to see it. But I can't figure out is, wh where is it? Where is it in the budget documents? Where was it in all the PR that the government did around their budget? More faster. Where was the announcement that covered that? Nowhere. Where was, in, in, in the days that followed, when the government began to take a beating in, in, in the press about the lack of support for our most vulnerable Nova Scotians, nothing, crickets. Not a thing. Then we go to law amendments. We hear more about it. Again, the government takes another beating on this particular issue. Nothing. Crickets. The minister comes in, speaks for an hour, does the intro introductory speech, which is usually where you list off all the investments are. As a minister, you want to talk about the good things your department's doing. It's not in there. Minister goes through four hours 
plus, I think, of estimates, not a word, goes into the next day, does his closing remarks, not a word, suddenly we find out, hey, we've got, we're indexing income assistance. Just came out of nowhere. Now, this is a government that likes to announce things. And sometimes they like to announce things two and three times. Are you telling me that they missed all these opportunities to announce something that was in the budget? They have just added to that. And again, it's a good thing that they've added to it. We're pleased to see it. But it's not how government is supposed to work. And it's not how Treasury and Policy Board is supposed to work. Suddenly, out of the blue, they have found not a, not a large amount of money when you consider the whole budget, and not even a large amount of money when you consider DCS's budget. But they have found some money to help people, and that's great. But they didn't follow the process, and that is a hallmark of this government. Got a problem? Find some money, pay for it. Make it go away. So there are a few more things I just want to talk about in the FMA. I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time here because I did talk the other day. But if we look at Clause 29, what I worry about is that we're suddenly going to have a bunch of municipalities competing to sell their land, their municipal land, they're not, they don't have to just sell it to nonprofits anymore, they will be able to sell it to businesses. So they're all going to be competing against each other, it's going to be a race to the bottom, they're going to be giving away land to big companies. And the reason they couldn't do that before is that we didn't want that kind of thing to happen. Because we'd been there before, Nova Scotia's been there before, we'd seen it happen. And so I worry about that particular clause. And there were many clauses in here that allow different entities, mostly municipalities, to, to advertise various things. And they no longer have to be in newspapers, they can just be online. And I understand why that's happening. But I have to say it makes me sad because it's like the death knell for, for newspapers, community newspapers. It's like the Washington Post says, democracy dies in darkness. When there's no one shedding light on what's going on, democracy dies. And we also see that this particular bill extends the executive panel on housing for another two years. I'm not, I'm not really sure how I feel about that. Because on the one hand, boy, do we need housing. On the other hand, I'm not really sure what this particular, the executive panel on housing has done how it's improved things. Clear, cleared some roadblocks, uh, probably the government would say, but some of those roadblocks existed for a reason. And so my honorable colleague talked about, you know, a housing development that's gonna go on, on a watershed. And I can tell you, nature will out. I live in a neighborhood at the top of a really tall, tall hill. You would never think in a million years that we would flood. But where there were watercourses, they come back. 
And so when we're building, we need to be respectful of those things. Because as we saw in July 2021, and as, and as many Nova Scotians have seen since that time, nature will out. Water just doesn't go away. It doesn't get absorbed into the land. And to their regret, Nova Scotians are, are stuck with homes that flood. And there's, and there's things in here about village commissions and things like planning, planning things and, and all of that. For me, the big thing is the health care, the health change. To me, that is the huge stumbling block here. And the government could so easily just put what they plan to put in regulations, put that in the bill, or even just tighten up the language as per what Doctors Nova Scotia actually suggested. And that would be, that would be so, so helpful. just as they removed the Firefighters Volunteer Act. They saw a problem with it, and they backed it, and, and they acted swiftly to deal with it. I, I appreciate that. It's never fun to have to back down or to step down from something, but I think, I think it would be, I'd respect people for actually listening to what, not just, not just the opposition, but actually the health experts and what they're saying. They're uncomfortable with it. We do have a clause there about the Office for Children and Youth Act. Again, this is a good thing. I'm glad to see it. But there's no information there about what that's going to look like. Will it just be for children in care? Will it be for all children in the province? Will they go into educational facilities and look at the situations there? If we can't have the NSTU for public accounts to speak to school violence, will we be able to have the Office of Children and Youth? Will they be able to come and talk to us about what's going on there? We don't know. We don't know if it'll be robust, if it will just be a tiny little slice, or will it be really delve in and look at the issues that are faced by our youngest Nova Scotians? Again, we don't know because there's no information there. It's one line. What will its mandate be? We don't know. And that seems to be sort of that's the, we are left with more questions than answers after reading through the document. And so for me, those are my concerns. Um, I recognize that putting together the FMA is a is a big job, but it's made bigger when you don't put pieces of legislation into this house to be dealt with as they should be. I mean, why you wouldn't be embarrassed by passing three bills in a session? shouldn't say you why one would not be why one would not be embarrassed to pass just three bills in a session and there go my notes so it was good that I was actually uh, ready to ride up <laughs> and sit down but uh, I, I did I did want to uh, to make those few points and with that I will take my seat thank you I recognize the Honourable Member of Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I'm happy to uh, stand um, 
at the beginning of our discussion um, on the Financial Measures Act. Uh, you know, we've had a chance to have some discussion about it previously. Um, I just thought the chair might want to call folks to order, but I'll keep going. Um, you know, and I think, you know, in terms of the budget that's been laid before us, um, you know, we need a budget that's addressing the challenges of our time. So we need a budget uh, that's providing a pathway uh, to care for people that they can see, um, to access to primary health care. Uh, we need a budget that's talking about all kinds of different types of housing that we need to address our housing crisis. Um, we need a budget that actually commits this province and this government to poverty reduction. You know, I um, you know note that uh, there was the you know the repeated comment that the the uh, assistant bank governor commented on the optimism that um, she had encountered in Nova Scotia in business, which is, um, you know, of course, that's that's what you want to hear about optimism. But at the same time, I don't think that reflects the reality. Mm -hmm. It doesn't reflect the reality of growing inequality um, in this province. And, uh, you know, I am glad that um, we found out Shayla income assistance rates will be indexed, um, but they haven't been actually made adequate before they're being indexed. So, you know, I think um, at 2.5%, uh, you know, we can we can all do the math, but I mean, essentially for someone on an enhanced rate, I think it's about $25 a month. And again, when we're in this time where we've had such significant financial or, or um, price increases and inflation, um, and um, when um, uh, income assistance was essentially frozen, essentially eroded by the inflationary crisis that we've had, um, the indexing is one step, but it actually is not going to alleviate poverty. Um, it leaves people well below the pov yeah. poverty line, still dealing with the same issues. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, we look at our child poverty rates, we look at our family and child use at food banks, um, you know, uh, the use by families, you know, I, I shared earlier in the session a letter from Phoenix Youth Services where families were actually dropping their young people off at the Phoenix shelter, um, not because that young person wanted to leave the family, not because of other reasons, but because they literally could not, they had lost their home. So they could not afford to keep um, their young person safe and sheltered um, within the family. So these are huge issues. And the other thing that I think, you know, in general, this whole session has been silent on, um, and certainly the budget is completely silent on, um, is issues around reconciliation. And again, I think these are the challenges of our time. Um, and we're doing a lot of work to overcome, uh, to identify where colonialism racism, sexism, misogyny, homophobia, transphobia still exist. Um, and we should be doing a lot to overcome those. Uh, you know, it was interesting today to hear the Premier talk about, um, you know, uh, how he listens to Nova Scotians, which I was like, you literally don't listen to Nova Scotians. That's actually not what you do. Um, and that you'll work with anyone and that's actually not true either. So, you know, we've been in a bun fight with the federal government um, since this government uh, got into power. Um, and what we're seeing is that uh, the Premier will work with anybody that's like his friend. But like beyond that, um, you know, it's not clear that, that that extends to all the Nova Scotians that, that he, uh, Order, Talks. order. I just, uh, I know you're not there, but I just, like, it, it's all, uh, we have all honourable members that are in this house, but I, I just, I, I recognize the honourable member for Halifax, Citadel, Sable Island. You weren't, so you weren't calling me out of order? No. no. Cautionary. Okay. Um, and I guess the other thing that I would ask, too, is that I have found it really distracting, the level of discussion in here, so I would appreciate that you also maintain and ask people to order when they're not respecting you or I as, as we're trying to proceed, so.
you got the floor. All right. Um, so we will be bringing forward amendments, um, particularly around the Personal Health Information Act changes that I think are significant, um, and around the Child and Youth Commissioner, and I'll speak more about those at the time. Um, so I wanted to spend some time just, you know, talking about overall this bill and this budget um, and some really, you know, serious concerns I think we have in this province around um, public financial management, transparency, and accountability. Um, you know, if, if the Premier was going to quadruple or quintuple down on anything or wh whatever the expression was, um, I'd love it if he would quadruple down on prudent public fiscal management. That's actually where I think we could do a lot of good. Um, and so over the course of the last few weeks, you know, we've seen a lot of concerns about it's okay. The use of um, additional appropriations, that's something we've been concerned about for years. Um, I understand, just, just so we don't have to have this conversation again, I do understand that it was an NDP government who brought in the Finance Act in 2010, got it. And, but I also understand that the, um, the, like the amount and the use of additional appropriations has expanded quite radically mm -hmm. since that time. So uh, I think under the Liberals, it was about 4.2%. We're at 10% of the budget. So 10% of the budget is, is being decided <laughs> upon and passing without any legislative oversight. Um, I know that people can then file the OICs. And, you know, and trust me, I actually spent a, bin, a bunch of time in the OIC database this week and last week. Um, and I will say that actually there is a, like a significant difference. And I, I, you know, if anybody wants to see some of the stuff I found, but you know, under the Liberal government, for instance, um, there would be a special warrant issued for an expenditure of say six hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. So they would say, you know, actually, like this is an additional appropriation. Here's our special warrant. It's issued. It's there. Um, this government is issuing mass block additional appropriation OICs. They're not being called special warrants. Um, and so the level of transparency is just not there. Like we're seeing huge amounts of money. It's not going to one program. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, it, it really is a huge change in how we're uh, using our, fin our financial, um, our finance act. And how we're being accountable to peop the people of Nova Scotia. And I think it's a problem. Um, and, you know, this is also the session where we got to walk through uh, lots about the Hogan Court um, um, situation where there's huge questions around uh, the procurement process that was used um, that, you know, I think those questions persist. Um, I don't think we've received any satisfactory answers uh, other than that's what that's what you know the premier wanted to do was buy this hotel and then um, you know get rid of it quite quickly in the last few weeks when it became a huge problem um, and at the same time you know we're still concerned that we're going to be paying the mortgage um, for the private enterprise that's now running the facility. Yes, we want more beds. Yes, transitional care is a great idea, but it does matter. It matters how governments spend money. Um, you know, there's a long and sordid history of government procurement. I mean, this is what we uh, have tried to overcome in the last few decades was uh, government procurement that did not serve the public good. And it did not serve the public good because it wasn't done fairly, transparently, uh, friends of the folks in power got the contracts, friends of the folks in power got the money. This is what we are trying to overcome in the practice of public procurement. And, you know, at a provincial level, at a national level, at an international level, um, the OECD uh, has a whole section that works around procurement. The UN has procurement guidelines because spending public money is different than spending your personal money and it's different than spending money if you have a private business where the bottom line is, you know, usually measured in terms of profit. So we need public procurement to be fair, transparent. We need it to be efficient. It needs to be an efficient, um, uh, uh, sort of the best way to, to achieve the goals of, of the expenditure. Because a dollar saved in public spending is a dollar for another program. So in a business, a dollar saved is profit. But here, it's about another public program. 
um, public procurement often has other policy goals. So we see that around small and medium enterprises. Here in Nova Scotia, I understand the Department of Economic Development is launching a diversity supplier program. The idea being that you'd be a certified as a diversity supplier and thus, um, you know, I assume there'll be other types of programs to encourage people to work with diverse communities, work with diverse suppliers. So we want that. Um, you know, the, uh, federally, there's a commitment to 5% um, indigenous procurement. So all of these things are because public money is actually not just about making money. It's a expenditure for the public good, and the public good can be, you know, a, a number of key policy issues. Um, and we have to concern ourselves with with uh, conflict of interest, of course, to achieve all of these. Um, so I thought it might be useful. I'm going to table this, uh, but it is easily available online. Um, in terms of some of the OECD guidelines around um, procurement and principles around procurement and that sort of thing. So, you know, they talk about pro promoting fair and equitable, equitable treatment for potential suppliers by providing an adequate and timely degree of transparency in each phase of the public procurement cycle. So, of course, you have to take into account the legitimate needs for the protection of trade secrets and proprietary information. I, you know, I understand the discussion around Hogan Court talking about, uh, you know, the need not to be going out to the market and being seen uh, uh, in terms of, you know, what you're looking for and what you want. But at the same time, it's clear that each stage needs to be as tra transparent as possible. For most governments, these days, that involves like an online portal for all stakeholders, so suppliers, civil society, the general public, so that we can follow along in terms of what is government seeking to buy, how are they seeking to buy it, and so that suppliers are also able to respond to those opportunities. And here is a, you know, a really important principle that I think uh, you know, we can think about in terms of procurement, we can think about it in terms of additional appropriations, but it's about ensuring the visibility of the flow of public funds from the beginning of the budgeting process throughout the public procurement cycle. So we need that because we need to make sure that it's, that it's fair, that there's no corruption, that we're not favoring friends and, and family and that sort of thing. We need that because it helps stakeholders, like the public, um, to understand, you know, government has a priority and how is it spending money to achieve that priority. And we also need that because, again, uh, when we're spending public money, we can be strategic about that in terms of like what other goals do we have. So do we want to support small and medium enterprises with a certain procurement opportunity? Do we want to support African Nova Scotia businesses with another? Um, and so, you know, we have to have a high degree of integrity in the public procurement cycle. And if we don't, if we don't, then we're just going back to the days of where public, you know, procurement. When government bought things, they bought things from people who were their friends when they were in power, um, and then that cycle would switch when the government switches. What we want is we want Nova Scotians uh, to know that, in fact, uh, who uh, becomes a government supplier, who's involved in government procurement, that you have an equal opportunity at that, whether it's a PC, Liberal, or NDP government. Um, you know, we need to have this, this high level of, of integrity. We need to have the tools and the internal controls to make sure that we're implementing these, the uh, fair and transparent procurement. So, you know, we've heard a lot of use around the alternative procurement model um, by government. That definitely exists, and that exists for some great reasons, right? That exists for things like when we have a pandemic and you need to outsource quickly supplies in order to, to protect public health and to save lives in Nova Scotia. Absolutely. But even under alternative procurement, it involves making visible the expenditure of public dollars. So what do you need? Where are you spending it? What are you getting for it? And even in cases of emergency, there is an expectation that government is seeking value for money. Um, and, you know, I think as well, you know, we need to have the, the frameworks in place, which I think we do, but we're not using them in Nova Scotia. I think I, I'm concerned by the um, use of, of exemptions in the procurement um, of this government. I'm concerned by single source procurement. 
Um, competitive procurement needs to be the standard. And like I said, only in cases of urgency or uh, perhaps like very specialized um, goods and services, uh, is there any um, excuse, if there's any rationale um, for not being uh, open and transparent about how you're doing your procurement. Um, like I said, public procurement is also a method of pursuing secondary policy objectives um, in accordance with, with um, clear government priorities. So that's balancing you know, potential benefits and the, and the need to achieve value for money. Um, so things like who can the suppliers be, how can you support different types of suppliers to be more competitive in government co procurement. Um, and we also need to be measuring that. So it's not enough to say uh, we want to um, increase the use of diverse suppliers, um, but we need to be tracking that. And, um, you know, some of the other key issues, of course, of, much like the Finance Act needs an update, of course our procurement policies will need an update from time to time. That, is, that should be expected and government should be anticipating that and working within that. So, but there should be a standard and public process when updates to the policies are, are taking place. They should include public consultations um, and connecting with private sector, civil society, um, and engaging in transparent and regular dialogues with suppliers and business associations so that there is that dialogue where government can present your priorities, how you're gonna achieve them, what are any, if, if any, secondary policy priorities through procurement, um, and that you can also hear from potential suppliers about how, um, how the current procurement system is working. Um, you know, and I, so I think, uh, there's, there's a lot around public financial management um, to be concerned about in Nova Scotia these days. Um, we want to be getting, uh, you know, we want to respond to the policy priorities that we have, but we need to respond to those with principles of good governance, and that's accountability and transparency, and particularly when it involves money, um, we need to be sure that we're only going into alternative procurement when it's absolutely necessary. Um, in the past few weeks, we also had the report from the Auditor General on uh, her review of just a small portion of the additional appropriations that have happened um, over the past couple of years. And again, uh, you know, even with just a random sampling of 17% of those expenditures, um, again, there was huge concerns about how well we're managing the public purse, how well we're ensuring that we understand what we're asking from proponents and stakeholders that we're engaging to undertake a certain task. So, you know, uh, most of the um, 11 projects that the Auditor General looked at didn't have cost estimates. Um, most of them uh, didn't have anything to do with conflict of interest, which of course is a huge part of making sure that overall our government expenditures, certainly including procurement, um, is fair and transparent. We, as I said earlier around public transportation, we live in a small province. We absolutely live in a small province. And so, you know, conflict of interests are going to arise. You're going to know people um, who want to do business with government. Um, and so the point of this is to, be, is to be very clear about that, to identify the conflict of interest or potential conflict of interest, to put in steps of how you're going to mitigate that conflict of interest. And there's a huge amount of best practice about this. This is not, this is not new. Um, this is basic, you know, fiduciary management. Um, you know, some other things that were missing in the, in the, like I said, really small survey of projects that the Auditor General reviewed were things like, you know, uh, what happens with interest that's being accrued by the by the partner organization, um, because, you know, I think. Uh, it, it was really concerning that there seemed to be no immediate financial need for, I think, 86% of the projects that the Auditor General reviewed. So that money was going out the door 
at the end of the fiscal year when it could have been coming through a budget cycle. I mean, this is also part of it, right? It's that, like, a, you know, a number of these huge expenditures were in March or Marches, March of 2022 and March of 2023. And thus, could have been part of this budget process, could have been part of the public discussion and estimates, um, but weren't. And, you know, so there weren't performance targets. Um, and, you know, in general, uh, you know, I'm concerned that this is 17% of 2.6 billion, uh, and there's huge problems with this random sampling. What else is happening um, and how this government is spending money? Um, with that, I will take my seat um, and we'll look forward to speaking on certain amendments. I recognize the Honourable Member Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to speak to uh, FMA. Um, Mr. Chair, Mr. Speaker, this is a, a bit of a strange piece of legislation, uh, the Financial Measures Act. It has a, a real uh, whole pile of amendments and pieces of legislation all dumped into this one, one bill. Uh, amendments on gypsum mining, charters accountants, Cobbequid Pass, pensions, municipal affairs, among many other things, including very important pieces of legislation, including an office for children and youth. And I, I do want to say right off the top, Mr. S Mr. Chair, uh, an office for children of youth and our children and youth in general should not be an afterthought tossed into an ominous bill at the very end. So I was very um, surprised and disappointed to see the way that this uh, act, this very important piece of legislation, the way that it was presented here in the legislature. And I'll speak to more, more on that topic on another day. Of course, my role here in this House is to best represent the voices of the people of Cumberland North, and I'll do my best to do that today. I think it's very important when I look at this bill to raise an overarching concern, and that is the central, the culture around the centralization of power. And I, I believe this bill really represents that. This bill um, is, has a whole bunch of different departments' bills dumped into this one bill for the Minister of Finance. And it's taking the power away from uh, each government department that is responsible for their own legislation. Obviously, I'm assuming this is being done under the purview of the Premier's office. And yes, they, though they have the ability to do this, they have the power to do this, I do have concerns that this is, again, moving more towards a culture of centralization of power and taking away from um, strong, strong governing here in Nova Scotia. I believe, Mr. Speaker, the strong governance in Nova Scotia is best accomplished when each department in our government has the ability to lead their own work through the legislative process. And strong leadership does not seek to obtain power centrally, but rather strong leadership builds strong teams. And strong teams empowers individuals within their teams, and as a result, the organization is stronger, and in this case, our provincial government, I believe, would be stronger and healthier if there were local decision making, or in this case, local power within each government department. Bill 419 shows the opposite is happening within our government. Good prin principles of good governance include public accountability, transparency, and appropriate disclosure, and this bill does not reflect those principles of good governance. As changes to important laws are being proposed, uh, and new laws are being proposed, but they're all being tucked into this omnibus bill, 419. It appears, Mr. Speaker, as though each department is not being given the ability to lead their own work. They are being denied the ability to lead Nova Scotia towards excellence, which is where we should be headed, Mr. Speaker. I will say, uh, as appropriate, I will speak to each amendment as they're brought forward uh, later on tonight or tomorrow. And my initial plan, Mr. Speaker, was to bring forth an amendment to the personal hat 
Personal Health Information Act 110 um, amendment that's in this bill. However, after much research and reading uh, on what other Canadian provinces and territories have in place for personal uh, protection of personal health information, I am requesting that the Minister of Finance repeal this piece of legislation on the Personal Health Act amendment. And I'm asking that the Minister give that piece of legislation back to the Department of Health and Wellness and ask them to prepare a new bill that is more robust, that's more comprehensive, that ensures proper governance of allowing patients to access their electronic medical records while ensuring their privacy of their personal health information and importantly, their patient confidentiality. I want to unequivocally state Mr. Speaker, that I support the development of the inter interoperability of electronic medical records and the movement towards patients having access to their own electronic medical record file. However, this must be done carefully, ensuring the privacy of individual personal health information. An important piece of the modernization of electronic medical records is privacy and data governance. There is a need to modernize legislative structures, and that includes privacy legislation, and we need to recognize that since the pandemic, there has been a growing lack of trust in governments, and any proposed legislative changes, such as this one included in the Financial Measures Act, suggesting that government can have access to personal health information, was not considering the absolute core need to protect the privacy of people's private information. Mr. Speaker, this is fundamental. And this is at the heart of why we, this must be repealed and proper work done before this is brought before the legislature in the future. I'm confident that the staff of the Department of Health and Wellness are well aware of this, and I'm sure it's very frustrating for them to see this go off the rails as it has over the last few days, because simply because of the way it was presented here in legislation. And I do want to acknowledge and thank everyone that has been working on this important topic and this issue in the department over the last few years. Really, this has been worked on for probably about two decades. But we need to get the legislation right to protect the privacy of the citizens of this province. So to reiterate, I am requesting the Minister of Finance to repeal this section of Bill 419 and ask the Department of Health and Wellness to prepare a new bill that is more robust, comprehensive, ensuring proper governance structure, allowing patients to have access to their electronic medical records while ensuring their personal health information and patient confidentiality. Preparation of this new bill must include planning with Canada Health InfoWay, the Privacy Commissioner of Nova Scotia, the Nova Scotia Regulated Health Professions Network, the College of Physicians and Surgeons, as well as nonpartisan consultation with the public. Given that many Nova Scotia residents receive patient care through a maritime network of health care professionals, the governance of this new bill of confidential patient information and electronic medical records should be done in collaboration with fellow maritime provinces and incorporate policies from Canada Health InfoWay using a pan-Canadian approach. Children, families, and expectant mothers from all over the Maritimes receive care at the IWK, and this must be considered. Also, many Nova Scotians receive health care in other provinces, especially the residents that I represent in Cumberland County. Mr. Speaker, in 1999, I started a business offering physicians turnkey fully managed medical offices as a way to help recruit physicians to the Amherst area. In 2002, I went into business with a businessman and a pharmacist named Sean Chevry, and I opened my first clinic, the Amherst Family Health Clinic, as well as an after-hours clinic. And in 1999, I started with one client, one physician. By 2006, I had 13 physicians as clients. In 2006, we were one of three clinics in Nova Scotia that implemented electronic medical records. The software was Nightingale. We were wireless, we had tablets. It was very challenging, but it was exciting to be one of the first province, clinics in the province to implement an EMR.
We were very successful with our implementation. And as a result, I joined the provincial team in 2007 to 2009 as a peer educator for the FIM Peer-to-Peer -peer Network, the provincial network, and I was practice management chair of the provincial FIM user group. And I assisted in September 2007 to launch the national peer-to-peer -peer network. In May of 2009, I attended the annual Nightingale user meeting in Niagara-in-the-Lake and attended the national meeting for Canada Health InfoWay on implementing a pan-Canadian health network. And I just share this information so that it is clear that I understand the challenges that government faces with intero interoperability and connecting family practices with hospital databases, pharmacies, and other systems so that the consumer, the patient, can have access to their full personal health medical record. When we had Nightingale EMR, electronic medical record, patients could access their own data then with a click of a switch by the administrator of EMR. So having access to patient data is not a new concept brought, up, brought in by this government. We've actually been doing it here in Nova Scotia since, the late, uh, since around 2009. But I am encouraged that they are getting moving on this topic and, and trying to get things um, improved. Uh, many, many people in family practice know that Nightingale was sold and now many of our primary care providers are using TELUS. So as I mentioned, many people have been working on this very important topic for many years and they've been very frustrated by the delays and the length of time that this has taken. But Mr. Speaker, we cannot take shortcuts on protecting the privacy of patients' personal health information. We simply cannot. Mr. Speaker, I'd like us to take a look at what other provinces are doing, and I'll table these documents um, after I'm done. But we did some research of uh, other provinces here in Canada, and I wanted to make a note spe specifically of Nunavut, and they have a public health act. And in their act around the privacy and protection of personal health information, there's no mention of the minister, meaning that any of the information, people's personal health information, it's not available to politicians. It's to medical professionals. So in Nunavut, it's the chief public health officer that has access and oversees the administration of this act. I think it's very important um, for the department to take a look at Nunavut's um, legislation. It's very comprehensive. It's very thorough, I would say, the most of any of the provinces and territories. And I want to read one aspect of their legislation and would recommend that it's included in ours. And it states, disclosure of personal health information, the chief public health officer may disclose personal health information if the individual consents in accordance with access to information and protection of privacy act. So that is one of the core core fundamental pieces of that. But again, it's also very important that it's not a politician that the information is going to. It is a, a doctor. I will table all of these so that the, so that the minister and the staff can have a, uh, take a look at this. There is one more that I would like to read. British Columbia, they have a piece of legislation, it's called eHealth, so it's specific to Electronic Medical Record um, Health Act. And Alberta, their, piece, their legislation is called the Health Information Act. And I did want to read one piece from Alberta too. It's, it says, uh, on section five of their piece of legislation, where health information is requested under subsection by the department, they must prepare a privacy impact statement describing how disclosure of the health information may affect the privacy of the individual who is the subject of the information and submit the privacy impact assessment to the commissioner for review and comment, and B, must consider the comments of the commissioner, if any, made in response to the privacy impact assessment before disclosing the health information to a custodian referred to in section one. 
Again, almost every province's legislation, it's, it's uh, two to three pages long versus ours is, I think it was four lines. Sorry, Mr. Speaker. Again, going back to my very first, my request in my comments today is that this be repealed, uh, that the finance minister take it back to the Department of Health and Wellness and provide a more robust, comprehensive piece of legislation. And in doing their research uh, with what other provinces have in place, I believe would be of benefit to them. So I will table these documents here. Great. So, um, Mr. Speaker, let's also talk about the importance of having strong privacy commissioner in place. Nova Scotia is the only province where the privacy commissioner is not an independent officer of the legislature. The Premier is on the record stating he will work with the Privacy Commissioner to make sure the proper authority is here so that Nova Scotians can have access to the information they rightly have access to. So in this CBC article, which is from August 24, 2021, the Premier is quoted as, we're going to work with the Privacy Commissioner to make sure that the proper authority is there so that Nova Scotians can have access to the information that they rightly should have access to. And as far as I'm aware, Mr. Speaker, that hasn't happened yet. And I'll table that document as well. There we go. I would also at this time like to reference one of the presenter of Law Amendments Committee. She was a very brave woman, and her and I have had some conversations since her presentation, and I was able to share with her how uh, proud I was of her courage in, pre in her presentation. I'm just going to read a, a short quote from her presentation to Law Amendments Committee. Again, this is Carrie Smith from Digby, Nova Scotia. I'm not against advancements in new technology for the purposes of healthcare improvements and accessibility, nor am I against providing options for patients to obtain safe pathways to access their healthcare information. But there is a concern regarding lack of resources available for individual victims of privacy breach. Nova Scotia lacks an enforcement officer for the Personal Health Information Act. So if a custodian should be found to have violated patient privacy, Complainants may be left to fend for themselves around this issue. She goes on to say, I implore the members of this committee to consider the possible impacts to mental health of existing and future patients that believe their information is held in the strictest of confidence with the highest levels of security. I would worry that this change to existing legislation could be risky Taking into consideration, the Nova Scotia government has already ordered a review of the Freedom of Information Privacy legislation, and working groups are reported to deliver recommendations by spring of 2025. Why add new custodians now? I worry that our Nova Scotia government has not kept pace with technology and may not be able to provide appropriate privacy protections for yet another group of custodians. Patients have a right to informed consent when attempts are made to give custodians not in their circle of care access to their private health information. She goes on to say, but the most important piece is that the public continue to expect that conversations, including sensitive health care information, details of mental health diagnosis and trauma, be kept confidential between doctors, nurses and therapists unless required by law to save a life or with informed consent when deciding to share outside of their circle of care. I'd also like to table a letter that I received from the Minister of S uh, Cybersecurity and Digital Solutions Office of the Minister from July 24, 2023, after on behalf of a constituent I had made an inquiry about a security breach of personal health information here in the province. And the minister did acknowledge uh, in this letter that there was a security breach. And 
I wanted to table this today, Mr. Speaker, just as a reminder that we've already had significant security breach here in this province and changes have not been made since to ensure that this could not happen again or would not happen again. And it is a very important aspect when we're looking at bringing in legislation that um, would, would allow the minister or designate to have full access to people's personal health information. <coughs> Again, I applaud Carrie Smith for presenting at Law Amendments Committee because I believe when she shared from her personal experience, it really helped to see what can happen and the impact that that can have on someone's life. Let's talk for a moment about what types of things people share with their health care provider that potentially that information, well, based on this legislation, that information would be made available to the minister or a designate. The most personal things, affairs, marital affairs, STIs, depression, anxiety, life-threatening issues, family issues, and more. Do I think it would be a problem if this minister and this government had access to people's personal health information? Yes. Unfortunately, we all know in this room too well the dirty side of politics. A few months ago, in fact, I received a phone call from the clinic that I go to that, and to let me know that my paper medical file went missing. And my very first thought was someone probably stole it politically to try to use it against me. I know that's maybe going to stream, but that's based on the experience that I've had and the things that have been done to me, I've seen the dark side of politics and unfortunately had to experience them. So I don't think people should trust politicians to have their personal health information. Back a few years ago, it was actually the fall of 2021, uh, I had someone contact me to say that my Wikipedia page was, had been trashed. So my assistant at the time, Kate Saxton, she said, I'm going to take a look and do some investigation into it. And upon investigation, uh, they found that the IP address that had been used to make changes to my Wikipedia page had come from one gov place. So based on my lived experience, I don't think people should trust Order. government Order. to have their own. What's, uh, just to, to help me understand here, what part of the, the, the FMA are you talking about there? With Wikipedia, maybe you're, you're taking a, a longer way around, but... Uh, uh, okay, okay. I'll, rec I'll recognize the Honourable Member come to the North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, so I'm referring to the, per the uh, amendment to the uh, Personal Health Information Act that's being proposed to be amended and changed here in the FMA 119. And of course, this amendment gives the minister um, access, as well as a designate from the minister access, to people's personal health information. So that's what I'm speaking to. Sorry to make that clear. And I wanted just to share my, my personal experience and why I think people do have valid reasons to be concerned about this information being made available. So my two examples, my second one was my Wikipedia page, how it had actually been um, tampered with but through an IP address that was connected to one gov. But I digress. So let's go back to the very important presentations that were made at Law Amendments Committee. I'd like to table a couple of documents uh, and comments made by uh, clinicians. And I was first drawn attention to this, um, to this amendment that's being proposed in the FMA from uh, a physician in my community and uh, he's been practicing in uh, our Amherst area, gosh, I think for about 40, 45 years now. He's one of our most senior uh, physicians and specialists, and he uh, contacted me right away and said, this is not okay, this is a big concern. So I was very pleased to see the college uh, speak at law amendments to this bill on behalf of the physicians that they represent. <laughs> Uh, 
And Mr. Speaker, I'd like to just quote and highlight some of the, uh, the whole presentation was important, but I wanted to highlight a couple of the comments that they made. And this, of course, was made by Dr. Gus Grant from the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Nova Scotia. He was accompanied by a lawyer, David Frazier. And Dr. Gus Grant said, quote, if passed, Section 110 will fundamentally change the nature of the patient-doctor relationship and the professional duties of physicians. Going forward, this law requires all physicians to enable access to their medical records to the minister. For physicians, this creates a new professional legal duty. For patients, it means that the entirety of their medical records will be accessible to the government. The college supports the rights of patients to privacy and the duty of physicians to maintain confidentiality, which is a cornerstone of medicine. The obligation set out in Section 110 runs contrary to these rights and duties, or is, at the very least, in tension with them. As set out in the Medical Act, the, the object of the college is to regulate the practice of medicine in the public, in the public interest. To meet that mandate of acting in the public interest, I see it as the responsibility of the college to speak on behalf of the public, which I would expect is largely unaware of this seemingly innocuous amendment and its potential consequences. The Financial Measures Act, by name and substance, would seem to have little to do with the private matters members of the public have discussed with their physicians. He goes on to say, uh, I really, when I was listening to his presentation and law amendments, um, this next quote that I'm going to share really uh, hit home with me as I hear from many of the people that he was referencing. Quote, from my years in practice as a family physician, I can say with confidence that many of our most vulnerable patients are also among our most mistrusting of large institutions and government. This generalization might extend to members of many disadvantage, disadvantaged communities. The analogy could be drawn to our vaccination experience, where our most vulnerable and most disadvantaged were most disinclined to be vaccinated. I hope that there has been consultation with groups, such as the Mental Health Association, groups representing our trans and LGBT, LGBTQT patients, let alone our Indigenous, and African Nova Scotian communities. He goes on to say, how is a physician to respond to a patient who asks, can you tell me what will be done with my personal health information and who will have access to it now that you are required to disclose my information to the minister? That question goes to the heart of the therapeutic relationship between the physician and their patient. That relationship is built on trust and confidentiality. As matters presenting presently stand, a physician can do no more than say government is committed to working on developing answers to these questions. This answer puts that trusting relationship at risk. I'll also quote in his statement, we can also look to other jurisdictions to learn how concerns about greater access to personal health information can be mitigated. Alberta, for example, requires a privacy impact assessment related to the provincial electronic health record system that is subject, submitted to the Information and Privacy Commissioner. The entire electronic record, medical record system is overseen by a multidisciplinary data stewardship committee. And finally, I'd like to share these last comments. Has government consulted the Privacy Commissioner about this significant legislative amendment in Bill 419 that will require the release of patients' personal health information to the Minister? Have any recommendations from the Privacy Commissioner been considered in the form of safeguards that should accompany this legislation? So, there is much more in Dr. Gus Grant's presentation, but I did want to uh, really highlight those, those comments that I believe are uh, very, very important. I'd also like to share a couple of the comments made by Dr. Colin O'Dane, the president of Doctors Nova Scotia, again, representing the doctors of Nova Scotia. I found uh, their presentation, they were being a little more cautious, I think, trying to maintain 
a positive relationship with the government while also trying to represent the views of the people that actually pay their dues and who they're paid to represent. So if the, I thought I found the, their presentation a little wishy-washy, but I will highlight a couple of the comments they said. While we're supportive of patients having better access to their health information, physicians are concerned about how the information could be used by the government and for what purpose. As physicians, we're responsible for protecting patients health information and the confidentiality inherent in the therapeutic relationship between physicians and patients. And then they go on to say, although we're confident in this government's intentions, we recognize that these legislative changes will have impacts for decades to come. While we support putting patient health information directly in patients' hands, we are concerned with the broad nature of the legislation and the authority it provides the minister and every minister thereafter to make regulations that may or may not include the safeguards we plan to have in place through the governance framework and standing committee agreed to. We'd like to see greater protection within the legislation, not regulations, to ensure the legacy of this government's intentions and the safeguards that will be in place to be honored in the future. And then they, they went on to uh, make an actual recommendation to for an amendment to this to this piece of legislation. So I think it's important, hopefully everyone had a chance to either listen to law amendments, attend law amendments, or read through all the submissions that were made on that day. Mr. Chair, I want to also uh, share with the House information that's available through Canada Health InfoWay. I think it's very, really important to um, to look at what the experts in this field are saying in hopes that we could uh, take this information and improve legislation for personal health information here in Nova Scotia. So the first thing I'd like to do, Mr. Chair, is read the definition of personal health information as, what, as per what Canada Health InfoWay um, defines. Personal health information is identifying information about an individual in oral or recorded form if the information relates to the physical or mental health of the individual, including but not limited to medical history, including family health history, health services received, payments for health services provided, information that relates to payments or eligibility for health care or for coverage for health care information related to the donation of any body part or bodily substance or derived from the testing or examination of any such body part or bodily substance. Healthcare provider's identity. And this definition may also include general information about you, such as your name, address, gender, and date of birth, as this information is usually collected during the provision of health service or in payment for health service and can be linked to your health information. So just in case not everyone understands what we're talking about here when we're talking about this personal health information would be fully disclosed to the minister or to anyone that the minister designates. When reading through Canada Health InfoWay document on ensuring adequate and proper inter interoperability of data systems, they talk throughout the document about the importance of privacy considerations. In their document, they also highlight the Canadian Medical Association is currently developing policy guidance on health information governance, and that proposes moving to a framework that includes pan-Canadian standards for health information exchange, improved access, and enhanced use, quality, private, privacy, security, and data integrity. Clear and practical rules would promote a common playing field for competitors and innovators to develop digital health innovations and maximize the potential benefits of health information. The document also goes on to talk about um, focusing on the sharing of personal health information. And it says, quote, the key is recognizing the imperative of upholding privacy obligations, while at the same time maximizing benefits of sharing patient information. 
While interoperability's benefits are well understood and recognized, challenges remain with respect to data sharing within and across jurisdictions. Challenges commonly reported by the provinces and territories include concerns about consent, the potential for unauthorized access to patient information, identity theft, and accuracy of the, of the information, etc. While some of these challenges or risks are not unique to the context of health system interoperability, they nonetheless bring increased data flowing, data sharing, and data flows, necessitating the protection of personal health information in multiple locations and forms for many different custodians, organizations, or care providers. And the personal experience that I shared earlier when I had my clinic, uh, that information was kept uh, within our portal, within our um, physical space. But even uh, that small experience, Mr. Speaker, as administrator, administrator of the system, I had a responsibility to ensure that there was, that no one was breaching confidentiality. So for example, uh, people have different uh, rights to the information. So front desk staff, they would have access to patient demographic information, but they didn't have access to the patient's personal health information. So now what this uh, Canada Health Info Way is talking about when you're looking at sharing of information, personal health information across systems, such as from a family doctor's office through to hospitals and government, that uh, it's, you have to have even greater privacy protections in place. Canada Health Info Way also um, talks about the importance of looking at the, the federal, the national standards for Let's get this right. For the principles of personal health information protection and electronic documents act. And I want to read, I won't read through all 10 principles, but I will read principle three, and that is consent. The knowledge and consent of the individual are not re are required, sorry, for the collection, use, or disclosure of personal information, except where inappropriate. Note, consent may be implied or expli explicit. For further guidance, please refer to the applicable legislation governing the jurisdiction where the solution is being implemented. So consent is um, important. And I know the minister last night in her comments to this bill did stand in the House and say that consent, that people can withdraw, but that's not actually in legislation. And we can be reassured that things will be put in regulations but what we have to vote on here in this legislature is what is before us. We have no control over the regulations, and we all know that regulations can be changed. So we need to make sure that what we're voting on is something that we all support, and if we don't support or can't support, that we, we have to vote against. And as the legislation currently stands before us, there is no protection at all of people's personal health information. Canada Health Info Way, in talking about consent, it also states um, for privacy readiness considerations that have all consent provisions been adequately considered to ensure the patient's consent. Obtaining informed consent to the collection, use and disclosure of personal information is foundational to Canadian privacy laws both federally, provincially, and territorially. They also go on to talk about the importance of transparency and openness and ask the questions when, you're, when, when governments are preparing this. Are patients informed about the solution and what it means for them about their personal health information? And there was no public consultation, there was no public education on this piece of legislation that's before us. And in fact, there was no transparency as the bill, the amendment to the, this uh, act was put inside of an omnibus bill, sort of tucked inside. So that in and of itself actually creates and leads to even more distrust of what is the government um, trying to do. So transparency and openness is one of the foundational principles that Canada Health InfoWay talk about as governments move towards interoperability of data systems 
to enable patients to have access to their to their personal record to their personal health records. So transparency and openness. Are patients made aware of the options and their choices? Are they informed that they may change their mind at another time? Have measures been established to ensure overall transparency with patients and their health care providers? Given Canada's digital charter principle four, transparency, portability, interoperability, will Canadians have clear and manageable access to their personal data? And are they free to share or transfer it with undue, without undue burden? Is a privacy notice made available? Ideally, it will describe the personal health information collected and the purposes for which it is being collected. Describing the activities that impact personal health information, including collection, creation, storage, use, maintenance, sharing, and disposal of personal health information. Describe all the internal uses of personal health information. Describe how the organization processes personal health information and provides contact information for questions or complaints. All of these things are expected to be shared through transparency and openness from governments. And there also must be shared a way for patients to withdraw. Are individuals made aware that they may withdraw consent in the future? And do opportunities exist to withdraw previously shared personal health information? That was one of my questions when I spoke to the bill before. If the government does not listen to uh, the voices of shared at, at law amendments committee or the voices of the people we represent here in opposition, then uh, when will this personal health information that's going to be shared, is it retroactive? Will it be as of a certain date or is, will it be uh, into history? I think that the public deserves to have these questions answered. And then the last thing I'll mention about Canada Health's InfoWay document, they emphasize the importance of privacy commissioners being involved in all legislation and governance dealing with uh, personal health information and the use of electronic medical records. Sorry. Considering uh, Mr. Chair, the mistrust that people do have of government and of politicians, and I wish it wasn't that way, but it is a fact. This is not a time to be pushing through legislation that removes confidentiality of people's personal health information. The optics of this, that the government is trying to slip this change through under the radar, Again, that is of great concern and in and, in and of itself upsetting at a time when there's already growing distrust of government. So in conclusion, Mr. Speaker, I want to reiterate, I am requesting the Minister of Finance to repeal this section of Bill 419 and ask the Department of Health and Wellness to prepare a new piece of legislation, a new bill that is robust, that is comprehensive, that will ensure proper governance structure allowing patients to have access to their electro electronic medical records, all while ensuring the privacy of their personal health information as well as patient confidentiality. I believe that this new bill must include planning with Canada Health InfoWay, the Privacy Commissioner for Nova Scotia, the Nova Scotia Regulated Health Professions Network, the College of Physicians and Surgeons, and nonpartisan consultation with the public. Also, given that Nova Scotia residents receive patient care through a maritime network of healthcare professionals, the governance of this new piece of legislation of confidential patient information and electronic medical records should be done in collaboration with fellow maritime provinces and incorporate policies with Canada Health InfoWay using a pan Canadian approach. Children, families, and expectant mothers from all over the Maritimes receive care at the IWK, and this must be considered. As well, all, no all Nova Scotians receive health care in other provinces from time to time, most especially the residents that I represent in Cumberland County. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I recognize the honorable member for Coal Harbor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wasn't going to speak 
but um, I do have some concerns, major concerns actually, with Clause 1 and Section 110 of the Financial Measures Act. Individual personal health data. Here's my dilemma. Doctors and government all having this conversation without engaging and consulting those that this will directly affect. I am going to read an email that I received last evening, uh, that I received late last evening from a constituent of mine who was, is concerned with this, and I will table it. The email reads, I have strong concerns about this bill. My information between me and my doctor is no one's business but mine. It is pretty sad when governments try to bully their way into things that they are that there are none of their business. You won't even adhere to the doctor's concerns. You should be ashamed to call yourself a health minister. And I do believe, Minister, uh, Mr. Chair, that the minister did get this email because the only reason why I'm reading this, it was, it was addressed to me and the health minister. So, um, you call yourself a health If you were a good one, you would listen to the doctor's recommendations. They are the professionals. You were just a person appointed to the position, which right now I see as a bully trying to wield your power. Order, order. I'm re just Just because it's in a letter doesn't mean that you, if, if there's some parliamentary language that's within a letter, it doesn't mean that you can read it still on parliamentary. I'll leave and, that part of it. I apologize. And you're, the letter is it's borderline, so just before you, just be careful, that's all. And uh, I'd ask you to retract that. I recognize the Honourable Member Cole Harbour. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll retract it. It will be tabled, and the Minister has it already, I believe. So, I will stop then there because uh, I'll leave you with the last statement in this email. I do not give you permission to access my personal health records at any time. So, that is one individual, and I normally wouldn't read those emails if they come in a bulk, Mr. Chair, but that was directly emailed to me and to the minister. So, as I've said, I've got concerns. I've got concerns like everyone else in here who's mentioned those concerns. We've had, everybody who has spoken to this has highlighted many, many points of concern about this piece within the Financial Measures Act. Now, my concerns, concerns stem from a few things which I will bring to you now. One, I'm from a community that has had documented history and concerns with trust. 
within the health care system and many other systems that are systemically been set up to leave us out of this conversation. I have members in my community who have worked in the health care system for generations and those individuals have been championing for more than 30 years the collection of desegregated data for our community. At this point, I have no idea where the health system is moving in that direction because in this place, that's not even being discussed. I have concerns because the rights to patients' privacy at this point, in this juncture right now, should not be debated. My personal information is my personal information. Mr. Chair, this move without having those discussions and especially with Indigenous and African Nova Scotian individuals about their personal records takes me back to a Jim Crow area, era, takes me back to the Tuskegee experiment. This can't be done in 2024. Mr. Chair, I am truly disappointed, concerned about this action. I find that we're being asked again, and I'm going with the word trust, we're being asked to trust. I find that the word trust is often used by people in power or in positions of power, I should say, and those individuals may not have experienced marginalization at all. So, you're an individual who's in a position of power. You are not engaging me or having those discussions with me about something that's personal to me. And then you're asking me to trust? Mr. Chair, there was already trust broken when we, all of us in here, and many across the province, personal information was already breached. And it's been silent. There's been no discussion around what has happened in that incident. incident. We've been referred to a third party. So now you want to take my personal information and expect me to trust you when there are all kinds of things outside of this that can infiltrate and access that information all kinds of ways. And you're not even, and what's not even being done is reassuring me that there's a system in place 
that can prevent what has already happened from happening again. Mr. Chair, I'm not going to stand up here and go through because a number of my colleagues throughout the House have already raised a number of concerns and highlighted people outside. And here is the other side of it. We all know that most Nova Scotians today, you can slide this through any time because most Nova Scotians today are so concerned with affordability, trying to live, trying to deal, trying to get a doctor, trying to get access. And then you're going to tell me that I should trust you with my personal information. This is ludicrous. I would ask that government, at least when it comes to this, take a pause. Pull it back. Engage. Because, as I've said, you've got communities, Mr. Chair, who are not comfortable with the current system as it is. And you're asking Trust us, we'll get it right. Well, there is a number of examples already shown in this session that we should have trusted you would get it right and, and things had to be readjusted. So if, you, if that can be done, then we need to take a moment there is a lot of discussion around this. We're talking about something that is very, very sensitive that I can't even believe we're having this debate. So, Mr. Chair, I'm going to end with this. I ask that you at least, when it comes to this piece, of the Financial Measures Act to ensure that you at least give Nova Scotians the opportunity to trust you by pulling back. And if you can't do that, then blank, blank, blank your piece of legislation. <laughs>
depending on their, their critic roles, is, is beyond reason. It truly is beyond reason. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I mean, we have a DCS, Municipal Affairs, Mun uh, Municipal Affairs and Housing, uh, we, ha we have health, and uh, so on and so on and so on. All in the Financial Measures Act. What I do not understand, and what nobody from the government side has been able to tell me is why? Why not bring these pieces, of, I mean, these pieces of legislation forward? I mean, look, Mr. Speaker, what, three pieces of legislation? Three pieces of legislation this government brought for, before us to debate in this House. And they couldn't bring more? This government could not bring all these pieces of legislation before the House separately? Why not? It's shameful. It is absolutely shameful and to me it's pitiful because we could have had robust discussions, robust debate on all of these bills. But it, and these are important bills. This is not, these aren't just small, little, tiny, um, housekeeping, matter of fact issues. These are major issues in this bill. These are major amendments that are being brought forward, and yet this government is hiding all of it in the FMA. It's, it's buried deep. Now, I, I am not, you know, we're, we're politicians here. We, 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 we we read legislation for a living. But the average Nova Scotian is not going to be able to look, see the FMA and think, I wonder what's in here that I really need to pay attention to. But it seems like everything but the kitchen sink is in here. I don't know, maybe the kitchen sink is. I, 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 I haven't been able to uh, go that deep into it. But I, I think it needs to be stated. I think it's really important that we state the fact that this is a bill before us, an omnibus bill, that we don't often see here in Nova Scotia. This is American politics, not, can, not, not how we do things here. This government brought us into the legislature to do the business of Nova Sco for Nova Scotians. And yet they brought three pieces of legislation and then hid every other piece of important information in this one bill. It's absurd. I have other words for it, but I probably deemed it parliamentary. So I'm going to focus on a few. The establishment of, of an office for children and youth, a youth commission, is long overdue. It is something that could have been celebrated. Yes, are, there, thi are there, there things that we would like to see put into that bill? Of course, because what we want to see is a bill made stronger. But we could have celebrated this. Instead, it was hidden in the FMA, in, the, in a schedule. This could have been a separate piece of legislation. This should have been a separate piece of legislation. And of course, you know, as much as we celebrate finally having this long overdue bill, there are issues that we, still, we have. There are no timelines attached. There's no money attached. It's in the FMA and there's no money attached to the bill. Again, it's absurd. In, in, the part, in this part of the bill, in this part of the FMA, with regards to the Bill on Children and Youth Commission, there's no mention of the commissioner being independent. And when I say independent, I mean independent of the House of Assembly. 
the government. Now, the minister told us in estimates, assured us in estimates, that the commissioner would and the, would, and the commission would be independent. But it's not stated that clear in the in in this bill in the FMA. And I think a bill as important as the Child and Youth Commission, a, a bill that has been long awaited for by advocates, by people in this House, deserved more than just being in the back of the FMA. It deserved much more, and the people, the advocates deserved much more than having this in the FMA. And the children and youth that this is going to affect and be important to going forward deserved better than it being put in the FMA. And it deserved more robust uh, discussion and and I, a change of ideas going back and f back and f back and forth. It deserved that. It deserved the time. It deserved more time than what it's going to be given because it's here in the FMA, and that is, uh, to me, that's very sad and disappointing because it's something we could have had really great discussions on and really great exchanging of ideas. With respect to um, the issue, the parts of here that affect the municipal, uh, the MGA, the Municipal Governments Act, as well as the HRM Charter. Aspects of this, there's aspects of, of this bill, part of this, in this part, I do have concerns about as, myself after reading it. So as I, when I was a, back to my counselor days, um, you know, we, uh, we, I was very much involved and I very much advocated while I was in council, along with several other colleagues, that more was needed, and I'm sure the member for uh, Sydney member two would have these conversations as well, more was needed to ensure public engagement. Um, more was needed to, in, to uh, allow for people to know when public hearings were taking place. I'm sure the member for, you know, I'm sure that you as the chair would know this quite well also from your background. But what I'm seeing in this bill really is moving notices of the public hearing to online with not the requirement for newspaper. I, I consider that dangerous, actually. It limits pu the public's ability to know when a municipal public hearing is going to take place. Not everyone is online. And not everyone is literate while they're online. No. <laughs> The member for Halifax Shabbatko agrees that no, not everyone is literate while online. There are not many people, we have lots of seniors in our communities who are active po politically, who are engaged in their community, and they get their information from the newspaper. They hear about public hearings from the newspaper, and to, t and to take that requirement out severely limits their ability to participate in the democratic process. And I think anything that restricts residents from participating in the democratic process, it, it needs to be re-examined and actually should be taken out of the bill because I still don't know why, where this came, I don't understand where this came from, because I, I know from my community, there would be, if people knew about this, there probably would be great pushback. Uh, knowing, knowing, my, knowing residents from my community um, who get upset if their letter does not meet the actual notice deadlines, uh, you, get, you get calls, you get emails. <laughs> So for that, I, 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 my fear is that this would limit many people's ability to know about, about public hearings. Uh, clause 29 uh, and 75, with regards to the MGA and HRM Charter, will allow for the sale or lease of property at below market prices by removing an existing restriction 
that limits such, such action, with the exception for nonprofits. Chair, I, I feel this could also be a dangerous, slippery slope with the potential for abuse. Now, I'm not saying there would be abuse. I'm not saying anyone in any council at this moment would abuse it. I am saying that there is potential for it to occur. <coughs> I don't know what where it came from. I don't know why it's urgent. It's not something I ever remember having discussions about, and that wasn't that long ago. But whether that's here nor there, it doesn't matter. What matters is the public, who this is going to affect, doesn't really have a chance to get to really understand the, the concept or how it could affect them. Because there's not been a robust discussion here on the floor of this house. I'm, there's a theme here, Mr. Chair. There's a theme that, is, uh, that has uh, uh, availed itself to us, and that is the limitation of the democratic process and the limitation of our ability to represent constituents, the ability for constituents to provide feedback on these bills. This severely lim limits the ability for the democratic process to occur. And I do not understand why a government is looking to hinder that. Maybe they don't realize that that's happening, and that's probably, that could be true. They don't know that that's, what's, that that's what it could appear to be. But it's happening because we have not been able to have the robust discussions that we need to have on these bills. We have not been able to debate them in, in a manner that they are due that respect. And another concern that I have, and I share it with, with many of my, with my colleagues here in the NDP and with my colleagues in the Liberal Caucus, and it's the crooks of the issue within the FMA. It's the major issue that many of us are having with, within the FMA, and that is the amendment to the Personal Health Information Act. This amendment would allow the Department of Health, uh, of Health and the minister the ability to see personal files with doctors being able um, to provide the information to, to a health app or another electronic system. Chair, I, I spoke to this with some of my colleagues, and so and so and I think it's fairly public. I don't know, but a number of years ago, I had two miscarriages, and I went on CBC to discuss my miscarriages because I felt it was important. But I also want to discuss my miscarriages and talk about my experience in the healthcare system at that time. The next night on CBC, two doctors went on radio from Nova Scotia Health who discussed my file. They referenced my file. These doctors never treated me. I had never been seen by these doctors, not once. But they referenced my file on CBC radio. Uh, and they were asked to go on CBC radio, is my understanding, from Nova Scotia Health. These doctors gained access to my file they had no business looking at, and they certainly had no business commenting on publicly. That was my file. My doctors had a right to my look at, see my file, but nobody had a right to access it publicly. 
So when my colleagues talk about the fact that personal information could be leaked, could be going out publicly, should go fall in the wrong hands, it's not fear-mongering. It's happened. I'm one it's happened to. There was fa when I reported this breach, there was fa I reported a few breaches, and when I reported it, they came back to me and said they found a few more breaches of, of my privacy. This is not an, a concept that people are just saying, what if this happens? It's already happened. Why are we making it easier for it to happen? Why, would a, why does this government want to make it easier for this to happen to our constituents? <coughs> Accessing files and, inf and personal information. We already have the, we already get data. We sh what we should be doing is ensuring more privacy for patients, for Nova Scotians. Because when your file has been breached, you feel violated. It's, on, it's, the most, it's one of the most unnerving feelings I think I, I, I'd had. I, I felt very vulnerable that these people had accessed my file. They had no business accessing. And so my concerns on, on this amendment to the Personal Health Information Act, I believe are valid based on experience. I believe what my colleagues the, the concerns that they've brought forward are valid based on experiences, whether in Nova Scotia, whether across Canada, whether in the United States. The fact of the matter is, while people may trust one Minister of Health or, or trust one government, that does not mean the same people are always going to be there. And it doesn't always mean that everyone's going to have the best of intentions. We can't rely on that. So I am going to implore this government. They have the time, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chair. They have time right now. We are giving them the time at this moment to change their minds, take this part of the FMA out. Remove it. There is still time. Take the time and listen and take this piece of the FMA out. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member, City Member too. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, take a few minutes um, just to make a few points uh, about the, the FMA. Um, and uh, a lot of a lot of talk. I don't want to, you know, repeat too much. I just uh, give my two cents. Then we can move on to the next speaker. Um, so, so I've had the opportunity to talk about the FMA already, um, and uh, of course, there's things in it that we like. Um, there's things in it that uh, that um, we agree with. Um, uh, the youth advocate is something that's uh, very important um, to to me and to our caucus and my colleagues from the NDP, uh, as been said tonight. Um, but I'll say that during estimates, when uh, I was asking the questions to the department, you know, ideally, if you're going to put this in to a bill like this, you would have some details that you would be able to provide uh, about the staffing complement, what the department looks like, you know, how you go through the process of selecting uh, who the individual will be. 
and um, we never, I never received any answers on it. So it, 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 it rose some red, some red flags for me uh, in regards to um, in regards to the youth advocate. But that's okay. You know, that, that's that's part of the estimates process, and you know, it helps us guide uh, you know how we how we make decisions in here, uh, whether you're, you're on the government side or in opposition. So, um, you know, I, we'll continue to press. We'll continue to uh, you know uh, pursue answers from the department when it comes to what. Uh, that is, but again, it really goes to the foundation of what really the concerns you hear uh, from from the opposition when you have a bill like this, and you have a bill that has a number of different pieces within it from different departments, uh, and um, you're looking for answers. And uh, some of it is very celebratory, in my opinion. I think that the government actually should have pulled it out and, and did. I would be advising that uh, from a legislative perspective. Like, why would you? It's such a good move to have a youth advocate uh, in our uh, in the province, uh, something that everybody agrees with. So why why would you put it in a bill like this that uh, it contains a number of different uh, departments that you know some some things may be in common, but for the most part they're not. So uh, I, I just don't understand the rationale of of that, um, especially where. You know, it was indicated that the you know the premier said it in his comments that we were going to be here for two or three months. So um, why not pull it out, have a, a fulsome debate, especially a debate on things that we all agree with? That's what I that's what I don't understand. It's like that is a good thing. Like why not put that in its own separate legislation, and we can all celebrate the government bringing it forward and bringing constructive uh, feedback uh, to what the department could look like and. And provide um, provide some uh, advice, uh, and and have a healthy debate, and have uh, law amendments specific to a bill of that nature. Uh, that's why lump it in with everything else. Um, I, I don't think that that's a really good political strategy. It's not about po this is more about our children than politics. Don't get me wrong, but I, I'm surprised that the government would want to lump that in with uh, everything else. And now what's happening is you're seeing. Uh, and, and I talk about the foundation of, of uh, the FMA. What you're seeing is uh, pieces have been pulled back. And you see the fire department, uh, th th that issue pulled back um, because, frankly, just not enough research was done on it by, by whoever suggested that goes into the bill. So you're, the government is forced to pull that back because you run into problems, right? So, so I use that as one example. So it's like, so now I, I feel like it devalues the FMA in the sense that you brought an FMA forward with all of these, this package deal, uh, and now good things like the Child and Youth Advocate uh, Office is mixed into that. And it, like, like, for example, today, the minister got up and talked about uh, freezing income assistance, or, or sorry, indexing income assistance, sorry, sorry, indexing income assistance to inflation. I'm just, yeah, <laughs> but 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 the point being is that so he so the minister gets on his feet and he says that and they celebrate it. We all celebrate it. It's something that we all advocated for. So why not do that with the youth advocate? That's an important decision, right? That's something that will impact children uh, and the supports that whoever is on the government side, whatever political stripe you're on, um, that's going to play an important part uh, of, of, the, of, of, of children's journey as they go forward. They're going to have an advocate. So why not celebrate that, carve that out, do it the right way? But it's in this bill, and when we asked the department for information, we couldn't get any. So it, it just raises red flags when you could have done it which I think is the right way. And then, of course, you run into the, the issue around the, 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 the fire, um, and uh, that uh, is a problem because, you know, volunteer fire departments and career uh, fire departments were involved in that conversation, so now they're looking for answers. Um, when, again, that could have been a separate bill that could have been debated uh, correctly, we could have had that conversation, and, and government uh, may have been able to to find a path forward for that. But it's lumped into this bill that, um, unfortunately, it's pulled out now. The, you know, for whatever reasons, uh, it has to be. Um, but why why put it in a bill with 
child and youth advocate or put it in a bill with health or put, like I just it doesn't I, I, I think that the, there was a strategy for the government to put us all this together so you know when we're trying to decide what to support and what not to support it's all in one bill and as I said there's lots of really positive things that are that are there and uh, it's unfortunate and you know here we are talking about it uh, in the night um, and people have been pretty passionate about it uh, and for me I, I just kind of want to talk about the health information stuff and and again it goes back to what I've been talking about and uh, you know I've always said a, you know, I believe I've had a good relationship with the minister we have our debates on the floor I believe that uh, she you know she she She's helped me with some 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 issues at home. Uh, I, I gave her credit the other day for uh, the the work and and her going back uh, on behalf of a resident from Cape Breton around uh, reconstructive surgery uh, for breast cancer survivors. So so you know th there's always relationships whether you're on whatever side of the floor you're on. It was very similar for us when we were on the government side. Uh, lots of people have been around here a long time. Uh, and uh, you make friendships and you collaborate and you debate and sometimes it gets more heated than it should and uh, You know, that's part of it uh, There's a lot of history in this place uh, some of it uh, I think at times you know, I got physical ones mr. Speaker way back when we didn't we never want that um, But in this case, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna use the government line and be a solutionist uh, And I'm going to like I just don't understand so, and it goes back a couple of years. So you go back, Mr. Speaker, to the non-resident tax. That was an issue. <coughs> MLAs, of course, on the government side and the opposition came forward, and there was concerns. So the government listened to those concerns uh, and changed course. They made a decision. It wasn't the right decision. And it, 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 we all know it was pretty, it was pretty heated by, by folks. So then you go look at the current issue around wine. And you have the winery that was very upset, and I'm, I'm getting to the FMA. The point is at the, the FMA. So, so you you get, you get to that point where you see people who have been in the industry for years contribute. You know, the industry contributes hundreds of millions of dollars to our province. Uh, it's it's really a wonderful story how the wine sector, uh, um, uh, how the wine sector has grown here. Uh, everybody supports that success and this change that was coming was a massive problem for the industry and for stakeholders that are involved with the industry so the government under a lot of pressure under a lot of pressure makes the decision to change course so there's there's a, there's a trend right so now we're in a situation where the people who look after us, the medical professionals across the province, the doctors who look after all of us and our families and every family uh, that they can in their communities, ambassadors for good health, public health, are telling the government, we have a problem with this as the people who look after the people of this province that advocate for their health and well-being, that support their health and well-being, that support the key infrastructure that we need, to support the programs that we need, to give Nova Scotians the healthiest lifestyle they can. Preventative health, and the list goes on and on and on. So these people look after us. These are the people we go to when we have an ailment or it's more serious. These are the people that save lives. They save lives. These are people that are world-renowned in their professions. These are people that are trying to recruit doctors into our province and recruit medical professionals. These are the ones that are coming forward day in and day out to look after us. And they're telling the government, we have a problem. There's a fundamental, a politician should never have access to people's personal information, let alone their health records. And, you know, members have been saying this all night, but I'm, I'm, I'm just making the connection. I do not understand 
They pulled back on the wine. They pulled back on the residence tax. They pulled back on the fire department, the, the fire uh, labor issue. And the doctors are coming forward. And they're saying, this is a massive red flag for us. So let's dig in. Does that make sense, Mr. Speaker? It doesn't make sense. You're at the point, as my colleague said, you're at the point of this process where you can make the change. And the doctors would celebrate it. And they would probably want to sit down with you and have a conversation about how to do it right. That's really, at the, fundamentally, that's where we're at. And the government has done this time and time again and we happily call out. And when we were in government, we backtracked on stuff too. Okay. Pharmacare, everybody remembers Pharmacare, right? That was, that was the, as I want to provide examples from different levels, from different political stripes, because like, I'm not coming at this trying to be combative with the government. There's a solution to this. And I'm trying to be a solutionist, Mr. Speaker. They like that word. They do, they like that word, you know what? I, uh, it's, it's, and, and there's, and there's, there's, like the NDP went through it with the Yarmouth Ferry and HST and all this. Like we can go and talk about this forever. But in all of the ones that you don't pull back, this one, the one that Nova Scotians are, like I've talked about the budget all week with people at home. And the same theme comes up. It's like, why should a politician, and again, I said this, I'm, I'm the minister, uh, I, I forgot, a, I almost broke a rule. I almost broke a rule, I did, I did. But it was a, it was a, it was a compliment, but it was, I almost broke a rule, and I didn't. But, go back and talk to them. Bring it back in the fall, right? Maybe we're going to the poll, I don't know, we'll see what happens with the fall, but, but the point is, is that you pulled back for the wineries because they had a problem. You pulled back on the fire piece because there was a problem. You pulled back on the, res the non-residence tax because there was a problem. Stakeholders came forward. They had issues with it. And the government's like, you know what, we're going to pull back and we're going to reevaluate this. Why not talk to the doctors like you talked to the winery, like you talked to the people who had concerns their own properties all over the place in Cape Breton? I just, I don't understand why you would dig in on the doctors. Like, that's what I don't understand. And it's, 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 we don't, like for me, I would be so, I think it's the easiest piece of this that's the most important. Privacy to people matters more, in my opinion, than any, well, family, and the ability to protect your privacy in a world which we've seen where there's been breaches, whether it's been with the government or whether it's been in the private sector. I've seen it with my own insurance. You've seen it, the insurance companies are breached, the, the banks are breached, the whole nine yards. People are very leery of anybody today having their personal information. It's probably one of the biggest conversations, one of the biggest challenges, new challenges that governments all over in any jurisdiction are going to have. And people at home and people across the province are saying to me that, well, Derek, I like you, but you, you shouldn't have access to my personal health records. And it's like, no, I shouldn't have access to your personal health. I don't, want, I don't consent to giving my personal health records out. I don't consent to it. And that's the point. Give people consent. That's what people ultimately want. I don't consent to it. I don't. And I know thousands of other people that don't and thousands of other people that won't. So again, I'm, this is not me trying to be combative about this because there's a real solution to this. And it starts with having a conversation with the doctors that came forward, that came forward at law amendments. That, that are continuously talking in the media about this concern. And the government's like, no, we're moving forward and we're here at uh, 8.19 on Wednesday night uh, talking about the FMA. 
when arguably I think we don't have to be here if they would pull this out. I, uh, if, if, of, any, of any of this stuff, this is, this is the one, Mr. Speaker, that for me, uh, I can't consent to it. It is a, there's lots of things in budgets that, that are there that are important that are good. But I can't, with my own conscience, sit here and not say what I'm saying right now, but also support the fact when I got hundreds of people who are talking about this at home saying, I don't want a politician to have my personal medical information. That is big. That negates a lot of goodwill that comes out of your budget. That one issue, that one issue, if that's not here, people would be very happy. Not happy, I'd, I'd, they'd be more comfortable knowing that like, hey, <coughs> The doctors are talking to the government about this. They're, they're aware of what's happening right now. I, I talk to people about the app. You know, there's, we talk about that another day. But like people just don't want politicians to have access to medical records. And again, minister, I don't question the minister's uh, her, her honesty and her integrity or any, any of that. I, I've had, I, she's doing the best she can under that. But like, why not just talk about this with the doctors? That's it. Talk, talk to the doctors. And uh, I, think, I think you'd be, I think that they would, well, of course they would welcome it. Of course they would welcome it. And of course, I think it's the right thing to do. It's people's personal information. That's all people want. They want their personal information protected, and when they feel like, and when they, they see, and when they feel like, oh my God, like who's gonna have access to my personal medical records? Of course they're gonna ask questions. But there's a solution. Give people consent. Give them consent to do it. And you know what? People will consent. They'll, they'll, give, they'll give consent, but others won't. And you have to respect that. We have to respect that in a, wor a, tech a world full of technology where people are scared to click a button. People are getting random text messages about their Canada Post package arriving and sign up here and you can pick it up. We all got them, right? Like they, they exist. But this is, unfortunately, this is the world that we live in. And so people are going to be very hesitant uh, to, to want that information out there, but the doctors who look after everyone are saying, this isn't right. Like, why not pull this one back and talk to them about it and get it right? And then if you come to a conclusion with the doctors, then bring it back. But like, to dig in on this one, I don't, I don't understand. It... Uh, I, I just, I just don't get, I don't get it because because the government has pulled back on things that were important to stakeholders across the province, and uh, we've seen it multiple times. And this one, this one's coming from the, from the like I said, the people who look after us want to have a conversation, so pull back and have a conversation with them, and I think the government will be in a better s state of uh, opinion with people who are messaging all of us, they're talking about, I don't want to give out my personal medical information to anyone but my doctor. So with those words, Mr. Speaker, I'll take my place. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Mr. Speaker, I, I rise in a point of order. It's the first uh, chance that I've had to, uh, to do that. Um, I'm learning as we go through here, but today I stood in, I sit in this house as a woman, as a minister, <clears throat> as a new politician, and I had a member opposite read an email that tried to dis diminish me mm -hmm. as a person, as a minister, as a female in this house, and that individual then said blank, blank, blank your bill, and the whole opposition clapped. So I am trying to pass a bill here that is trying to get hand, uh, personal health information into the hands of individuals 
and to help me manage the health care system. I could read an abusive email and then was told a blank, 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 and the whole opposition clapped. And I feel that that diminished me as a person in this, in this chamber, and I don't think it was fair, and I don't think it should go unnoticed in this House. And ap apparently, I have to ask for an apology because that's what you have to do. I would ask the member is, what the rule was that was breached. Was it the unparliamentary language? Or I recognize, sorry, I recognize the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Yes, I guess it was the unparliamentary language that was used in this House. Yeah. Recognize the Honourable Premier. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. And as we as we know, as as members of this House, you know, sometimes an actual word itself in isolation might not be might not be unparliamentary, but the context in when it's used, and clearly telling a minister to blank 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 a bill, I, I don't think there's any world where that can be can be seen appropriate. Uh, certainly, wouldn't be appropriate walking down Barrington Street to stop the minister and say that to her. Uh, definitely is not appropriate in this house. And uh, I would certainly support the minister in the request to have that member stand on their feet and show a bit of human decency and apologize and retract those words. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, I'll be, I'll be honest, I, I struggled with that when, when the, the exchange happened, and, but, but uh, through consultation, um, blank, 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 I mean, it could be, it could be anything. Um, and it, uh, for that reason, that's, that's why I didn't call it at, at the time. We take it down and out here. Okay. Clause one. Carry. Shall clause one carry? Carry. Carried. Shall clauses two to nine carry? Carry. Carried. Clause ten. Carry. I recognize the honourable member from Clare. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I won't be too long. Um, I just have, I bring your attention to Lib 1. Uh, so I'll, I'll read the amendment, if that's fine. Uh, page 3, clause 10, delete and substitute the following clause. 10 one, subsection 1161 of Chapter 25 of the Acts of 1996, the Fisheries and Coastal Resources Act as amended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 1999, is further amended by striking out not exceeding 100,000 and substituting of not less than 100,000 and no more than 1 million. And 2, subsection 116.3 of Chapter 25, as amended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 1999, is further amended by striking out $100,000 and no more than $500,000 and substituting $250,000 and no more than $2 million. So the, the amendment proposed in the FMA essentially did increase the fines um, from 100 to uh, $1 million for the first offence, Mr. Speaker. 
and 500,000 to 2 million dollars for the first offense which i support what but the the uh it is in the uh, fma it also proposes that it eliminates the 100 thousand dollar minimum fine for the second offense so um, in speaking I've had a multiple calls from industry associations I have to ad <coughs> excuse me I have to admit that there wasn't a consensus on exactly what they were seeking but one thing they were all pretty consistent on is they'd like to see a minimum fine so uh, I, I've proposed that um, I think what the the organizations feels as the court have been quite reluctant, Mr. Speaker, of uh, levying fi substantial fines. So the industry would like the amendment, the, the FMA or the changes to the FMA to be, uh, try to push the, uh, the courts, I guess. To, so with that, I mean, the things that, lo that associations are looking for is more enforcement, minimum fines, um, and this, again, we support, we do support uh, the increase in the maximum uh, fine. I think that's, that's what the industry was calling for. And I think, uh, uh, and in fairness to the minister, I did have conversations with him prior to bringing forth this amendment. Uh, he did raise there might be some issues with minimum fines, but I felt it was important to, li to listen to the industry and bring forward an amendment on their behalf. As uh, the, the law, all, all the industry is very important to all Nova Scotia. So, with that, I'll, I'll take my seat. Shall amendment Lib 1 carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Um, clause, clause 10. So clause 10 carried. Carried. Clauses 11 to 28 carried. 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 Clause 29. Carried. I recognize the Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. If you'll just give me a moment um, to find uh, our proposed amendment. Um, oh, sorry. Um, Clause 29 uh, deals with the disposition of property uh, or the leasing of property for less than market value by municipalities. And my understanding is that at this time, that can only be done to a not-for-profit. And now, uh, on my reading of this, although it's a big bill that apparently is amends the MGA, I, who knew, um, this section reads, that notwithstanding other subsections, a municipality may sell or lease property at a price less than market value for any purpose that the council considers to be beneficial to the municipality. Um, we have really valuable land in our municipal units. And uh, it's really important that when that is owned by the municipal unit and it's disposed of, that that has a public benefit. And I think that that's why that provision has been limited to not-for-profits until now, because there is the assumption that those organizations uh, will, in fact, um, support a public benefit. Now, I don't really know what this clause does, because this is 15 bills rolled into one, as we've said, but we are doing our best with very little time and assistance to understand this bill. And we don't understand this provision. And when we don't understand a provision, that means that the people we represent surely don't understand the provision. And so if in fact, and maybe the Minister um, of Municipal Affairs will get up and speak to this, um, but if this does mean that uh, municipalities may um, sell or dispose of properties at less than market value, to anyone, um, I think that that is concerning and something that we ought to be talking about and that we ought to be talking about in a bill brought forward by the Department of Housing and Municipal Affairs, uh, not buried in the NGA. And so for that reason, um, we are expressing concern with this provision. We're going to vote against the provision because we don't know what it means, unless the minister would like to stand up and explain to us 
um, what the intention of this provision was. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. So the provision would mirror, as, as the members in the House may know, we have a program of making provincial land available for housing, which is being emulated uh, in British Columbia, and is uh, uh, which we offer property opportunity notices on. We don't, uh, with our provincial land, we don't necessarily, most of them have gone to not-for-profits, but not always. Sometimes they've gone to uh, developers who want to put an, a, an affordable component in the development. So this would mirror that the municipalities would have the same ability to do this, this type of uh, activity. Uh, and it's at the request of the municipalities. I recognize the honourable member, city member too. Yeah, I guess it's really kind of a, oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Oh. Just on the policy, it just, it just reminded me of the CBRM bill from a few years ago where the government didn't support this idea of uh, uh, being able to sell land under uh, American Valley. I don't know if it's the same thing. It's probably a question for question period for the minister, but it was just something that sparked my interest because uh, I never realized that the, I, I never thought about it this way, but I remember, Mr. Speaker, uh, a similar bill, uh, a similar bill came to the floor. Uh, the Cape Bretoners actually supported it from the CBRM at the time. Uh, they're, they're, not, uh, they're not here. The Premier uh, would remember that conversation, but this would be if, if I'm correct, uh, just for the record, uh, this is this is a policy change for for a government that actually didn't support this in the past. Recognize the honourable member, Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pier. Thank you, um, Chair. So, again, what Clause Nine is about is to allow for sale or. 29 uh, is to allow for sale or lease of property at below market prices, removing the existing restriction that limits such exemptions for nonprofits. And it says that the municipality may sell or lease property at prices less than market value for any purpose that the council considers to be a beneficial to the municipality. Now, I've, stated, I've talked about this before, and while municipalities might be supportive of this, and while communities might be supportive of this, we will not know what residents are thinking because it's this part of the MGA, this amendment to the MGA, is buried in the FMA. So there's really no ability at this point right now to have the engagement and the discussions that might need to be had about how do we limit the potential for abuse of this. We heard in law amendments from Howard Epstein, who has decades of expertise in land use, that this language that the language that's being used is much too broad and too discretionary. We heard that this has a potential to cause municipalities to become in competition with each other to cut better deals. And the questions became, where did this urgency come from? And now, the member for Sydney, member two, talked about a particular piece of land that was being discussed in this legislature at the time. It was for a particular um, area with the, that needed to have legislation, on, a special legis legislation. This is a more broad aspect of this. And while there may be support for it, and while potentially we could support it, at this point in time, Due to the fact that it's been in the FMA and, cons and residents of Nova Scotia really didn't have the ability to ask those questions or discuss the potential issues, we're going to be left in the unknown. We, we have heard that this kind of change um, should come forward on its own, and that's what I've been saying, not buried in the FMA. And the government should explain its thinking with more robust feedback from the public. 
Robust is going to be, is, I think, starting to become a theme of mine at this point. Um, Howard Epstein also said the changes in laws that affect land use planning should be widely advertised, yeah. debated, and consulted about. The general public will be affected and, it, and has always shown a strong interest in speaking about such measures. Yeah. Land use issues are not purely for specialists such as architects and planners. Their views are important, but not to the exclusion of the general public. And with that, I agree with, um, with, with Mr. Epstein. I agree because this is, the th as, the MLA, as an MLA, as a former councillor, these are, these are the issues that I consistently bring up. I consistently bring up, you know, the fact that consultation with community and that social license, the social license that they provide us is so important. It gives us the ability to do the things that we need to do on behalf of Nova Scotians. It's incredibly important. And uh, Mr. Epstein also suggests that removing sections 25 to 54 and 72 to 101 um, until this kind of consultation explanation could take place, I think that's important. I think it's important that when we have bills that have these types of changes, whether you, are, whether you support them or not, whether you agree with the changes or not, what is important is the consultation with community. What's important is that people have gotten the ability to see a robust exchange of ideas, ask questions, get answers, and it's also good for government to hear what, what, what residents are thinking. Maybe if government had provided this amendment in a separate bill, with regards to an amendment under the MGA, rather than an amendment under the MGA under the FMA, um, the, co the the consultation that needs that needed that needs to take place, and the exchange of ideas and the expression of concerns, could have been done in a more democratic process, and. So again, I'm going to say it's not whether you're for or against a particular this particular amendment. It has nothing to do with that. It's process. Process is important. Social license is important. And my fear is that using these types of bills to put amend to using uh, the FMA to put these important bills and important changes in place, we are not getting the social license we need. We are not providing constituents with the consultation that they deserve. And we are not actually respecting the legislation that is before us because we are not giving it the attention it requires. And so I ask the minister to take, take pause of this and, and realize, that, again, this is not about being for or against something. This is about the process for which we do things in this House. And right now, this process is being negated, as far as I'm concerned, in, in the interest of expediency, rather than in the interest of Nova Scotians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Shall clause 29 carry? Carried. Carried. Clauses 30 to 43 carry? Carried. Carried. Clause 44. Carried. I recognize the honourable member for Cole Harbour Dartmouth. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Page 13, add after clause 44, the following clause, 45, chapter 39, is further amended by adding immediately after section 382, the following sections. 382A, when the minister receives a request from the municipality for an amendment to this act or the regulations, the minister shall respond to that request within six months of receipt. 382B, the minister shall create a process to consider on a timely basis all requests from the municipality made from the become, from coming into force of this section for amendments to this act or the regulations. And page 30, add after clause 105, the following clause, 106, chapter 18, is further amended by adding immediately after section 519, the following section, 519A, when the minister receives a request from a municipality or the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities for an amendment to this act or the regulations, the minister shall respond to that request within six months of receipt. I guess you don't need to say renumber. I just want to say that um, we're talking about the FMA and it's been called an omnibus bull, bill, bull, <laughs> but could also be viewed as a rewrite of the MGA. And for transparency purposes, it should have been and deserves to be its own bill. Much of the changes to the MGA listed have been asked for by HRM, such as the Code of Conduct, um, but with the exception, naturally, of the extension of time for the task force to be enacted. Oh. <laughs> and I just wanted to say so, at this time, I want to recognize all the great work that the planning department with HRM has been doing. I mean, we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of skyscrapers going up and a lot of cranes in the air, so they're doing a lot, and I just want to recognize that. But if the government truly intends to facilitate and give greater powers to HRM and its charter, why not go a little further, which is what I'm, this amendment is meant to do. By approving policies that HRM Council has already asked the Minister of Municipal Affairs to, uh, to approve as they pertain to its built heritage, parkland dedication based on density, acquire wetlands, which is part of it, through its green network plan, enable Halifax Water to waive development fees for affordable housing, and I already tabled a bill about the legislative amendments that is before the, the Minister of Municipal Affairs. So this amendment would actually just create an opportunity where you would every six months look at that, at what a term needs to be adjusted in its charter. If the government truly recognizes and appreciates Halifax as the capital of Nova Scotia and has its economic driver, it would be critical to enable it to grow with the very critical policy pieces that the residents of HRM have been asking for for many years through its elected municipal re representatives. This amendment will reduce red tape and actually get things done faster. I recognize the Honourable Member, uh, Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, this is the first time that uh, we've seen this amendment, um, but I would echo many of the comments that my colleague made. I think that we are seeing a pretty, um, we're essentially opening up the Municipal Governance Act within the FMA, which is weird um, and not a good way to make law, but here we are. And uh, so, I think that you know one of the things that we have heard um, as recently as the Anaganish bill that isn't the Anaganish bill that might be the Anaganish bill is um, a constant reminder that municipalities are a creature of the province um, and that so much of what municipalities can and can't do um, is dependent on uh, what the province decides that they can and can't do through legislation. Um, and so I think that this is just asking for responsiveness and flexibility uh, from the provincial government uh, to that end. Uh, there are lots of uh, members in this chamber, I, I don't count myself among them, who have served at the municipal level. Um, we, we hear this um, from my colleagues from all parties. Uh, who have who have have done this um, uh, request similar to this, and and I think it makes a lot of sense. We um, 
you know, we're in a constant jurisdictional tussle, and I actually have never seen it more um, uh, at the surface, I guess, than, than in this session. So we're talking about whose fault is the carbon tax and who is in charge of taking care of coastal protection and, you know, who, like, where does planning really sit? And, well, the province needs responsibility for this, but the municipality must take responsibility for that. And, you know, we're always going to, in our system, we're always going to be in that discussion on some level. But, but to the extent that we can create clear pathways of communication and response, I think that um, we, can, we can make that easier. And we are a small province. I mean, we talk a lot about how we're growing, but we're actually really small. Um, there's a million of us and change. That's the size of uh, some big neighborhoods in other cities. Um, and so I think that um, it, it's really incumbent upon us, particularly as we look at all municipal modernization, we're going to have more conversations about amalgamations, we're going to have more conversations about environment and infrastructure and coastal protection. Like, this doesn't go away in one legislative session. And so I see this as um, a provision that just helps to ensure uh, that whoever the government of the day is, whatever the personal relationships between elected members is, that there is a, um, a format and a roadmap for how to be in conversation about um, collaborating well as orders of government. So for that reason, we would support this amendment. Shall amendment lib no. two carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Uh, shall clause 44 carry? Carried. Carried. Shall clauses 45 to 53 carry? Carried. Carried. Clause 54. I recognize the Honourable Member Cumberland North. Sorry, Mr. Speaker, I was rising to speak to clause 45. Is that okay? I, I was standing, but you didn't see me. We're, we're on clause 54. It's, it's already carried. I just didn't. Recognize the Honourable Member Halifax Shabucto. Mr. Chair? Sure. Uh, may, may I ask for the unanimous consent of the House uh, to revert to the uh, clause that the Member for Cumberland North would wish to speak to? This request for unanimous consent to revert, is that, hang on. Is, uh, do I have consent? Agreed. Recognize the Honourable Member for Cumberland North on Clause 45. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to all the members for allowing me to, to uh, revert, for the House to re revert back. Mr. Chair, I just wanted to stand and speak for a few moments about the, this amendment that's regarding Highway, West, Highway 104 Western Alignment Act and the amendment pro being proposed. And the reason I want to speak is because it will directly impact Cumberland County as well as Colchester County and I want to make sure that it's on the record and the people back home are aware of this amendment. Uh, I'm not surprised to see the amendment. I just want to make sure that it is on the record and and to make sure um, that the residents that I represent realize that this bill, this amendment in this bill is going to take away money from Cumberland and Colchester County and spread the money out through the entire province. So that will mean there will be less uh, money specifically allocated to Cumberland and Colchester with this bill. My understanding of the bill, and I, I could be wrong if the minister wants to stand and correct me, but when I read the amendments, it looks like the money that will be collected through the Cobbequid tolls, instead of just being used to what we know, what we consider the Cobbequid pass, that the money that is collected will be also used for the under uh, 100 series highways throughout the province. So that means uh, any of the money that collect was collected up till now was only used on the Cobbequid Pass section, which is only in Cumberland and, and Colchester counties. So based on what I'm reading, it looks like now that money will be used throughout the province. So um, uh, 
perhaps I'm wrong in my interpretation of this bill, but that's, uh, and I just wanted to be on the record to make sure that the residents of Colchester and Cumberland are aware of that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Clause um, 45 to 53, do they carry? Carried. Carried. Clause 54. Carried. I recognize, <laughs> I recognize the honorable member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, my goodness, I feel like I'm in like a rerun of something. Like, carry, 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 carry. All right, thank you. I stand today to speak to Clause 54, which amends the housing in the Halifax Regional Municipal Municipality Act to extend the executive panel on housing in the Halifax Region Regional Municipality by two years. With this, the executive panel on housing would exist until November 25th, 2026. You guys all know how much I love the executive panel on housing and how we uh, put power in the hands of, of people that are supposed to be making decisions and, um, and yet we don't see shovels in the ground and houses being built. So in the fall of 2021, the Conservative government passed the housing in the Halifax Regional Municipality Act, which created a five-member panel on housing with sweeping powers to supersede existing municipal plans and strategies. In particular, the executive panel on housing and HRM was granted the power to establish special planning areas. The goal was to avoid so-called red tape and as a result, speed up developments. Mount Hope was one of the special planning areas created. Clayton Developments agreed to construct 373 units that were to be affordable at 60 to 80 percent of market rates. We were very critical of this at the time because these rents remain unaffordable to many. Nova Scotians need deeper affordability and we should be doing everything we can to provide it. Now, years later, we have just learned that Clayton Developments is walking away from the government's $22 million forgivable loan because the developer, was, the developer was able to secure a better deal with nonprofit partners to provide the affordable units. The deficiencies are mounting. With this special executive, with this executive panel on housing, with the authority to designate special planning areas within HRM, it has been in existence for some time, like I said, with no shovels in the ground. I'm wondering, what is the purpose for extending the time? They already have a number of planning areas designated with no movement that is visible, no builds that are ready to move in. So my thought would be, it, it's really not a good investment of funds to continue on. I mean, we could be looking at other things um, like to, be, to expedite the buildings, to have building standards um, that will be um, environmentally friendly, greener homes, um, requiring affordable housing. All of these things have yet to be seen by this government in a bill. It's very dangerous because, you know, there's no checks and balances and no accountability. So when we have a panel and we want to extend their time with nothing to show, Excuse me. There are there are 11 planning areas. Sorry, there are special planning areas. There is something to show some words on a piece of paper. Um, but I will say that we don't have any houses built to kind of take to take to offset the number of houses that we need. So I want to point to the to the establishment and the operation of the panel. The housing task force. Um, is supposed to be a temporary mechanism to accelerate planning and development to address current and future housing demand within the municipality. The panel is committed to helping accelerate the availability, the availability of housing of all types with the urgency warranted by the crisis and by the fact that the tenure of the panel is short, short, and effective action in the short time it is that it is imperative. So. You know, the panel has already had a few years in and has already um, um, designated planning areas. And so my thought, and I have tons of questions about this, is, is since the minister now has all powers to make the decisions on where and when and how and to change bylaws and to, to, to decide where things are built, I'm curious to you know why is there a necessity to keep a special planning um, um, 
special planning executive in a, in a task force together for another two years. It, it's absolutely, you know, um, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And I say that because it's supposed to be temporary. It's not supposed to be something that's supposed to exist on and on and on. And at this time, um, you know, the minister does have the power to do all that he needs to do within his own ministerial position. The housing strategy being facilitated through the Housing and Halifax Regional Municipal Municipality Act is not working. Extending the executive panel on housing for two years is not going to help. Like I said, the minister himself can do that. So what is the purpose of the extension? The fact is, changes to the Housing in the Halifax Regional Municipality Act have given unilateral decision-making to the Minister of Housing and Municipal Affairs when it comes to developments, and we've seen that. I mean, the special planning area that is going to be in Fall River, um, has a lot of, of issues with it and had a, has a lot of issues on the ground from community, from services and infrastructure. But yet, as I was told in estimates, that it is still a go with all of those things, yet we don't see houses being built. The fact is, changes to the housing in the Halifax Regional Mis Municipality Act, as, we, as I said, have already given the minister that decision making. Unilateral action lacks oversight. There is no accountability. We, and I say we, i.e. the public, we need greater public consultation. We are seeing things, decisions being made and announcements happening without any consent from the people around them that are going to be living in these spaces. And we need greater input from our municipal partners to help guide us as we try to address the housing affordability crisis. We need the ability to hold this government accountable to ensure the housing policies meet the needs and affordable developments are feasible. And like I said, I mentioned um, the, Fall River, the Fall River um, special planning area, which I know probably won't be built for another three years or, or more or less. But yet, we have folks that need housing now, and we hear from this government, build, we need to build, we need to build, we need to build, faster, 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 and yet we don't have the housing that's supposed to be built fast by this government. And yet, we need thousands of, we need 33,000 affordable units by 2030. And we're not even putting a dent in the amount of affordable housing that is being provided right now. So we need oversight, accountability, transparency with tangible results, which is more housing. The numbers that we see right now are not enough. And adding two more years onto a task force that has already given us 11 special planning areas that are not moving forward yet, other than the fact that they've been approved, is really what is the purpose? What is the purpose to add on two more years to someone else's, to, to having another oversight? So we don't need two additional years of the executive panel on housing. And then I, I also want to point out, since we have a lot of time here, um, I want to point out that, you know, I'm curious to know why this isn't in a, in a piece of legislation, a separate piece of legislation, a housing legislation. I mean, when we think about how we rush through Every other thing that comes through here, and this is a government bill. The government can decide what pieces of legislation they put forward. They can obviously decide which ones they, they're always going to say yes anyways. So why wouldn't you take the time, dig into whatever it is you want to put forward, i.e. this is the two-year extended onto the tax, the executive panel. Why don't you just open up that bill, add in an amendment, we go through the process like we should, because that's democracy, and that's what we're here to do, is do this work. Why wouldn't we do that? Instead of hiding it in this bill with a number of other pieces that don't belong in this bill, and, and then, you know, hope that we're not supposed to be debating, we're not supposed to be talking about it. Why would we be discussing it? Quickly, hurry up, carried, 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 pass, pass, pass. That is not the way we do business. We have to have a conversation about why this, you know what, I'm just gonna say, one of these things is doing their own thing. One of these things are kind of the same. 
One of these things is doing their own thing. Now it's time to play that game. Because it seems like there's something missing from the puzzle. Like, instead of us saying, here's this legislation on housing, here's this legislation on the Department of Community Services, here's this legislation on, I don't even know what else is in the bill, there's so much in there. Like, we can remove things when we want to, because we're government, and we don't want to put that in there so we can remove it. We don't want to consult with people, and we really don't want to hear from experts. This is what the government's saying. Because clearly, if you shove it all in one bill and you don't give people time to, to talk, consult, have meetings, even just have a meeting with the ministers to talk about what this looks like and how this affects Nova Scotians, it's actually very sloppy. It's very ineffective. It doesn't do us a service here as legislators to come in here and sit for 10 hours a day and hope that we rush through the bill so that they can get on with their day. That's not how things go. If you would have did it properly and you put it in a piece of legislation that it fits, you know, like a puzzle, you put it in the right way, if we were to do that properly, we wouldn't be having these discussions in a rushed mode. We would have robust conversations. There would be debate across the floor. It would be done in a manner that is respectful and honoring what it is we're putting forward. But instead, we're sitting here, and I mean, I, I, it's just odd to me. And no one else, well, no, sorry. The government side doesn't seem to think that there's a problem. That's a problem. The fact that, I mean, and, and yes, we're opposition. Yes, we are, you know, not the same priority. But I will say this. There are a lot of ideas around the table. There's a lot of expertise that we pull from. There's a lot of people that we all talk to that say things that come to us that as well come to the government side and say, these are not really good ideas that you're putting forward. And yet, we see put in the Financial Measures Act all of these pieces that don't belong. And yet, the government side seems to think that it's okay to have these, have these rush conversations and push a bill through and hope for the best. I'm just going to reflect here because, I mean, it is late at night. I told folks after 8 o'clock, I just, I, I just start saying the things that need to be said. Um, when we are here, and I'm going to get to the bill, I mean, get to the, to the reference of the, what is it, Clause 54 on extending the time for the executive panel on housing in the Financial Measures Act, which doesn't fit, I, I, I sit back here and I think, you know, as a, as a newbie, because I, I, I'm only serving one, this is my, my one term, as a newbie I go, wow, like, this doesn't make sense. Like, I go home and I say, why would we do that? Why would they jam, like, 15 different pieces of legislation or more, I think there's more, but I'm just using a number. 16 pieces of legislation into one bill with no explanations behind it. We can't ask questions, and when we do, we're looked at like, what? How dare you stop this process? How dare you question the fact that the housing, piece of housing piece is in financial measures? How dare you question the, the, the Child and Commission, the Youth Advocate piece, well, I, can, I don't even know the name of it. But anyways, that piece is in the Financial Measures Act. We have departments for each and every one of these things. We can put legislation forward. It just make, you know, and, and, and in my head I start thinking, well, if it's, if it's shoved into one bill, Order, order. I just uh, I want to remind the members yes. that we're going through the clause and committee of the whole, and I, I know all of us get um, gets, yeah, at times. Um, but uh, we're on clause 54. It has to do with the, the HRA. If you could, if you could stick, yeah, recognize the honourable member, Halifax Needham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And for my 46 minutes, I will um, be talking about the executive panel on housing in the Halifax Regional Municipality. Uh, extending it for two years, and I'm saying this, all of these pieces, because it ties right into the reason why. Why is this there? Why is this not a separate piece of legislation? In this clause, clause 54, it doesn't fit with the Financial Measures Act. In the, financials, in the Financial Measures Act, we wouldn't be having discussions on, a on, on the 
on the executive panel. We should have this within a housing bill. This should be in the Housing Act. It came forward to us in a Housing Act when it was brought forward by the Minister of Housing to tell us about this is the changes that are going to happen. And then next, the, the changes were, now I have all the power, so now I'm going to be able to decide everything. So if the Minister has all of that, what would be the purpose to extend another two years when the minister can do whatever the minister would like to do with the power that he has as minister? So I, I say all of this because I would have liked to have seen a piece of legislature, a piece of legislation, excuse me, a piece of legislation from the minister of housing on extending the executive panel for two years. I would have liked to have seen that so we could have had a robust discussion and we would have had experts at the table at Law Amendments and then we would have had debate and then we would have went through the process. Oh, and you know, it really, it really interests me that, you know, we would continue this process um, a little bit further on into a possible election time. So I really feel like if we're going to do our jobs properly, and the expectation of Nova Scotians is that we come in here, we do our jobs, we debate, we speak for the people that we are representing, and then some, the best option would be for us to actually do the work that needs to be done in the proper manner in which it needs to be brought forward. And that is not the case. This Clause 54 hidden in the FMA if we weren't really looking through, I mean, I, I know everybody really did their, their research on um, the FMA, the 111 clauses um, in the thick piece, of, thick piece of legislation that we have to sift through to see if any one of our pieces are in there because, you know, it was like a, a Cracker Jack box. You never knew what we were going to get. When we opened it up, we were like, oh, look, look, there's a Child and Youth Commission. Oh, oh, my gosh, look at that. I have to say something on this one because it's Clause 54. Like, wow! Order, really or, order, oh, oh, order, order. Um, with, with, really, with respect to the process, with, with respect to a. But by, by just saying Clause 54 doesn't mean you're, you're. You know, maybe we're getting there, and I could, I could appreciate that. But, uh, but, but in the Committee of the Whole, we're, we're to stick strictly within our clauses. Recognize the Honourable Member, Halifax Needham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And for my 42 minutes and 56 seconds, I will be talking specifically about Clause 54, amending the Housing and the Halifax Regional Municipality Act to extend the executive panel on housing in the Halifax Regional Municipality by two years. Do you know, two years is a long time. Two years, I'm telling you, by the time two years happens, my kids are going to be two years older, right? Like, that's a long time. With this, the executive panel on housing would exist until November 25th, 2026. I, I, I really feel like, you know, it needs to be said. It has to be repeated because I don't quite understand why this portion of a housing piece would be in the FMA. I have to say it a number of times because I don't quite understand why folks don't see anything wrong with that. Like, I was hoping to be able to discuss it in a housing legislation, but that was not what was put forward. As we know, there were a number of special planning areas that were already allocated. And we know now that there hasn't been any actual housing that people can move into right now. That has actually been allocated by the Special Planning Area Committee, or with the task force, excuse me. So I don't see any reason why we need to extend the time to two years further. You know, the executive panel on housing was granted the power to establish special planning areas, which they did. And I think they have accomplished that. And the goal was to avoid the so-called red tape. And as a result of this, to speed up developments. Well, I don't, I don't see the speed in that. And maybe, maybe 
go faster means go slower. Maybe it's an opposite thing. I don't know. I'm, I'm really kind of confused because that is not what we're seeing right now. So I don't think we need to extend the time of the panel. I think it's, it's actually a waste of time and energy for folks to do that when they've already accomplished what they needed to accomplish by having all power and all power given to the minister. The minister can decide. The minister can do all that he needs to do within his own realm of power. And he doesn't need a special planning unit or a special task force to do that anymore. Extending two years really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And we already know that a, num that a number of spaces, especially with the special planning units, um, the special planning areas, are not even being built up right now. So in Clause 54, which says amending the housing in the Halifax Regional Municipality Act to extend the executive panel on housing in the Halifax Regional Municipality by two years, um, it's really quite confusing. And I say this over and over again because I'm hoping it's getting drilled in because I don't understand why it's in the FMA. I have no idea why we would have so many other pieces within the FMA. And then while we're here, we are rushed to have a discussion over what this looks like. And, and then, you know, at the end of the day, it still doesn't seem to make sense to add an additional two years on to this particular panel, when there's no explanation as to why this panel is needed any further. So, you know, then I would wonder as well, why do they need to exist till 2026? Is there a reason behind that? Is it gonna be extended again? Is there going to be another uh, clause brought forward in another hidden, in a bill hidden, or a piece of legislation hidden that, that's going to say, let's add something else to that? I'm just, I'm just curious to know because there hasn't been any explanation or talk about that. And so, you know, we know that there are a ton of deficiencies when it comes to some of the things that are being put forward. And one of these is having this amendment in the Financial Measures Act. When we put forward pieces um, to help uh, the legislation that's being put forward, we do that with the intent so that the bill can actually be built up and be robust. And then um, when, when it doesn't happen, it's kind of puzzling because, you know, I'm curious to know how the government picks and chooses what they want to put in. Order, and what they order, want to order, order. We're talking about um, Clause 54, which amends the Halifax Regional Municipality Act to extend the Executive Panel on Housing in HRM for two years. That's the clause we're talking about. And that's, you know, so, the, or, and again, with respect, um, you're, you're almost on 24 to of just irrelevance at, at time. You're not gonna, I'm not going to call that, but I'm just saying you're, you're, you're close uh, of, of repetition. So I'd just ask the honourable member if we could stick it out on Clause 54, and I'll recognize the honourable member Halifax Needham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the Executive Panel on Housing in the Halifax Re Regional Municipality Panel is established under the Housing in the Halifax Regional Municipality Act and is structured and operates as prescribed by the Act. The purpose of this, the housing is a complex sector of many parties, public and private. The powers and duties of the panel, if exercised together with partners and stakeholders, have the potential to add significant momentum to the development of housing in HRM, both short term and for the longer term, after its tenure has expired. And their tenure will be expired very shortly. So um, the purpose of the panel, as set out in section two of the act, is as follows. The purpose of the act is to establish a body with provincial municipal representation to recommend ways to accelerate and increase in supply of housing of all types and of all income levels in the municipality. And it is a temporary, which means short term, which means not long, which means itty bitty, <laughs> mechanism to accelerate planning 
and development to address current and future housing demand within the municipality. So, you know, it, 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 it's just a small mechanism to accelerate planning and development. And so it, it literally has its small time. It had its, its time to do its work. And it is not necessary right now. So in addition, as we know, the panel has duties set out in Section 6 of the Act. The panel reports to the chair to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. So if we didn't already know that, the panel uh, reports through the chair to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. But if you didn't know, the minister pretty much decides whatever the minister decides they want to do. Their operating scope and principles are subject to the act. And with the approval of the minister, like I said, the minister decides all of those things. The panel adopts the following operating principles. The panel recognizes that the shortage of available housing has reached crisis proportions in HRM and throughout all of Nova Scotia, as in many other jurisdictions. So we know, you know, like in Yarmouth or in Cape Breton, Dartmouth South, Dartmouth North, Halifax Citadel, Sable Island, and Halifax Shibakto, you know, Cole Harbor, Preston, Sackville, Uniac. Like, th there's a lot of spaces that we know there's a housing crisis, which is why the panel was formed. And they have really done a lot of work in assigning 11 special planning areas. And within those 11 special planning areas, we haven't seen any buildings where people can move in yet. But you know, it will be done as fast as this government can go. So the panel is committed to helping accelerate the availability of housing of all types with the urgency warranted by the crisis and by the fact that the tenure of the panel is short and effective action in the short term is imperative. I mean, I'm hearing, I hear, I hear that the time is not long, right? It's a short term, short tenure, small tenure, tiny time, which is really, you know, making me think, why would we extend that if we already had a number of years in? So, yeah, um, the panel aspires in its work to follow a collaborative approach between the parties, the province, and the Halifax Regional Municipality. Get that. To the fullest extent possible. While some cases may require deciding by majority vote, the panel will attempt to proceed by consensus. The chair will be guided by these principles in the conduct of meetings and administration of the panel's activity. And I say all this because Clause 54 amends the housing in the Halifax Regional Municipality Act to extend the executive panel on housing in the Halifax Regional Municipality by two years. So we just were told it's only a short time. They don't have a long period of time to do the work, but it has to be accelerated. They've already done 11 special planning areas with nothing shown for it other than the announcement. But you know, for 2023, the panel will engage primarily in further action on the issues identified below. And I can speak to that in a minute. The minister and the panel believe they are where the critical opportunities lie for the panel to make a difference in accelerating the availability of housing in HRM. So, you know, I think that the minister is very confident in the panel speaking here for 2023. The minister has been very confident in the panel's work. And so for me, I really think, why would we need to extend that if the minister has already been confident enough in the work that's been done? HRM is continuing to do the planning and there's a lot of collaboration happening that, you know, that, you know, is, is really um, unnecessary to extend the time. So I just want to point out that with the approval of the minister, the panel will address the following outcomes as matters of priority for action in 2023. And I'm, I'm happy to, to hear this. Acceleration of development within 10 existing special planning areas and consideration of additional special planning areas were warranted and consistent with criteria established by the panel in 2022. So once again, in Clause 54, amending the 
amends the Housing and the Halifax Regional Municipality Act to extend the executive panel on housing in the Halifax Regional Municipality by two years. They're extending it. They would like to extend it till 2026. And I really feel like, you know, we, we also need to have the ability to hold this government accountable, to ensure that the housing policies meet the needs and affordable developments are feasible, which we haven't seen much of that lately. So I, and I think a lot of folks around this room, don't think that two additional years of the executive panel on housing is needed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I ask that you please rise and report progress on this bill. The motion carries. We'll now rise and report progress on this bill. Chair of the Committee of the Whole House on Bills reports. I recognize the Clerk. That the Committee of the Whole House on Bills has met and considered the following bill, Bill 419, and has made some progress. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Pursuant to Rule 5C, I move the House hours for March 28th be not 1 p.m. to 6 p.m., but 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Yeah. Uh, the motion is for Mar uh, March 28th that the hours be 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. All those in favor of the motion uh, signify by saying aye. Aye. Contrary minded nay. That motion carries. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I ask that you please, oh, sorry, I ask that you uh, now please leave the chair and the House resolve, it, it resolve itself into a committee of the whole House on bills. The motion carries. We will uh, resolve to committee the whole house um, bills. Committee of the Whole House on Bills will come back to order. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Would you please call Bill 419, Financial Measures 2024 Act. Bill 419, the Financial Measures 2024 Act will continue um, on Clause 54. I recognize the Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, So I think that this clause is actually a really great example um, of a bunch of the challenges we have in this bill. And I think it comes down to a slippery slope. So when, this, when the bill that created the task force was brought in, we had a lot of debate in this chamber about it. Because as I was just up speaking on, on the Liberal amendment around the MGA, um, this this uh, task force actually fundamentally impacts the relationship of um, HRM in particular and the way the municipal charter operates and the province. And so we had a lot of debate about that. This is a majority government. It passed. Um, but in that debate, um, I recall, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, the minister essentially saying, listen, like, I'm not going to step in unless there's a reason. Like, this is just to get housing built. Um, you know, the task force is going to deal with this, like, 
um, HRM's on the task force. We're all rowing in the same direction, even though HRM, as they have done many times since this government took office, appeared at law amendments, um, expressed concerns. Um, the bill passed, and uh, and so, what do we have to show for it? Well, um, the task force has certainly um, created a lot of special planning areas, uh, but it's not really clear um, that those places, number one, might not have gotten built anyway. Have they gotten built a little bit faster? We don't know yet, maybe. Um, but to what benefit? To what benefit to the public? To what benefit to the developer, mostly, who's involved? Um, and to what benefit to the overall goals of, of the province uh, and the needs that we have in terms of housing? Um, you know, we, we spoke a little bit, my colleague referenced and I referenced when we was, I was speaking on Clause 1, the... Um, I have two special planning areas in my constituency, and I'm speaking as the MLA for Dartmouth South. Uh, and, and, and it's kind of an object study because the, the Penhorn special planning area was already good to go. Like, it, they were about to build it anyway. <laughs> uh, it essentially just allows, I think, the province to say we've had one that's a success. So, so that's great. Like, everyone's happy to see that. I haven't had one constituent complain except for that the lake is full of silt, as it always is when there's construction, because uh, the Department of the Environment uh, can't seem to get their mind around how to protect our urban lakes, but that's a conversation for another day. Um, and so, so that's one. Uh, and the street lights are up, and the road, the grid is there, and the, you know there are things getting built, and that's great. We want more housing. Uh, Southdale Mount Hope is another, um, and in Southdale Mount Hope. As my colleague mentioned, uh, there was an agreement that was signed late in March, just like the money we see flowing late in March of this year uh, that gave the developer north of $20 million to guarantee what was termed affordable housing, but I would say maybe, maybe not, 80% of market rent for a fixed duration of time. Um, but the and that went through the task force and that was um, you know part of the special planning area and then the developer just walked away said no we don't we don't want to build that um, and so so you know this really did come to pass in some sense our question of like how do we understand what's happening in these large developments in our communities how do we help our constituents to understand what's happening um, but back to the slippery slope, you know, what we were sold was that intervention would only happen when it was needed, uh, that it was time limited. So that's why this task force came into being um, with a time frame around it in legislation, because we were assured that this was just needed to kickstart things, and then we'd be back to status quo. Um, but then the minister actually it turns out, uh, through a previous amendment, has all the powers himself. He doesn't even need the task force. Um, and so I'm not... And he always did. Yeah, and he always did. Um, and whether or not he's exercised those, we'll never know, uh, because it happens behind closed doors. Uh, but, but again, I do think that it is worth stressing here that this is not um, this is not a neutral provision. This isn't like oh yeah, well we're just going to keep doing this thing. This is a task force that fundamentally rearranges the relationship between the province and the municipality, the biggest municipality, the municipality that houses half of the citizens of this province, more or less. Um, and so, I don't understand why it appears as. Clause 54 in, a, in the middle of this bill that ostensibly enacts the financial provisions of the budget. It, it, really, it really doesn't make sense to me. Um, and so I know that the government is frustrated and they probably feel irritated that we are being negative 
about their bill. Um, but, uh, you know, I think there's negative and then there's obtuse. And uh, we wouldn't be doing our jobs if we weren't getting up on these provisions that are all their own new pieces of legislation. Like these are new pieces of legislation we're being asked to consider. Um, and so should we, should the housing task force continue? Maybe, I don't know, it's still underway. But I'd love to hear what HRM has to say about it. I'd like to hear what the development community has to say about it. I'd like to hear what the, what the nonprofit builders have to say about it. I, I, I want to understand, I want to know if any of them even know that this task force is being continued. Mm -hmm. Certainly HRM probably does by now, but I don't know who else does. And so, you know, I think that it's really important that we make this point. And I, and I, you know, I hope that we will hear more from the government about why, why, why they're doing things in this way, why the task force needs to be extended. This task force that we were promised was time limited, um, that was only needed as an emergency solutionist solution or whatever words were used at the time. I can't really remember. Um, because I think this government owes it to Nova Scotians to show their work, to explain what they're doing. All we hear is that they're going fast and it's faster and it's stronger and it's sooner and it's better and trust us, but we don't see the work. We don't see the path. We don't see the vision. We just hear faster, faster, trust us. And then we hear about all the ways in which they're messing up along the way and coming back in here with amendments and changes and people angry coming into the chamber. And so if this government wants us to trust them, if this government wants Nova Scotians to trust them, then bring them in on the secret. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell them why they're doing what they're doing. It's not enough to say, pass this, we're building housing. How are you building housing? Who are you building housing for? Who does it benefit? When's it gonna get built? We don't have answers to any of those questions. And this task force in particular is cloaked in secrecy. And so we're not getting it in the explanation of the bill. We weren't told it was coming. And now we're not gonna get it for the next however many years this continues. And so for those reasons, we, we register concerns about this provision and we'll be voting against it. Thank you. Shall clause 54 carry? Carried. Carried. Clauses 55 to 69, shall they carry? Carried. Carried. Clause 70, I recognize the Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Dartmouth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On page 17, clause 70, add after proposed subsection 83B the following subsection 3C. Regulations made under clause 1AA may not include the age of the individual as a criteria for eligibility. So we know this is about the most program, and I, was, I, I have tabled a bill and introduced a bill asking for the age to sort of be removed because if we're really serious about increasing the labor force and incentivizing people to the trades, we really should be not considering how old they are. We know for a fact Generation Z workers are known for their job hopping tendencies and surveys have found that they expect this generation to change their careers at least three times over their lifetime. Extending the most to include the nurses and removing the age as criteria will incentivize even more people because they're going to keep changing their careers as they go as they grow older. And we know 30 years of age, there's a lot of women that at some point after they're 30 decide they want to change careers. I had one woman that contacted me. She went back to school and she was all of 32. And she did not, could not, and was very disappointed that the incentive did not, she did not qualify for it. So if we're really serious 
maybe we should look at removing the age and have people go into the labor force, become nurses, change their careers because they're going to do it anyway. I recognize the Honourable Member, Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and um, I'm happy to rise and speak in favour of this amendment. This is a question uh, and a change that uh, we've been proposing uh, for a long time. Um, and I've said it before, and I'll say it again. So, first of all, actually, you know, uh, under the UN uh, guidelines, like youth actually goes to 34, um, particularly when you're looking at like employment programs and that sort of thing. So, when I, did I say 54? I meant 34. Sorry. Thank you for the member from East Hans for just looking so puzzled at me, and that was super helpful. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyways, so we'll. I'm down. Um, back on track. So, um, you know, and I do think we need to look at the length of time it often takes people to uh, get through their education, uh, get through their apprenticeship, and begin working. Um, and I just simply don't think 30 is the right number. And I don't think it's the right number for women. And I think we've had some statistics around that. Um, that bore that out. I think the average age of apprentices in Nova Scotia is, and I was just trying to check from the statistical report from uh, um, the Nova Scotia Apprenticeship Agency, but it's either 28 or 29, I think, and it's older, it's older for women. Um, and so I think we think about things like you know, we also, you know, know now we have evidence, and the Minister of Labour, Skills, and Immigration is also interested in this report. But we have a report from the YWCA Halifax that details the extensive sexual harassment that women and gender diverse folks experience in the trades. Um, that certainly affects the uh, the trajectory of one's career. That might make certain workplaces intolerable um, if you try and uh, seek, uh, you know, a, um, remediation or, or address the issue. Again, that takes time um, and simply, you know, I think healing from the experience of sexual harassment can also affect one's trajectory. I also do think about folks who are parenting um, in this age group, uh, which also I think, I think we have a huge gender issue. Um, I would love the minister to table some information um, about who is accessing the most program. The minister does not seem curious about that. I've asked about that in estimates. But this information would be available. So we would be able to understand <coughs> who's accessing the most program in terms of gender. We would be able to understand who's accessing the most program in terms of occupation. And we would know uh, about location as well. And all of those pieces of information are pretty important. This program is underperforming. It is not meeting the goals set for it. Um, and you know, I think, you know, we're not against trying new things and being innovative and and all of that sort of thing. And and so I think in general, uh, you know, but we've had concerns about the most program since the start. And instead of doubling down when you have a program that's not meeting the expectations, why not look at the evidence and the data that you actually have to consider uh, what, what, what would make sense in terms of changes? Yeah. So, um, and for me, the number one change uh, that is needed um, is around um, the issue of age. Um, I also think, you know, if we look at that YWCA Halifax report, I think 41% of the respondents identify as members of the 2S LGBTQIA plus community. Um, again, uh, folks who transition, folks who are gender diverse, often take um, longer to uh, get through high school. Um, and also, the actual um, experience of transition um, is often like akin to becoming a parent or taking a, a, taking a break um, to effectuate that, that transition. And thus, I do think that uh, those folks are also um, marginalized by the scope of the MOST program. Um, and again, if we were remotely curious 
about this program and like why it's not achieving its aims, after two years of implementation, we could, again, we could go look at the data. I mean, that would be an easy place to start. You could even undertake a program evaluation, right? You could like look at the data and then you could go interview some folks. Folks who are in the trades who didn't access this because of, because of whatever reason, understand the barriers. You could put together the information that we're getting, the credible research information we're getting from partners like the YWCA Halifax to inform your program plan. So, uh, you know, this, this program is not successful at this point. Um, the minister had no response about why the age hadn't been changed other than to say we wanted to attract young people. It's great, but you're not attracting as many young people as you wanted to attract, as you said you were going to attract. And so if, if what you're doing isn't working, you really should bring all the information you have to bear um, and, and start thinking about alternatives and how to tweak this. So, I mean, I would invite the minister again to explain why perhaps he didn't access any information about who was using the program before considering this change um, or exactly uh, the expectation of how this change is going to make this program more successful. That was a, that was a conversation I invited in estimates. Um, that's a conversation we could have again here tonight. Um, but again, this is, a, you know, you know, this, uh, I mean, I guess one advantage of an omnibus uh, bill for the FMA is that we get to explore lots of the issues and concerns that we've had over the last couple of years about how this government has, has governed, right? Yeah. So we get to talk about the special planning areas. We get to talk about the, well, the town. Order, the order. I just said, uh, remind the member to, to confine the remarks to the amendment. Yeah. I recognize the Honourable Member Halifax said it'll stay up the line. Don't you worry, Mr. Chair, I'm going to stay on, on topic. But what I'm saying is, is that this example, initiating a program, but then like not wanting to talk about it, not talking to stakeholders about it, not doing any research about it, just keep on going because you said you were going to do it. And I mean, I guess it's one of the few, one of the few taglines that's actually being implemented. But um, and not actually, uh, you know, doing the work to support it is an example. But again, like our labor shortage, our need for skilled trades is a huge issue. Again, why is this being buried in the FMA? And it really could, like, considering our labor strategy, mm -hmm. would be an amazing discussion to have in this legislature. Yeah. And yet, we're not having it. Like there's one, there's you know there's a piece of the a piece of the puzzle like that we hope would work. It's not working well yet, but we hope it would work. Buried in the FMA, and so I am actually, Mr. Chair, you just have to indulge me for a little bit. This is the advantage of having an omnibus piece of legislation because we get to see all of the things that we've been concerned about. So a lack of transparency, a lack of engagement with stakeholders. Um, a lack of access to evidence and research, um, an unwillingness to consider uh, the, you know, the advice and opinions of like folks on this side of the house, but also the experts in the field. Um, if the minister could tell me that, you know, uh, this wasn't on the back of an envelope, and that they consulted lots of uh, labor experts, and everybody said make it 30. 30 is going to be where you want to be, then, then you know, we could understand that. But that's not what happens here. And so we're left at, uh, at 9.47 uh, in the evening trying to understand what the, what the labor force strategy is, trying to understand how this fits in it, trying to understand why this program is not achieving the aims that it has set out for itself. Mm -hmm that the government has set out for itself, and why the government and the minister responsible simply doesn't want to understand anything more about this, about this pro project and this program. So, um, you know, again, I think we can, you know, we'll keep talking about these things. The omnibus FMA has definitely given us lots of, lots of fodder um, for discussion. Um, but I would really invite, um, either the Minister of Finance or the Minister of Labor, Skills and Immigration to respond and talk about why not increasing the age of the most program and if not, what information they have accessed um, 
to, to make that decision. And with that, I move to adjourn debate on bill uh, of the Financial Measures Act and Committee of the Whole House on bills. Um, is the, the motion to adjourn or the motions to, to rise and report? I recognize the Honourable Member Halifax Siddle Sable Island. I rise, I move that you now rise and report progress to the House from the Committee of the Whole House on Bills. The motion is that we do now rise and report pros, progress to the House. Will all those in favour of the motion signify by saying aye? Aye. Contrary minded nay? Nay. The motion is defeated. I recognize the Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to just echo a few words of my colleagues. Uh, the Premier in particular is very proud of the most program, and I think it's a good idea. I think it's a great idea. He's clapping, so somebody's happy. Um, I think it, it is a good idea. It's a good program. Um, but it doesn't have the uptake that was projected or promised. That's just the truth. And so the question is, how do we get it there? Uh, well, we think that we could get it there, and I'm glad that my colleague moved this amendment, and my colleague, um, also the member for Halifax and Little Sable Island, who just spoke, has spoken to this many times before. Uh, we, I think, I actually don't think, just to uh, answer some of the questions posed by my own caucus, I think I know why it's 30. It's 30 because we want a younger population. You know, we've heard a lot in the conversations on health care about the percentage of our population that's going to be over the age of 65, um, the strain that that places on health care, et cetera, et cetera. But, but we've also heard from this government quite explicitly, as early as, to, as recently as today, that it's important for people to be attached to the labor force. And, and we believe that too, but we need to create pathways. And so as my colleague said, you know, that's an important conversation for us to have that we haven't had. We haven't had it in the House. We haven't had it in committee. Um, so let's create those pathways. Uh, why 30? I would love to hear. I really, genuinely would love to hear from the minister or from the premier who has spoken so much about this program. Why, like, is there a consideration to raise the age? Why was 30 decided? Um, could we could we consider raising the age? Would the minister commit to doing a study to understand what the labor force looks like in skilled trades and, and in all of the professions that are encompassed by the MOST program? I think there's lots of opportunities here. I think there are lots of people who are upskilling, who are wanting to get into always uh, better careers that are more remunerative, that allow them to live more fulfilling lives but also just to pay the bills, right? Because right now it's really hard to pay the bills. And so people might want to get their red seal. P people might want to become a nurse. People might want to do what they need to do to like literally just be able to keep a roof over their heads because increasingly that's the conversation we're in. So why are we limiting that opportunity to people under the age of 30? Um, I think it's a really good question. And I would love to, if not tonight, um, sometime soon, hear the minister's thoughts on this because um, we are among, if not the oldest province in the country that does present a set of challenges. Um, but we also uh, make among the lowest incomes in the country. And we have a lot of people who would like the opportunity for upward mobility, who would like the opportunity provided for by this program um, to change their circumstance. And so I think that what's being offered here is a pathway towards that, um, and we would support that. Thank you very much. I recognize the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. This is a, a very obvious, I think, change that needs to be made to this program. This program has been underused. Um, it is under budget at a time when there is a, there is a, a labour shortage uh, across our province. And talking to employers, Mr. Speaker, they're actually looking for older workers right now. Uh, they're looking for middle age, they're looking for workers that are in their 50s, uh, even in their 60s in, in some cases. Um, 
And this would actually create, I think, a very good incentive for uh, people who are looking at adjusting careers, who are looking at taking advantage of the incredible opportunities that and lucrative opportunities that are presenting themselves in the skilled trades, uh, to actually do that and receive a, a tax benefit to do so. And I've, I've talked to uh, middle-aged workers uh, who are interested in doing this, who are developing the courage to want to change career paths, even at a later stage in their career, and who are looking at um, skilled trades as a, as a, as, as a real opportunity. Um, also hearing from uh, women. Uh, who are interested in looking at the skilled trades. And we have such an underrepresentation of women in skilled trades uh, in this province and in other jurisdictions that uh, we're really missing uh, a major opportunity there, uh, in my opinion. Again, so far, this has been a program that the government has thumped their chest on. Uh, we've heard the Premier and, and the Minister talk about you know, how important this is and how successful it is when all of the evidence is showing that it's, it's not achieving the success that we, we needed to at this point. Um, and even, uh, even looking at the, the labor shortage we have in nurses, uh, the government is, is who are now also uh, included in the most program for this, this, this uh, tax benefit, but the government is focused on creating new nursing seats. Uh, the nursing seats we have are, are vacant. We are not having a major uptake of the next generation uh, that are pursuing careers in nursing. So we actually have a government that's focused on the wrong thing, creating more seats at a time when the current seats aren't even uh, filled. Uh, and the government has said, well, you know, we're gonna hire every single nurse that comes out in that uh, graduates, well, of, of course they are because there's a shortage, but a big problem we're hearing from nurses is that they're actually not being hired and they're pursuing work in other provinces where, uh, I've heard particularly New Brunswick, where the recruiters are being a lot more aggressive uh, than we are in our own province of getting those nurses into the system. And again, I think the government was very focused on just making a big splashy announcement that I don't think had any substance that we're going to hire every nurse that came out of grad school. Of course we should. When there's vacancies in our system that we're having a hard time filling, uh, that's a no-brainer. But in reality, we're actually hearing from people that aren't um, being recruited, that aren't hearing back from uh, the Nova Scotia uh, um, health uh, organization that's doing the hiring and they're actually pursuing careers, the young people, in, in other provinces, which I think makes it even more important to create incentives for, again, uh, middle-aged individuals in our province to look at new careers. If we change the, the age regulation here, we just might see a little more of an uptick in, um, in, in use uh, of, of the MOST program. And certainly we do all want to see that. Uh, we have a labor shortage. We need to get more people in the labor force. We need people to move into these fields where we have shortages. And that particularly is the case in the skilled trades and in nursing where this program is um, focused on. And um, I wish the government would, uh, would look at this. Again, we, we've had a government that's come in and literally have changed every single piece of legislation uh, that they've brought forward. It's the first time I've actually seen 100% of legislation uh, change, uh, where there's been mistakes in, in, in all pieces of legislation, and there's only been three pieces of legislation. Order, order. just uh, to, to remind uh, our honourable member that we're speaking to, um, to the amendment for Clause, clause 70. It's, um, it has to do with the Skill Trades Most program. I recognize the honourable leader of the official opposition. Uh, thank you very much. And, and so I, I think the government has set a precedent uh, in this session at making adjustments. Um, and we have another opportunity here, I think, to make a very obvious one. Uh, that, you know, there's no guarantee it will, will uh, have the level of impact that we hope it will, but at least I think we'll see uh, hopefully an improvement in uptake because, again, this is a, a program that right now has a failing grade, uh, is, is not 
reaching uh, its potential. Um, and I think because we're missing a demographic in our province that uh, could be included in this, and I think would have would have an interest in uh, in participating. Uh, hopefully. So with those few words, uh, Mr. Chair, I just want to urge the government again to pursue this uh, adjustment. I think it could be a very practical change that might see a positive impact in the, in the uptake on those who are pursuing the skilled trades and nursing in our province. Thank you. Shall amendment Lib 3 carry? carry. The amendment is defeated. Clause 70. Shall Clause 70 carry? Carried. Shall clause the 71 to 74 carry? Carried. Carried. Clause 75. I recognize the honourable member, Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask that you, or Mr. Chair, I ask that you do now rise and report progress on on committee of the whole house on bills to the house. The motion is that we uh, do now rise and report progress to the House. Will all those in favour of the motion signify by saying aye? aye no. Contrary minded nay? No. The motion is defeated. I recognize the Honourable Member Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pier. Wow, just for the sake of a minute, my gosh, you guys are, the, the, this government's getting really hard on our staff here. These, <coughs> our, our Surgeon Arms here is all ready to go. So 70, uh, let's see, Clause 75 allows for the sale or lease of property at below market prices, removing existing, existing restrictions that limits such action except for nonprofits. The municipality, municipality may sell or lease property at price less than market value for any purpose that the council considers to be beneficial to the municipality. Let's think on that for a second, huh? Order. We have now reached the, uh, the, the hour of adjournment. We will now rise and report progress to the House. Uh, Committee of the Whole House on Bills reports. I recognize the clerk. That the Committee of the Whole House on Bills has met and considered Bill uh, 419 and has made some further progress. As we meet, as we've now met the hour of adjournment, uh, we stand adjourned until tomorrow, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Tomorrow's a new day. Thanks, everybody. We stand adjourned.